All right. So hello guys. Let us begin with a very simple scenario. Okay. So we have some scenario over here. The scenario looks like this. So let us take two people. So we have uh, Ruchika in the chat and we have Akshit. Right. So let us say that we have two people, Ruchika and Akshit. Right. Now both of uh, both of these people, Ruchika and Akshit, they created an algorithm for sorting. Right. They created a sorting algorithm, and the challenge is that whoever's sorting algorithm runs faster, that person will win the contest. Okay, and they will get some prize. Is that fine? Cool. Now, uh, Ruchika and uh, Akshit both test their program, and here are the results. Right. So Ruchika uses an algorithm called Ruchika sort. Ruchika sort. And we, we benchmark that algorithm and it turns out that Ruchika sort takes five seconds to run. Okay. On the other hand, Akshit's use, Akshit uses his own algorithm. So Akshit's algorithm, Akshit's algorithm and Akshit's algorithm takes uh, around 10 seconds or 20 seconds to run. Okay. Cool. So who do you think wins in this particular contest? Who do you think has a better algorithm, has a faster algorithm? Is Ruchika short better or is Akshit short better? Well, it, it seems like Ruchika is the winner over here, right? It seems like Ruchika is the winner over here because her algorithm runs in only five seconds, whereas Akshit's algorithm takes 20 seconds. But hey, but Akshit says, wait, 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 wait. This is not fair, right? Ruchika was running her algorithm on a top of the line MacBook Pro, right? Ruchika was running her algorithm on a top of the line MacBook Pro, whereas Akshit was running her, his algorithm on his mobile phone, right? So it is obvious that, hey, Ruchika's algorithm will run a little faster because she was running it on a better computer. So we said, okay, that's fair enough. Let us try to run both the algorithms on the same MacBook Pro. Okay. So Ruchika's algorithm takes five seconds once again, but Akshit's algorithm now takes only one second. Yes. So when we ran Akshit's algorithm on the MacBook Pro, it took only one second. Now, who is the winner? Is it Ruchika or is it Akshit? Well, now that we have, now that we have standardized the underlying, uh, underlying hardware, now it makes sense that Akshit is the winner, right? But we are not done yet. We, we were trying to declare Akshit as the winner, but Ruchika said once again that, Hey, let's, let's just wait a second. We are trying to run this algorithm to sort 1000 different items. Okay. We were sorting 1000 different items using this algorithm. Ruchika said that instead of using, instead of sorting 1000 elements, if you instead sorted 1 million elements, right? If you instead sorted 1 million items, then Ruchika claims that her algorithm will run faster, right? Now that, that sounds a little weird that, I mean, for 1000 items, Ruchika's algorithm is slow, but for 1 million items, Ruchika's algorithm will be faster, but that totally happens, right? Depending on the complexity of that algorithm, that can totally happen. So I hope that you can understand from this particular scenario that analyzing the time complexities of different algorithms is not that simple, right? We cannot simply measure the time. We have to do a lot more, lot more careful analysis. Is that clear? So we have to do some sort of a careful analysis. All right. So here are the things that we need. So we want a way, we want a way that takes the following into account. So number one, it standardizes, it standardizes the underlying hardware, the underlying hardware. Right. So we want to make sure that whenever we are testing two algorithms, they are running kind of on the same hardware. or basically what we want to say is running on a faster computer, running on a faster computer should not change who the winner is. Does that make sense? Yes. So just because we are, some algorithm is running on a slow computer, some algorithm is running on a faster computer that should not change who the winner is. Right. The second requirement would be programming style. It could be that Ruchika is a very, very good coder and she knows how to uh, perform that coding, uh, how to optimize her program a lot, right? Whereas it could be that Akshit is not, Akshit is kind of a beginner and Akshit does not know how to optimize the cache uh, maybe and how to, how to write the program so that it is very, very efficient, right? So we have to make sure that while comparing algorithms, we do not compare the programming styles. We do not compare the underlying hardware. And finally, we have to make sure that we are testing with large enough data, large enough input, right? So just because for a smaller set of, for a smaller set of inputs, Ruchika's algorithm ran slower. That does not mean that Ruchika's algorithm is in fact slower, right? We have to test it for a very, very large input. 
So we are trying to come up with a way of analyzing algorithms that satisfies all these three criteria. Is that clear? And the way we do that is by talking about, instead of talking about the time it took to execute, instead of talking about the time it took to execute, we instead talk about the rate of growth of the algorithm, right? Or we talk about the time complexity, complexity of the algorithm. Is that clear guys? Yes. Perfect. So let us see how we model this in a mathematical manner. Okay. So let us, let us take a few more examples before we move on to the mathematical uh, definition, right? Let us suppose that we have two functions. Okay. We have two functions. One of the functions is, let us suppose log x, log x. So what does the graph of log x look like? Can someone tell me what the graph of log x looks like? So the graph of log x looks something like this, right? Log of zero is not defined. Log of one is zero. And as uh, as x increases, the, the value of log x increases monotonically, right? but it increases slowly. This is the graph of log x. Let us look at another function. Let us look at say x equals to 10, right? So what will the graph of x equals to 10 look like? Well, it will look like something like this. It will look something like this. Yes. So what do you think? Which function is larger? Which function looks larger? Is x equal to 10 larger than log x? Does that make sense? Well, on the graph, we can see that it is certainly above log x, but that is not, that is not perfectly right. Okay. So the thing is that as we keep on increasing the value of x, right? As we keep on increasing the value of x, there will be a certain point. There will be a certain point, which will be, let's say x is around, let's say 2000 after which this log x, this log x line, the graph of log x will eventually cross the graph of x equals to 10. Oh, sorry, uh, not x equals to 10, y equals to 10, my bad, y equals to 10, y equals to 10, right? Does that make sense, guys? So eventually what will happen is the graph of y equals to 10, this graph will become less than the graph of y equals to log x. Yes. Now, why does that happen? Why does that happen? That happens because we are talking about the rate of growth of two functions, right? This particular function, y equals to 10, this function does not grow at all. 10 is a constant, right? Is everyone aware what a constant is? Y equals to 10 in that 10 is a constant. Whereas when y equals to log x, when y equals to log x, this log x, this is not a constant. It will grow with the with increasing values of x. It will continue growing and growing, right? So we, when we are comparing the time complexities of different algorithms, we do not want to compare the runtime, the, the time it took for one particular instance. We want to compare how the, the function grows. All right. Let us look at one more example. Let us suppose that we have this graph once again. So we have log X that looks like this and we have Y equals to X by hundred. Right. So Y equals to X by hundred will look something like this. Y equals to X by hundred. Right. So now which one do you think is the faster algorithm? Which algorithm do you think is better? Well, currently in the, in this particular part till this particular point, y equals to x by 100 this was larger than log x right however from this point from this point onwards log x was actually greater than y equals to x by 100 yes so should we say that log x is slower log x takes more time should we say that well not necessarily if we keep on if we keep on increasing the value of x what we will encounter is that log x grows much more slowly whereas the graph of y equals to x by 100 that eventually crosses the line of log x. All right. So why? So eventually for very large x, large x, we will always find that x by 100 will be larger than log x. Now the challenge here is that we have to choose sufficiently large x, right? We can't talk about small values. We have to choose a large enough value of x. Does that make sense? Right? Yes. Cool. Now let us, let us ask a couple more questions. If I take this, if I take this x equals to 100 graphs, right? And if I compare it with log x, instead of comparing this x equals to 100 or uh, y equals to x by 100 graphs, if I multiply this with some particular constant, right? If I say that instead of comparing x by 100 versus log x, what if I compare uh, 1000, 1000 times x by 100, right? Times x by 100 versus log x. Is that going to change which algorithm is faster 
for which algorithm is slow yes or no by multiplying a particular function by some amount is should that change if an algorithm is faster or slow well that should not change the winner of the algorithms right why should that not change because this is like this is like running it this is like running the program on faster hardware right multiplying this value x by 100 x by 100 by a constant amount 1000 this is like running that same program on a faster hardware so we, we already wanted a method we want a method in which change in hardware does not really affect our winner right irrespective of which hardware we run the program on the winner remains the same so this should not affect the value similarly if instead of multiplying with a constant if i add a constant right if i add a constant this also should not change the winner of my contest right this should not change the ordering of my algorithms is that clear and the way we talk about this mathematically the way we talk about this mathematically is called the asymptotic asymptotic notation right now you will come across a lot of different asymptotic notations the most common being the big o notation the big o notation uh, designated by something like o of fn right then there is the omega notation this is designated by this symbol and we have the theta notation which is this right so we will be talking about in details about what each of these different notations and each of these different methods mean is that clear any any doubts till now repeat the hardware part okay so basically what i am saying is let us say that we have two algorithms a and b right let's say that a took t seconds to complete while b took m seconds to complete right now if i measure if i measure which algorithm is better based on the time it took to complete that measurement is not a very good measurement why because it could be the case that i could be running a on faster hardware and b on slower hardware right or it could be the case that a genius programmer coded a while a new programmer a newbie programmer coded b right so we want a way that abstracts out these differences we want a way that does not care about the underlying hardware we want a way that does not care about the underlying implementation right which is why we want a method that makes sure that the rate of growth of algorithms is compared rather than the time it took all right okay so now let us look at the definitions of these asymptotic notations cool. so first of all let's look at big o right big o notation this is denoted as o of fn so let us let us first write the mathematical definition of this and then i will explain what this means so big o of fn is actually defined as a set of functions functions that grow at most as fast as f of n does that make sense so we are saying that any function whatsoever if that function grows at most as fast as f of n then that function is part of big o of fn right mathematically mathematically so we will talk about the rate of growth mathematically we will denote this as big o of fn is the set of all functions gn right big o of fn is the set of all the functions gn such that the function grows at most as fast as fn how do we denote this how do we denote this mathematically how do we denote the rate of growth mathematically all right so let us look at how do we denote the rate of growth mathematically so first of all we want to make sure that the multiplicative constants the underlying hardware does not really affect right the underlying hardware does not really affect it so we are going to say that okay gn gn must be less than or equal to fn but we can allow for some multiplicative constant we can allow you to multiply any constant c over here all right so we are saying that for any constant c for some constant c right there exists a constant c there exists a constant c such that this holds right that's the first thing we do not want multiplicative factors to affect our rate of growth secondly we want to make sure that we are measuring for a large enough input right we do not care about small inputs so we will put another constraint over here we will say that this will hold true this will hold true for all n which are greater than some value of n right which are greater than some base value now we are not defining what this base value is we are saying that it should be just greater than some particular value after this value no matter what value of n you choose as long as you have some constant and your value is greater than n0 then gn will remain less than or equal to fn does that make sense 
yes this is how we define grows at most as fast as fn basically let us suppose that this function is fn right and let us suppose that this function is gn now we want to define we want to check if gn is a part of big o of fn right so we are going to say that all right let us first let us first not talk about small values of n right let us not talk about small values of n let us define a very big value n0 let us define a very big value n0 and we will only be considering we will only be considering all the values of n that are greater than n0 we will only be talking about this part in this part in this part it could be the case that gn is above fn or gn is below fn however if i am allowed to multiply fn with a constant c if i am allowed to multiply fn with a constant c which is greater than 0 and i can make sure that by doing that fn is always above gn right if by multiplying fn by a constant by constant c i can make fn always above gn then i can say that fn grows at least as fast as gn or i can say that gn is in big o of fn does that make sense yes so once again once again big o of fn is the set of all functions that grow at most as fast as fn right mathematically is it is defined as the set of all functions gn such that there exists a constant c which is greater than 0 and for all n is greater than n not right for, for whenever these constraints are satisfied then gn must be less than or equal to c times f of n this is how we this is how we mathematically represent this statement all right these two statements are completely equivalent cool now let me let me take some questions let me take some uh, simple questions so let us suppose that we have uh, fn equals to n plus 6 all right this is one function fn equals to n plus 6 let us try to list down let us try to list down what big o of fn is right so can someone can someone try to guess what big o of fn is going to be can someone try to give me an answer over here sumit asks do we know do we need to know this part to calculate the complexities of in our program yes sumit uh, understanding understanding the meaning of big o notation and understanding the meaning of asymptotic notations asymptotic complexities is very important right if you do not really understand that part then you might end up at incorrect answers and you will not understand why your answer is incorrect cool so what all functions do you think are part of big o of fn well of course y equals to n is definitely a part right so basically f of n f of n equals to n is it it is slower than n plus 6 does that make sense well what about uh, fn equals to n by 100 is that also big, uh, a part of big o of fn yes that is a part of big o of fn what about fn equals to 100 n plus 600 well it seems that 100 n plus 600 is greater than n plus 6 right it seems that 100 n plus 600 is greater than n plus 6 but please remember that we have this constant that we are allowed to use right we are allowed to multiply fn with a constant so this is also allowed because we can simply multiply fn we can multiply fn with a constant like 1000 right and then 100 plus 600 100 and plus 600 will be less than 1000 and plus 6000 right so this is definitely a part well there are a lot of other functions that are also part of big o of fn for example fn equals to or let me let me call this gns right let me call this gns gn equals to log of n log of n also grows slower than n plus 6 so this is also part of big o of fn right similarly under root of n right similarly a uh, log n to the power 5 all these functions are part of big o of fn in fact this set is infinitely large in fact this set is infinitely large right there are infinitely many functions that are part of this set is that clear yes perfect okay so now that we understand what the big o complexity means let us quickly look at let us quickly look at the the order in which we basically we know that uh, let's let's look at some rules of big o complexity okay so let us let us compare the following things so we have a constant we have a constant function this is represented as fn equals to some constant c all right on the other hand we can have some sort of a logarithm logarithm right this is represented as fn equals to log base log of n right with some base b right with some base b okay we could have a poly, we could have uh, a square root square root 
right? This would look like fn equals to under root of n. We could have more. We could have something like uh, linear. Right? This will look like fn equals to n. We can have quadratic, right? fn equals to n square plus 10 maybe, right? And so on and so forth, right? So we can have cubic. We can have uh, we can have any polynomial with any degree, right? Then on a high level, we can even have exponential. We can even have exponential. So this will look like fn equals to 2 to the power n, right? fn equals to 2 to the power n, or fn equals to 1.5 to the power n. Whenever the base, whenever the base is greater than one, then it is exponential, right? Cool. Then is that is that is exponential the highest complexity that we can talk about? Certainly not. We can we can keep going, right? So we can define something like factorial maybe. We can define factorial. So this would be fn equals to n factorial maybe. Right? We could have even so we could have lesser exponential. So we could have fn equals to n to the power n. Right? We can have we can have, we can continue infinitely. We can continue infinitely both in this direction and in this direction. Right? Can something be slower than a constant though? So not in not in this direction, but over here. Can something be slower than a constant? No, right? Because a constant literally does not grow. A constant does not grow at all. So the constant is the least amount of growth that is possibly that is possible, right? But there are functions that can lie between this and this. Does that make sense? So this is the this is the increase. This is in increasing order. Is that clear, guys? This is an increasing order of the complexity. Constant grows the slowest. It grows the slowest. So if a function grows slower, what does it mean? What does it mean? Is the algorithm faster or slower? So if there's an algorithm that takes this much time and we are saying this function grows very, very slowly, right? In fact, this function does not grow at all, grows slowly. So what can I say about the algorithm? Is the algorithm fast or is the algorithm slow, right? So when the, when the complexity grows slowly, the algorithm is fast. Algo is fast, right? Whereas when the complexity, complexity grows quickly, quickly, the algorithm is slow. All right. So we want our algorithm, we want our algorithm to have a complexity that grows very, very slowly. Does that make sense? So an algorithm that runs in constant time, that algorithm is the fastest algorithm. An algorithm that runs in logarithm time, that algorithm is pretty fast, right? An algorithm that runs in factorial time, that algorithm is extremely, extremely slow. Is that clear? Yes. Cool. So let me let me ask you a couple of questions. Of course, you will find many more questions. Uh, so I mean, I will be giving you a couple of questions over here. But if you want to practice more questions, you will find the link in the video description. Right. So in the YouTube video description, you can go and there will be a link to a set of questions over there. Just go over there and try those questions out. All right. So I mean, I, I hope that you understand this distinction between active learning and passive learning. Right. If you just watch a lecture like a movie, right? if you just listen to that lecture, you do not take notes and you do not practice, then you will be you will you will be getting some of the benefit, but you won't be getting all of the benefit. Right. On the other hand, when you actually take notes, when you actually write your notes yourself and once the lecture is over, once when you actually practice the problems, that is going to help you out a lot. Cool. So this was a lot of theoretical stuff. Right? This was a lot of theoretical stuff about what asymptotic notations are. Now let us actually look at some code. Let us actually look at some code and try to see if you can figure out what the asymptotic complexity of that code is. All right. Now figuring out the asymptotic complexity of a particular piece of code can be very, very difficult. Right. So for example, if you have a recursive function, recursive function, or if you have a complex data structure, complex data structure, Right. Then analyzing the time complexity of that piece of code can become a little more difficult. So we will not be covering this today. All right. However, we will be taking a class. We will have a complete set of classes on recursion. Right. We will have a set of classes on recursion. We will have a set of classes on different data structures as well. So when we talk about recursion, we will talk about the we will talk about analyzing the time complexity of recursion as well in that particular session. All right. Today we are only going to look at very simple pieces of code and trying to analyze the complexities of those pieces of code. Cool. So let us let us begin. Let us begin. So suppose I have written a program that looks something like this. I declare a variable int x equals to 10. Right. And then I do something with maybe I do print x. Right. Let us suppose this is my piece of code. How much time do you think this code takes? How much time 
does this code take? How much time do you think this code takes? Well, whenever we have trivial operations like this, whenever we have trivial or simple operations, then usually those operations take a constant amount of time, right? A constant amount of time. So this particular operation, this is a declaration, declaration, and there is also an initialization, right? So what will happen is the, the computer will allocate some memory. The computer will populate that memory with the value 10 and the computer will move a lot of stuff in and out of the CPU, in and out of the RAM, in and out of the cache and things like that, right? Similarly, when they are, we, are, we are calling the print function, what will happen is the computer will load the address of X, right? It will load the address of X. It will load the address of this print function, right? And then it will invoke this print function with this particular address, right? Whatever this print function does, it will also do that. So we are assuming over here that all these operations, these operations take a constant time each, right? So this one takes O1 time, this one takes O1 time, all right? So overall, this entire program takes a constant amount of time. Is that clear? Very simple, very easy thing, right? But this is not that simple, right? We have to be a little more careful. For example, for example, let us say that I have, instead of x equals to 10, I have a vector of it, right? So vector of int is just a list of it. So uh, if you are coming from a programming language like Python, so this is in C++, in Python, you would just have uh, x equals to list of something, right? In uh, Java, maybe you will have x equals to array list, Right, array list of integers and so on. Right, let us suppose that we have a vector of int. So we are saying x equals to vector of int, and it has, let's say, a size of 1000 elements. Right, 1000 elements. Right? Or let us say that it has a size of n. It has a size of n. What if I try to do something like this print x? How much time do you think this print x will take now? How much time do you think this print x will take now? Well, earlier we said that print x was going to take a constant amount of time. Right, but now it will not take a constant amount of time because in order to print a large, large array, it will have to go through that entire array. Right, it will have to go through that entire array. So whenever we are talking about very simple data structures, whenever we are talking about the basic data types, right, like integers, like floats, then the operations on them will be constant amount of time. But when we have larger data structures, for example, when we have vectors or when we have hash maps, right, then operations on them can take more time. So for example, in this case, the print function will take order of n time. It will be linear. Does that make sense? So we have to be careful over here. We have to be careful before we uh, before we simply say that, okay, this is constant time. We have to be a little more careful. Okay. So now let us move on to some more, uh, some control flow structures. All right. Suppose that we have code that looks like this. Uh, if condition, if condition, right? And if this is the condition, then we do some do some work over here that is that takes o of fn time else we do some work over here that takes o of gn time right so basically we are saying that if this condition is true we will go into this part we'll go into this block and the time complexity of this block is order of fn right whereas if this condition is not true we will go into this block and the time complexity of this block is order of gn so if this is the case then what is the time complexity of this overall piece of code what is the time complexity of this overall piece of code? Well, the time complexity of this overall piece of code is, it is the maximum, maximum out of fn comma gn, right? So you will, you will basically say that this is order of max of fn comma gn. Is that clear? Cool. Alternatively, you could have also said that this is order of fn plus gn, right? Even though, even though, depending on this condition, you will only go into one of these blocks, right? It is not the case that you're going into both these blocks. However, asymptotically, this and this, they are exactly the same. Why are they the same? Can somebody tell me that? Because these are related by a constant factor, right? These are related by a constant factor. If I just multiply this, if I just multiply this value by two times, Right? If I just multiply this value by two times, then this value, two times this maximum value will become greater than fn plus gn, right? which is why it doesn't really matter which one we say. Is that clear? Cool. Now let us move on to loops, for example. All right. So we, we just covered if else statements. They, they are a part of control flow. Let us move on to loops. So let us suppose that we have a for loop, something like this. i equals to zero, i less than n, i plus plus, right? And in this loop, 
let us say we are doing a uh, print i yes so whenever we are talking about loops we have to we have to look at the time complexity in different parts okay so first of all we will say what is the time complexity of this inside block what is the time complexity of this inside block well this is constant right printing a particular value it takes just one step right so this inside block is constant then we will see okay how many times how many times are we going to run this inside block so this inside block although it takes a constant amount of time it is not going to be run once right we are going to run this again and again how many times are we going to run this well how many times this loop will run right so that will that is how much this loop goes from 0 all the way till n minus 1 so that is n times yes that is n times so it turns out that the complexity of this entire program the complexity of this entire program is n times order of 1 right n times order of 1 which is nothing but order of n is that clear cool let us look at let us look at nested loops so nested loops are very similar so suppose that we have for i goes from 0 i less than n i plus plus right and we have suppose j as well so we have a nested loop inside this for j goes from 0 j less than let's say n j plus plus right and over here we do print suppose i plus j right suppose this is our code then once again we will look at the innermost block we will look at the innermost block and we will say okay how many what is the time complexity of this block right what is the time complexity of this block well the time complexity of this block is just order of 1 because we are printing an integer right we are printing a single integer so the time complexity is just order of 1 then we will ask ourselves okay how many times are we going to run this block how many times are we going to run this block well the answer is not so simple right the answer is not so simple because these both the loops both these loops are going to run this block again and again so let us break it down further let us say that okay let us not let us not worry about the outside loop let us not worry about the outside loop let us look at this piece of code right let us look at this piece of code what is the time complexity of this piece of code will we just saw it earlier right the time complexity of this piece of code is order of n this is order of n why it is order of n because we are running this over an operation n times right this loop will run n times so this this time complexity is order of n then we will say okay now this this blue block this blue block here takes order of n time and we are going to run this blue block n times right so what is the overall time complexity it is n times big o of n which is big o of n square is that clear right so i i hope that you now understand how to calculate the time complexities of nested nested loops all right now we have to be a little more careful once again in this particular loop why was this loop taking order of n time so if we have a loop that looks like this for i equals to 0 i less than n i plus plus we say that this loop ran n times does everyone agree that this loop ran n times yes what about if we had a loop that looks something like this for i equals to 0 i less than n i plus equals to 2 right instead of incrementing by 1 what if we incremented by 2 or what if we incremented by 200 now the loop will not run n times right now how many times will the loop run if this is the case then how many times will the loop run it will run n by 200 times yes n by 200 times well let us look at the time complexity in that case let us say that inside this we were doing over work right inside both these things we were doing over work so the time complexity of the previous block was n times order of 1 which was order of n the time complexity of this block is what it is n by 200 times order of 1 which is what which is order of n by 200 well order of 2 n by 200 is actually the same as order of n is that clear the order of n by 200 the big o of n by 200 is actually the same as big o of n right because as we said in the big o time complexity in the asymptotic notations we kind of ignore the constant multiplicative factors right any constant multiplicative or additive factors can be ignored is that clear yes cool so basic no, no these are separate loops guys these are separate loops these are two different pieces of code we are saying what happens when we do i plus plus whereas what or compared to that what happens when we do i plus equals to 200 all right this loop will run n times this loop will run n by 200 times these are different pieces of code right they are not nested loops okay these are not nested loops yes so yes there is true it is true that this this particular loop this loop runs 200 times less 
right this this loop runs only n by 200 times whereas this loop runs n times but the time complexity asymptotic time complexity of both the loops is the same is that clear okay so sorrel has a question over here sorrel says that okay when we did this if else condition thing you told us the following you told us that big o of fn plus gn is the same as big o of max of fn comma gn right this is what i said let us try to prove why this is the case okay let us try to prove why this is the case all right so let us go to the definition of big o once again right let us go to the definition of big o once again let us let us look at this particular part over here right let us look at this particular part so i am going to prove i am going to prove that for large enough n right when when the value of n0 is large enough and for some constant c for some constant c i am going to prove the following fn plus gn is less than or equal to c times max of fn comma gn right and this will be for all n greater than n not yes if i can prove this if i can prove this then what will that mean that will mean that fn plus gn is actually an element of big of max of fn comma gn is that clear does that make sense cool so let us see let us see if this is true or not let us see if this is true or not well let us fix n not let us say n not equals to 0 okay let us say that n not equals to 0 so we are we are having a very small value of n not that does not matter let us let us now choose a value of c let us say that c equals to 2 okay let us say that c equals to 2 well if c equals to 2 then does this equation hold fn plus gn is less than equal to 2 times max of fn comma gn is this equation true is this equation true yes this is true why is this true well we don't really know what is larger what is larger between fn and gn but let us suppose that fn is larger right let us suppose that fn is larger so what will this be this will be 2 times fn minus some delta value because gn is smaller than fn whereas on the right hand side we have 2 times the maximum of fn and gn will be fn itself so that will be 2 times f of n so we see that yes this this equation in fact holds right which is why we can say that fn plus gn is is an element of big o of max of fn comma gn right similarly we can do this the other way around as well we can also prove that max of fn comma gn this is in fact less than or equal to some c2 times fn plus gn for some larger of value value of n right so we can prove this the other way around as well so that will mean that this does not just this go one way right this is true but also this is true max of fn comma gn is is an element of big o of fn plus gn right so this is also true and if we if we put these both together if we put this both together we see that hey irrespective of what function i choose i can say that this function grows faster than this function right if i am telling you that x is less than y x is less than equal to y and i also tell you that y is less than equal to x what does that mean if i have both these equations what does that really mean it means that x is just the same as y yes is that clear so over here we can say that f of n plus g of n is the same as max of fn comma gn right but this is not correct right this is not correct we have to be careful we do not mean equals to over here right we do not mean equals to over here. clearly these two functions are not we mean the order of growth right we mean the order of growth is equal right now this equation is correct is that clear yes perfect cool so let us look at one more one more for loop for example so suppose we have a for loop that looks something like this so we have for i goes from 0 i less than n i multiplication equals to 2 right then print i how much time do you think this particular loop will take well let us let us look at what happens in this loop right what happens in this loop so initially so let, let us start with i equals to 1 in fact let us start with i equals to 1 right so initially i equals to 1 right then we will print i print 1 then what will happen i will be multiplied by 2 i becomes 2 so we will print 2 after that i becomes 4 then i becomes 8 then i becomes 16 and so on and so forth right so i is doubling each and every time 
right? I is doubling each and every time. So if I has to reach n, right? How many steps will it take to reach n? That is the question. If I keeps doubling each and every time, how many steps will it take to reach n? That is the question. Will it take n time n steps? Will it take under root of n steps? Will it take n by two steps? Will it take log n steps? What do you think is the answer? Well, this is the answer, right? It will actually take log of n base two steps. Right? It will take log of n base two steps. Is everyone familiar with this? Right? This is via the definition of log n. Right? I hope that everyone is familiar with this. If you are not, if you are not super comfortable with this, not a problem. Just just join the discussion. Right? In the chat, there will be a link for the discussion. Just join over there, and we can I can explain that to you in much more detail. Why this is going to take log n steps? All right? Cool. So this particular loop, this particular piece of code, this takes order of one time and we are going to do that log n times. So the complexity of this code is overall going to be order of log of n. Is that clear? Yes. Perfect. Let us look at another example maybe. Let us say that we have uh, for i equals to, let us say one, right? And we can say that, okay, let us, let us have j is less than n i plus plus okay so please note over here let's let's not let's not make it j let us say that this is k let's say that this is k so we are going from i equals to one we are incrementing i and we are checking the condition with respect to k and inside the loop we will write k equals to k plus i is that here is this program clear initially k equals to zero and we are going from k equals to zero all the way till k equals to n and this is the program so let us see what will happen let us see what will happen. So how much time is this inner part going to take? What is the time complexity of this inner part? Well, very simple once again, this is just order of one time. Right? This just takes order of one time. But how many times are we going to execute this? Right? How many times is this code going to run? Is this loop going to run? Uh, let us try to analyze that. Right? So initially k is zero and i is one. Right? Initially k is zero and i is one. So when we do this, k will become one. Right? When we do this, k will become one. Okay, then what happens in the next step? What happens in the next step? We go to this thing, right? I plus plus. So I becomes two now. I becomes two now, right? So when I becomes two, what will K become? What will K become? K will become, so K was earlier one plus two, which will now be three, right? So K equals to three. Yes, does that make sense? Let us look at the next step. Let us look at the next step. So now I equals to three, K will become one plus two plus three, Right? 1 plus 2 plus 3, which will be actually equal to 6. Right? So we'll print k equals to 6 and so on and so forth. So how much time, how much time do you think it will take for k to reach n? Right? How many steps will it take? How many steps will it take? So after the first step, so after the first step, k was 1. After the second step, k was 3. After the third step, k was 6. After the fourth step, k will be 10 and so on and so forth. So after how many steps, after how many steps will K be greater than or equal to N? That is the question, right? What is the Delta here? The Delta here keeps changing, right? The Delta here keeps changing. Initially it was one, then it became two, then it became three, then it became four and so on. It will keep on increasing, right? So that is the question. So can someone tell me the answer? Well, we will have to, we will have to do some mathematics over here, right? We will have to do some mathematics over here. So basically what is happening with K is, at the ith step, at the ith step, the value of k is equal to 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way till i. Do you guys agree? At the ith step, this is the value of k. Yes, because that is what we are doing, right? We are incrementing the value of i and we are adding it to k every time. So at the ith step, this is the value of k. All right. So let us let us try to solve this. So do you guys know this? Do you guys know the, the formula for this? What is the value? of 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way till n right with you can also write this as the summation for i equals to 1 till n of i right this is the sum of sum of first and natural numbers can someone tell me the formula this this is simply the same as n into n plus 1 by 2 right this is also known as the nth triangular triangular number this is also the same as n plus 1 choose 2 right you can represent the same thing in multiple multiple ways in mathematics you can say you can say it like this 
you can say it like this you can say it like this you can say it like this you can say it like this and you can say it like this all right so many different ways okay so now that we know this formula now that we know this formula what we are basically saying is that at ith step at ith step k equals to 1 plus 2 plus all the way till i which is nothing but i times i plus 1 by 2 right that is what we are saying at the ith step k will have this value right now our question is at what step at what step will k be greater than equal to n right that is the question is this clear so we have an equation to solve right so we are basically saying if at the ith step k is this then at what step will k be greater than equal to n so let us simply place the value right we want i times i plus 1 by 2 to be greater than or equal to n yes i plus i into i plus 1 by 2 is greater than equal to n right so basically i Uh, into i plus one is greater than equal to two n, right? And if we solve this, if we make it in terms of i, right? if we make it in terms of i, so remember what we have to find. We have to find the value of i because we want which step, how many steps does it take. So it will turn out that i will come out to be, will come out to be of the form square root of n. Right? It won't be exactly square root of n. It will have some particular value over there, but the effective will be that i will be order of square root of n. Is that clear? Yes. Yes. How do you actually solve for i from this? How do you actually solve for i from this? So you can make it into a quadratic equation, right? So you can say i square plus i is greater than equal to two n. Then you can say i square plus i minus two n is greater than equal to zero. Then you can solve it with the minus so minus b plus minus root over of b square minus four ac by two n. Right? You can put the value of b, the value of a, and the value of c to find the final value, and it will turn out that i will be of some form of root n. So i is the order of root n. So what we are essentially saying is, what we are essentially saying is that the loop, the loop will run order of root n times. Yes, the loop will run order of root n times. And how much, how much work are we doing in every single iteration? In every single iteration, we are doing a constant amount of work, right? In every single iteration, we are doing a constant amount of work. So overall time complexity, overall time complexity will be order of root n times order of one. Which is nothing but order of root n. All right. So the time complexity of this particular function will be this particular loop will be order of root. N. Okay. Cool. So I guess we will end the lecture for this today. So this was today was very simple concepts, the very very basics of time complexity, very simple loops, very simple if else statements. Right. Uh, we are going to cover a lot of things in a lot of depth. Right. So we will when we will have the class on recursion, we will tell you how to. Understand how to analyze the time complexity of recursion. When we talk about sorting, we will consider the time complexity of sorting. When we talk about graphs and trees, we will talk about the time complexity analysis for graphs and trees. All right. So do not worry about that. Cool. All right then, guys. Have a nice day. Bye bye. So my name is Shitesh, and I will be discussing about arrays in today's class. Okay. So in today's class, we are going to discuss some challenging problems on arrays, which can be solved just by uh, just by the knowledge of arrays. In tomorrow's class, we will be discussing some more challenging problems on two D arrays, and then uh, in the upcoming classes, we will be discussing about uh, about sorting. Okay. So in the next four five classes, we will be discussing about uh, arrays and sorting algorithms. Okay. So before we start the class. Uh, I just want your uh, your opinion on have have you guys ever worked with arrays? Have you guys ever used arrays? Are you guys familiar with what is an array? Arrays are nothing but collection of same type of data, right? You can have an array of integers, you can have an array of uh, strings, you can have an array of floating point uh, data structure, or you can e even have an array of objects, right? So array is nothing but a collection of data. And arrays, all the values in the arrays are stored in continuous memory locations, right? So if you have an array A of size five, and if this is your memory, all these uh, array elements are going to be stored in continuous memory chunks, right? So they are always in a sequence. Correct, homogeneous collection of data. Absolutely correct. Okay. Now uh, in today's class, we are going to see some of the problems. Which do not require any algorithm, which do not require knowledge of any other data structure other than arrays. Okay, and these problems have been asked in Google, they have been asked in Facebook, they have been asked in Amazon. 
So if you are just familiar with arrays and if you have a basic logic building uh, or problem solving skills, you can attempt these problems. Okay. Uh, right. So regarding the language, so most of you are asking in which language are we going to discuss the problems, right? So let's let's keep the session language agnostic. Okay. We'll be discussing the logic. We will be discussing the pseudo code, but all the logics that we are going to discuss, they will be language agnostic. So whether you are coding with C, C++, Java, Python, Ruby, doesn't matter. You can apply those logics. You can apply the same solution in any language. Okay. So keep things language agnostic and let's focus on the problem solving techniques. Okay. One more th thing guys, that with the class, you will also be getting the problems that we are going to discuss. You will get the exact same problems. You will also get some variations of these problems. Okay. So that you can uh, test your knowledge there. Right. So I strongly recommend all of you to attempt those problems. Because if you are just listening in the class uh, and, and you feel that you, are, you have understood everything, you might understand things, but after a while you will forget. So it's always better to reinforce your knowledge by practicing those problems. Okay, So I will strongly recommend you guys to solve all the problems which are provided in the description link. Okay, cool. So let us start uh, the session with a very, very interesting problem. And this problem was asked in uh, in Amazon. This has been asked in Facebook. This has been asked in Google. Okay. The problem says that you are given an array, and in this array, you you are having uh, heights of some buildings. Okay. So you can consider that these are two D buildings, two dimensional buildings with uh, a width of of size one, and the height is given to you in an array. So let's say that this is uh, the array in which you have all the heights of the buildings. Okay. Now you can see this picture. So these these are the buildings, right? And and these black bars are are the buildings. And uh, it's it's raining heavily in the city. So you have got some clouds and it's actually raining heavily. And because of the rain. There is some water which is being trapped between the buildings. Okay, so these are the clouds, not so good looking clouds, but yes, they there are clouds. And you can see some water being trapped in between the buildings. So given the heights of the buildings, you have to identify what is the total amount of water which is being trapped in, in between these buildings. Okay, is the problem making sense? So up logo array mein buildings ya bars ki height be hai. And Mape Share me bought it barish or so Chuki a two dimensional world hub puts water trap for a in buildings. Okay, up to what an eye key total kitna amount of water the joki trap for a okay, right? This this is a very very famous problem, it is called trapping rainwater. Uh, this is a problem of this is a problem which is present in each and every platform. This is in lead code, this is in uh, interview bit, this is in geeks or geeks, this is in hacker thing. This is present in each and every platform because this is very, very frequently asked problem, right? So, what is the answer for this case? Here we can see that six unit of water is being trapped, right? One unit here, then you have one unit here, one unit here. So, let's actually draw the squares, right? This is one unit of water. Then you have one unit of water here, then you have one unit of water here, one unit here, one unit here, and one unit here. Right? So you have got six units of water being trapped between these buildings here. Okay. Now the question is that given the array, you have to identify, you have to uh, calculate the total amount. Okay. How to approach this problem? Okay. So let's focus on what is contributing to the total amount. How do we calculate the total amount? So how, how have we counted the total amount of water in this case? To count the total amount of water, what have we done? We have just counted what is the amount of water trapped above each and every bar, right? So if, if I count what is the total amount of water trapped above each and every bar, and if I just add that, that would be the answer. For example, here, this bar length is zero. So this bar is having zero amount of water trap here the bar length is one but even then 
the amount of water trapped above it is zero. Here, the amount of water trapped above this bar of length zero is one. Similarly, here we have zero amount of water. Above this bar, we have one unit of water, right? Similarly, above this bar, we have two units of water. Here we have one, then again zero, zero, and one, zero, and zero. So if, if we just add all of these, we'll get the answer. If, if we just add the, uh, the amount of water or the size of the water column trapped above each and every building, we get the answer. Now the question is, how to get the amount of water trapped above each and every bar? So we have reduced the problem from finding the total amount of water to count what is the what is the amount of water trapped above each and every bar. But how to do that? Okay, again, let's let's make some more observations here. Okay. So we have seen that the amount trapped above this bar is zero. Okay. Why is this amount zero? Why is it not non-zero? Why is this amount? Why is this bar not able to trap any amount of water above it? Simple reason is that there is nothing on the left side to hold the water, right? There is something on the right side, but if, if the water falls here, there, there is nothing on the left to hold it. Right? If, if there had been a bar on the left side, then you would be getting some water here, but there is nothing on the left side. So you can just consider this as a vessel which is of, uh, of this L shape. You can consider this scenario as a L-shaped vessel. If you fill any liquid inside a L-shaped vessel, it will just flow from here. Right? You cannot trap the uh, liquid with in a vessel which does not have the boundary. Right? So that's why here we have zero amount of water. Now, what about this bar? This also has uh, this also has zero amount of water. What is the reason for that? This is not me. This has to be zero. What is the reason for this? Again, the same reason. This bar also does not does not have anything on the left side to hold the water. Right? That's why this is also not trapping anything. When we come to this bar, this bar has got a size zero, but it is able to trap a water column of height one. Simple reason being, it has got something on the left and something on the right as well. So now this is forming a complete vessel. Right. So it, it can hold water, uh, a water column of size one. Now we come to this bar again. This this has got a bar which is on the left side. Right? If I'm talking about this bar here, this has got a bar on the left side. Even after that, this bar is not able to hold any water. Why? Because the bar which we have on the left side has got a smaller height, right? If you have to hold some water above this bar, you need something on the left and something on the right of a higher height, right? So you can assume that this is the surface of your vessel. Now, this bar here is below the surface, right? So you need something which is higher the surface. Then only you can trap some water inside this, correct? So that is why this is also not able to trap anything. Now, when you come here, this has got something on the left and something on the right as well. Okay. So one thing which is very clear from this observation is that to trap the water, you definitely need something on the left side, something on the right side of a higher height than the current bar. Right? This bar is not able to trap because it doesn't have anything on the left. This bar is able to trap because it has a support on the left side as well as on the right side. So it has got uh, both the boundaries, correct? Cool. Now the question is, how do we... Uh, so we have determined that some of the bars will not be able to hold, but the bars which are holding the water, how much water is going to be there, okay? Now to do that, to, to actually analyze that, let's consider a very simple example first, okay? So let's say that the heights of the bars are two, one, and three. So we have got a bar of size two, then we have got a bar of size one, and then we have got a bar of size three. And we are talking about this middle bar. We, we have to identify what is the amount of water being trapped above this middle bar, okay? This has got height two, this has got height one, this has got height. 
can you guys quickly respond what is the amount of water which will be trapped above this bar the size of the water column here is it going to be one is it going to be two is it going to be three it's going to be one right why one because the height on the left side is this this height is of size two right and we have this bar till height one so the only limited space that we have for the water is this column anything above it will flow from here correct okay let's change the example let's add some more bars here okay so initially we have this configuration where we have bar of size two one and three now i am going to add one more bar on the left side and this bar is also of length three now how much water will be trapped above this bar is it still going to be one or now will will we have some more water here yes it's going to be two this time why because now we have got a higher support on the left side right so if if it is continuously raining all this area will be filled with water right and now we can see that this column the height of this column has now become two right the height of the water column trapped above the uh, above this bar has now become two height of the water column above this bar has now become two okay why has it become two in this case it was one now it has become two what is the reason what is the reason the reason is the addition of this bar right let's add some more bars okay let us add some more bars to this configuration so i will be adding a bar on the left side let's raise a bar of size 4 will the height of the water column uh, stored above this will increase if i have just added a bar on on the right side of length 4 will the height of the water column above this bar is it going to increase no right because on the left side it is still 3 on the left side the maximum that we can have is still 3 anything above it is going to flow from here if we also add another bar of size 4 on the left side as well now will it increase yes now it's going to increase because from both the sides we have got a height of size 4 right so is is this complete observation making sense to you guys the height of the water column stored above any height is nothing but the minimum of the maximum height that you can get on the left side and the maximum height that you can get on the right side correct right? the height of the water column stored above this is minimum of maximum height available on right and maximum height available on the left so if i have to identify what is the height of this column right height of water column above bar i this is equal to this is nothing but the minimum of maximum bar on left side maximum bar on right side minus the height of bar i so if i am talking about if this is my ith bar the water column trapped above this bar is how much this is minimum of maximum of left maximum of right minus the height of this current bar if i have to calculate the total amount of water this is just going to be the sum of all such values correct so the answer that we are going to calculate sum of this value for each and every height right sum of minimum of left max right max minus height of bar so i will be calculating the minimum of left max minimum Uh, and right max for each and every bar subtract the height of that bar and keep adding it so whatever we get at the end is going to be the answer correct let's quickly do this thing on the given example right what is the minimum uh, what is the minimum on the left side for this minimum on the left side for the first bar is zero there is nothing on the left sorry ma maximum on the left side right maximum on the right side is this bar of length 3 but 
since we are taking the minimum of left max and right max minimum becomes zero zero minus the height of the bar is zero right so this is not going to hold anything what about the first one again left max is minimum uh, left max is zero so uh, we won't be getting anything right for this bar for for this water column the left max is is one right the right max is three so minimum of left and right is one minus the the height of this bar which is zero so this is going to hold one unit of water right so if we do the same thing for each and every bar we are going to get the answer let's also see for this column so here what is the left max left max has got a height two right max has got a height three minimum of two and three is two right. so this bar is going to hold two minus the height of this which is zero this much amount of water so we just have to do this thing for each and every bar and we add whatever amount is trapped over that bar and we get the answer okay okay let's let's do this in this example let me just clean it up a bit let's try to calculate what is the total amount of water that will be trapped in this scenario okay if this is the landscape of the buildings that we have what will be the total amount of water trapped here okay so we are saying that the total amount of water trapped is the sum of water trapped above each and every building what if negative heights are not going to be negative right negative height means that you are digging a hole and then you are so it's basically kind of a plane so you can assume that such buildings with negative heights are not possible okay okay let's let's uh, try to run our approach on this thing okay on this scenario so for this building what is the maximum height on left side maximum height on left is 0 maximum height on right is 4 for the first building the answer is going to be 0 right for the second building maximum height on right is 4 oh, sorry maximum height on left is 4 maximum height on right is also 4 right so we'll be getting minimum of these two minus whatever is the height of the building which is three so this is going to contribute one unit of water okay then uh, in the next building so the one unit of water comes here in the next building we will be checking minimum of what is the left max left max is still four what is the right max right max is still four building size is two so we get two units of water above this okay similarly for the next buildings again uh, left max right max are four and four building height is one so we get three units of water above this okay similarly we'll be doing for this as well and this as well and once we add all these values we'll be getting the answer okay cool so now once this is clear to everyone can you guys tell me what is going to be the time complexity of this approach so for every bar we are calculating a maximum on the left side we are calculating the maximum on the right side and then we are applying uh, this observation and getting the height what should be the time complexity if we go by this approach okay let let me just reiterate over this example again for uh, if i'm calculating for this bar i will have to calculate what is the left maximum to calculate the left maximum i will be iterating over all the possible bars on the left side to calculate the right maximum i will be iterating over all possible bars on the right side how much time is this operation going to take this is going to take order n how much time is this operation going to take this is also going to take order n right so to calculate the water column above each and every bar we are doing an order n operation because these two are going to get added right and we are going to do this operation for each and every bar there are n bars in total if there are n bars and for every bar our calculation requires order n time complexity what is going to be the total time complexity right so there are n bars for every bar we are going to do order n operation so the total time complexity is going to be order n squared okay can we optimize this order n time complexity 
in the last class you must have learned that order n is not a very good time complexity right yes within the you are absolutely correct uh, right guys so to to optimize the time complexity again let's make a very very simple observation right so till now we have deduced that for every bar we have to calculate the left max and the right max okay let's talk about the last bar okay if i am talking about the last bar then we are calculating the left max for the last bar how how actually we calculate the maximum for this the order and operation of the maximum of finding the maximum how do we run it so we will be declaring a max right and we'll keep updating it after visiting each and every bar so we'll initialize a maximum value we can initialize it with a very uh, with maybe minus infinity or maybe a not possible or, or zero maybe we can also initialize it with the length of the first bar okay so we say that currently the maximum is this and we'll keep updating the maximum as soon as we visit all the bars in this order and loop right so if let's let's actually take a complex example so if if the bars are of size 2 3 1 4 5 2 1 7 okay 2 9 if these are the lengths of the bars if i have to calculate the maximum from left for this last bar right i'll be starting from here okay let's initialize the maximum with zero okay so we are saying that whatever is the maximum uh, between the current maximum and the current bar is is going to become the maximum right so maximum is initialized by zero when we reach here we say that 2 is the maximum then when we reach here at 3 we compare this value with the current maximum right this is how we calculate the maximum of an array correct so we calculate current value of uh, of the array with the current maximum so 3 becomes the maximum then we we compare this one with the current max let's call it the current max okay again 3 remains the maximum so we'll fill 3 here so this means that till here till this point 3 has got the maximum height right or similarly uh for the next step we'll be comparing 4 with 3 okay so this gives us 4 as the maximum then it gives 5 and then we'll be having 5 5 till this point then we get 7 and then 7 continues till here so the maximum for on the left side for this bar is 7 okay now in this process if you have observed what have we done we have not only computed the max for the last bar but we have also computed the left max for each and every bar so if you just store all these values in an array instead of just making uh, instead of just keeping a variable of the current max if you just have an array and store all these values inside the array these values are corresponding to the maximum height on the left side for each and every index is this making sense till this point 5 is the maximum till this point again 5 is the maximum right till this point 7 is the maximum so while you are calculating the maximum value for the last bar you have not only calculated the maximum on left for the last but you have also calculated the maximum for each and every index so in in a single iteration we have the values of left max for each and every value okay let let me just repeat let's clear each and everything here let's do it once again okay so when we have to calculate when we have to calculate the maximum on the left for the last bar first of all is everyone clear that we will be calculating the left max for each and every bar and right max for each and every bar yes now for let's let's talk about this guy let's talk about this bar if you have to calculate the left max you will be iterating over this part of the array right you will maintain a left max for this bar and you will keep updating that left max while visiting the array right you will initialize a left max with zero you will check uh, whether zero is greater or this is a value is greater right so you will keep updating this left max while updating the uh, while iterating over the array similarly you will do the same thing for the right max as well correct now let's talk about the last element 
let's not talk about the middle element let's talk about the last element when we are doing it for the last element we are actually calculating the left max for each and every index right left max till now is zero right or or let's call it two here so we have initialized the left max by two or uh, by zero we compare it with two we get uh, two here then we get three here right then we get three again here then we get four here five here five continues till we get a longer height which is seven right and again we get seven here what if nine is not present then also you do the same thing if if nine is not present you have one bar less in your uh, in your structure then you will be when you calculate the left max for the last index doesn't matter whether it is nine or any other number when you are calculating the left max for the last index you have actually calculated the left max for each and every index in this process the only thing is that you will have to store these values instead of updating the current max variable if you just store these values in the array you get the left max for each and every index similarly while calculating the right max for this uh, for this index the first max index you will be calculating the right max for each and every value correct because to calculate the right max for the first index you will be iterating from from the right side and you will be you will keep updating all the values one by one right so you start from here till now the max is 2 then you get 7 and then 7 continues to be the max till now okay so is this observation making sense the observation is that we don't need to run this order n loop for each and every index because when you are calculating the left max for the right most element and when you are calculating the right max for the left most element you are essentially calculating each and every value which is required in this calculation so instead of instead of running these two loops of of order n on each and every index what we can do is we can just run a single loop and we can store all the required data we can do some pre computation okay we need to extra arrays yes we will be needing to extra arrays let's call this array as the left max array and let's call this array as the right max array okay if we have stored these values can you guys now tell me what will be the amount of water stored over any ith index stored over any ith bar if i talk about this bar what will be the answer what will be the amount of what is stored over this bar we need the maximum bar we need the maximum bar on the left side of this from where can we get it the maximum bar on left side of this bar is here right we have already calculated it the maximum bar the maximum bar on the right side of this bar is present here if 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 we are talking about the ith index the left max is stored at left max i minus 1 and the right max is stored at right max i plus 1 okay you don't need to run two loops for each and every number we can just pre compute the left max and right max for each and every index and using these values now we can again we can have a different loop and we can get these values in order one okay what if we store in the ith index itself will that work that will definitely work anushka you will just have to check uh, like you can also store for every ith index you can store what is the uh, left most left max height at this index and right max height at this index you will just have to uh, calculate you will have to like uh, this you will have to keep check on the corner cases okay if if you are able to keep checks on the corner cases then that will also work okay so let's let's quickly see the pseudo code okay so we can have a left max array okay Uh, what will be the size of this array 
size of the array is going to be same as the size of the input array because for each and every index we want this information right so its size should be equal to n whatever is the size of the input array correct and similarly we'll also be having a, a write max array which will store uh, which will store the write max for each and every part okay then let us initialize these values so we can say that left max of 0 can be initialized from the array 0 okay and right max of of uh, okay let's let's come to the right max after we finish this right so we have initialized this for the zeroth index that means i'm saying that for zeroth index this is the answer the height of uh, the bar is the answer now for the remaining bars we can just run a loop which will start from some point go till n and will be going to from where should we start the loop should it start from zero should it start from any other number yes the loop is going to start from from index one because we have already filled the value on index zero so we don't need to start from index zero okay and for every index we can say that left max of i is nothing but the maximum of the previous max which is left max of i minus one and the current array value the current height so whatever is the maximum between the current height right between the current height and the previous is going to be the left max of this iteration okay similarly in the for the next value of i we'll be comparing this value and this value okay so we have our left max uh, array filled up now we'll also initialize the right max array so for the right max array how, how did we start we started from the right side right we said that we are starting from here and let's copy the array value uh, the last array value in the last index of the right max array because for this value there is nothing on the right side so we are starting from here okay so right max of n minus 1 is going to be array of n minus 1 and now similarly we can have a, a loop which will also start from some number go till 0 and will be this is going to run from right to left so that's why we are doing i minus 1 so from where should we start it this loop will start from i n minus 1 we have already filled the value for n minus 1 right so this should not start from n minus 1 n minus 1 is some value which is pre-required to compute the value at this index so we'll be starting from the index n minus 2 right to calculate the value here we need to compare this value which is the previously calculated value and the current height okay so let's go back here we'll be starting this from n minus 2 and right max of i is going to be the maximum of what will come here yes it should be i plus one because now when i'm checking for this index i am comparing this value if, if this is index i this is i plus one not i minus one. in case of left left max we were comparing with the previous index now we are comparing with the next index right so this is going to be right of i plus one and the current array value okay so now we have got the left max and the right max array populated okay now we don't we just have to run a single loop to calculate the total amount of water trapped so you can have a variable water initialized with zero and now we can run a loop and this loop should run for each and every height so we'll start from i equals to zero less than n We'll be incrementing the i with one and we can simply say keep adding uh, the amount of water trapped over each and every bar in this variable so water plus equals to or you can also write it as water equals to water plus the how do we calculate the height of water column minimum of left max right max right minus the array value i what is the time complexity of this approach time complexity of this is see first in this course 
code first we are populating the left max array for each and every bar we need what is the left max so this is going to count order n plus this array this loop is also going to uh, going to be of order n plus this loop is also going to cost order n right so the total time complexity of this approach is order this order 3n which asymptotically is same as order n right order 3n is nothing but this is same as order n because when you can create the time complexity you ignore the constants right h case missed right so if this is just a pseudo code okay now you have to attempt this problem you have to solve it on your own and in the code which you are writing you have to take care of all the edge cases as well okay himanshu that is on you now so you have to do it on your own okay what is the space complexity guys can you tell me what is the space complexity we are using two arrays of size n right so it is going to be order n in space as well okay let's do one thing let me just tell you the problem okay this is also a very very interesting and very frequently asked problem which is called the majority element the problem says that you are given an array you have to find the majority element in that array the majority element is the element that occurs more than n by 2 times okay which means that the number of times that element is occurring in the array should be strictly greater than n by 2 for example if this is your array 3 3 4 2 4 4 three, 4 can you guys quickly tell me what is the majority element in this array n which is the size of the array what is the size of the array in this case 9 right now which is the element which is coming more than 9 by 2 times correct majority element in this case is 4 because 4 is occurring 5 times okay 4 is the majority element here because 4 occurs 5 times let's take another example let's say we have 3 3 4 2 4 4 3 What is the majority element in this case? Size of the array is a. What is the majority element which is occurring more than four times in this case? Four is occurring four times, right? But we need something which occurs more than n by two times. Four is not more than two, so in this case we do not have any majority element. Okay, no majority element. So you have to if there is a majority element you have to return that element if there is none you can return none okay this is the problem is the problem clear to everyone uh, what what would be a brute force way to solve this problem what if two elements are majority elements in the same array guys that is a very very interesting thing that satyam has asked can there be two majority elements inside a single array satyam think about it can there be two elements which are occurring more than n by 2 times no right uh, how four is greater four is not greater than this but the count of four is five right we have to count the number of times this element is occurring we, we are, don't have to return the element which is greater than n by 2 we have to count the number which is occurring more than n by 2 times okay uh cool so what is going to be the brute force solution here brute force solution is going to be simply you run two loops for each and every element you just check whether that element is a majority element or not select this element in the remaining array count the number of occurrences if the total number of occurrences is greater than n by 2 return it otherwise go to the next element check for this element in the remaining array if it is occurring more than n by 2 time return what is going to be this time complexity of this approach it's going to be order n square why because you are running two loops of size n correct right? okay so brute force is not going to work this is uh, too slow how can we optimize it 
using hash map, right? So uh, some of you are saying that we can use hash maps. If if you use a hash map, first of all, uh, how how can we solve this problem using a hash map? So this is a very very good suggestion that you use a. What is hash map? Is everyone clear with that? If you are not clear, you can skip this. If you are clear, you can think in this direction. Hash map is nothing but a key value pair, right? So you can have a key and you can have a value in the hash map. Now every array element becomes the key and the frequency becomes the value. So against three, you keep one. Then you again go to three. You see that three has already occurred in the hash map. You increase the frequency. Okay. Then you go to four. Four is not occurred yet. You keep it and you put one here. So after you have iterated all the array, yes, it, it's totally like the dictionary in Python. Okay. After you have iterated all the array, you will be having all the array elements along with their frequencies. Okay. So four will be five at the end because the frequency of four is going to be five, and the frequency of three is going to be two, and two is also going to be two. This is the value, the array element, and this is the frequency. After you have uh, made this complete map, you can iterate over all the keys and you can figure out which of them is the majority element. This is one of the approaches. What is going to be the time complexity of this approach? If you are not aware about what is a hash map, you can totally skip it. We will be covering hash map in details in the upcoming sessions. But if you are clear about hash map, then you can just think about what is the time complexity of this approach. This is going to be order n time complexity. Correct. What is the space complexity here? You are using a hash map which is going to cost you order n space, right? Order n time complexity plus order n space complexity. Okay. You have to solve this problem in a linear time with constant space okay this has to be your time complexity this has to be your space complexity is the requirement clear to everyone you cannot use a hash map if you are not clear about the hash map approach completely skip it because this is something that you cannot use in the question okay we have to solve this problem in order and time complexity order one space complexity okay think about it this is going to be something which we'll discuss in the next class. Right. So in today's class, we'll first discuss the majority element question that we discussed uh, in the last class, and then we'll solve one more problem, which will be based on a two dimensional array. Okay. So uh, the problem uh, that we left unsolved in the last class was that you are given an array and you have to find the majority element of that array. The problem says that you are given an array and in this array you have to find the majority element. Okay, the majority element is an element which is occurring more than n by 2 times, more than uh, n by 2 where n is the size of the array. Okay, so if the array size is 9, the element has to be there at least 5 times. Okay, it is possible that there is no majority element in the array because there is there might be a possibility that there is no element which is opting more than n by 2 times, right? Correct. So the brute force way to solve this problem as proposed by Sai is that you run two loops and for every element you check the number of count uh, of that element in the array, right? So you will start from the first element, you will select this element, then you will check in the remaining part what is the total occurrences of this element, okay? You can then see if the total occurrences is greater than n by 2, you can return it. Then you will check for the next element, then you will check for the next element and so on, right? So you will have two loops. One will be selecting a, a prospect candidate. The other will be checking if that element is a majority element or not. This approach is going to cost you order n square time, okay? We discussed a more optimized approach also, which was involving a hash map. If you use a hash map, what will be the time complexity? If you use a hash map, since in hash map you can store a key value pair, right? So a hash map is nothing but a key value pair. 
uh, if you are using python you can uh, think in terms of a dictionary right so key can be your array element and the value can be the frequency of that array element so you iterate over the array once and you keep the count of frequency uh, of of all the elements in this hash map once everything is done or while calculating the frequency only you can just check if there is an element which occurs more than n by 2 times if any element occurs more than n by 2 times then you can return it okay so this uh, approach is going to cost you order n time but order n space as well because you will be using hash map okay how to create hash map in c you can use unordered map in c now the question here is that we have to solve this problem in order and time complexity without using any extra space so we have to solve this problem in constant space complexity without using any extra space okay okay so most of you are saying that now you will apply the moore's voting algorithm which is absolutely correct okay okay we have one more approach the other approach says that you first sort the array if you sort the array since the majority element is going to occur more than n by 2 times right and once you sort the array all the similar elements will be arranged together right so some similar elements will be there then if there is a majority element then it will also be there and then some different elements of similar type will be arranged together if there is an element which is occurring more than n by 2 times once you have sorted this whole array either you can do a linear iteration or maybe you can just check the middle element and check the count of that element as well right so if if you sort the array what will be the time complexity if you are using the most uh, efficient sorting algorithm even after that what is going to be the time complexity of sorting the array it's going to be order n log n right you can use quick sort merge sort or heap sort right and all these sorts are going to run in order n log n time complexity if you are not sure about all these sort sorting algorithms we will be covering them in the upcoming classes so don't worry about it if you know if you already uh, are familiar with the sorting algorithms then you can sort these uh, this array and then you can iterate over the array and count the occurrences of all the distinct elements right so in that case the time complexity is n log n which is absolutely greater than order n right so this is again not an optimal approach okay so let's let's discuss the idea behind the most optimal approach for this problem okay let's try to change the perspective so uh, first let's consider an example let's uh, take this example only okay so if there is a majority element the question says that the majority element will be occurring more than n by 2 times right the, the count of majority element is always going to be greater than half the size of the array if there exists a majority element can i say that the collective counts of all the other elements will always be less than n by 2 if majority element exists if there is a majority element can we say that the count of all other elements combined will be less than n by 2 obviously yes right because half of the array has been occupied by the majority element if you collect all the majority elements together starting from the zeroth index and if this is the n by 2 mark the majority element will definitely occupy starting from zero it will go more than n by 2 right so the remaining space that is left in the array is obviously less than n by 2 correct okay now if this is the case if if everyone is convinced that the count of all the other elements combined is going to be less than n by 2 now let's try to see uh, this whole scenario in terms of let's say uh, election results okay let's let's actually consider all these array elements as the Uh, results of an election result of different constituencies okay so these are different parties this is uh, a party party 4 this is a party party 3 okay and let's try to uh, see the try to see in terms of the election results okay 
so the party to which the majority element belongs okay in this case is going to have one two three four five five constituencies have been won by the majority element right and if if we collect all the other elements together this is going to be one two three four okay so we have some other element a a and some other element b b right so these are the uh, results from different constituencies these five constituencies have been won by the majority element and all these are won by or uh, different candidates okay so if if you remember the 2019 uh, general elections there was a party bjp which was in majority and then there was something uh, called as mahagathbandhan right so in mahagathbandhan there were various parties which were they combined hands and they were fighting against bjp all together right so you can just assume that these all are the constituencies won by the mahagathbandhan and these all are the constituencies won by bjp now if the election commission says that two out of all these constituencies are being disqualified there has been some cheating in two of these constituencies so we are removing the results we are not counting the results of these two constituencies so if if the election commission says that one of bjp's constituency and one of the mahagathbandhan's constituencies will be will not be counted in the election result if these two are removed who is going to win the election if two constituencies here are removed who is the new winner initial winner was bjp right now who is the new winner you can quickly count the total votes and quickly see uh, who is winning it again right it's it's still bjp right so what we have done if you look in terms of this array you have removed one occurrence of the majority element and with that you have also removed one occurrence of a non majority element right so we have reduced the size of the array by 2 and the occurrences of the majority element has been reduced by 1 okay let's say two more constituencies were removed so one from bjp and one from mahagathbandhan again were removed who is the winner who is the new winner now it's it's again bjp right you can quickly see that it is still in majority it is still having a size more than n by 2 right so what we have done here is we have removed one occurrence of the majority element with that we have also removed one occurrence of a non majority element okay again if you do the same thing you can see that bjp still remains in power if you remove two more constituencies we have only one constituency left which is of bjp so the idea is that if with every occurrence of the non majority element if you remove one occurrence of the majority element at the end you will be left with at least one occurrence of a majority element so the idea here is that if i am removing one occurrence of any non majority element with one occurrence of a majority element the majority element still remains the same let's let's try to see it uh, from other analogy as well okay one another analogy could be that there are two countries or let's say there are three four countries and three countries are fighting against one country combined so there is a country c1 there are country c2 plus c3 and let's say c4 okay now c1 has got uh, c1 has got majority of soldiers soldiers right so the soldiers that c1 has let's denote them as s so let's say it has got seven soldiers okay and all these other countries combined okay or let's say that let's represent all these soldiers by i okay then we have uh, some more countries and we have three soldiers in the country c or let's say four soldiers in a country c we have two soldiers in a country p and we have one soldier in a country b okay now since initially the number of uh, soldiers in the country c1 have outnumbered all the soldiers in all the other countries combined 
Now, if one soldier here dies with one soldier of any of these countries, who is going to have majority of the soldiers? Will that change? So initially, C1 is in majority, right? Now, very similar to what we saw in the election, if this soldier dies with this, if these two kill each other, still C1 has got more number of soldiers, right? Actually, here we have one less soldier. Now it is in majority. So initially, it is in majority, right? Now, if one soldier of C1 kills uh, or dies with one of the soldier of all these countries combined, still C1 is in majority. The idea is, if you are removing one occurrence of the majority element with one occurrence of any other element, the majority element still remains the majority element. Can we use this idea to solve this problem optimally? Let's now bring back our example again and let's try to do a dry run on the example. So we have all these numbers. Now, if, if I remove one occurrence of the majority element with one occurrence of any other element, let's see what uh, remains the result. Okay, so if I'm removing four with two, four is still the majority element of, of this uh, remaining array, right? If I remove three with four, Again, four is the majority element, right? If I remove three with four, again, four is the majority element. And finally, we are only left with four, okay? Cool, now the question is that you all, you don't know initially which one of these is the majority element, right? If you don't know which one out of these is the majority element, how are you going to cancel the occurrences of all the other elements with the majority element? The question is, do you need to know the majority element? If I slightly change the initial observation. So initial observation was that if we are removing one occurrence of a majority element with one occurrence of a non-majority element, the majority element remains the same. But if I change this observation to, if I remove two distinct elements at a time, if I remove two distinct elements at a time, the majority element remains the same. Will this also be correct? If instead of always selecting one of the majority element, if I'm selecting any of uh, any of the two elements, making sure that the two elements are distinct, that is also going to cause the same effect, right? Because if you are not selecting one of the majority element, then this will definitely be in majority because you are not removing it, correct? So you don't need to know the majority element initially, okay? What you need is, what you need is, what is the current element that you have, okay? And what is the count of other elements? So if, if we are uh, here, if, if we, so if, if you are uh, trying to find the majority element in this array, you don't need to solve, you don't need to uh, get the counts of all the elements. What you can do is you can just maintain a variable and you can maintain the count. So initially, when you are at three, you can say that three is your majority element, count is one. When you get another occurrence of the same element, you can just increase the count. Now you get a different element. When you get a different element, you can say that since this element is not same as this majority element, you can remove these two occurrences from the array. So you are not counting it and you are removing, you are changing this count to one. So this means that you have removed one occurrence of three and you have removed one occurrence of four. Then you go to two, again you get an element which is not same as the current majority element. So you will cancel out both of them. So now you are removing this occurrence of two, so you are not counting it and you are also reducing this count from here, okay? Then you go to four and now you see that four is the new element and the current count of majority element is zero. That means if count is zero, there is no element uh, that you have here, right? So now you can change your majority element to four and the count now becomes one, okay? Then you again go to four and you see that this is same as the initial element. So you will now increase the count from one to two. You go to two, you find that this is a different element. You can remove the counts. So if you remove the counts, you are not counting two plus you are decrementing the count of current majority element. Then again, you see that here you have four. So you will increment the count. Again, you get four, you increment the count. The final element 
that you are getting with non zero occurrences can be your majority element okay great if this is clear will this always be the majority element will the final element which we are getting is it always going to be the majority element no not necessary this is not necessary that this element is always going to be the majority element because there can be cases where there is no majority element in the array right this one so in in that case whatever answer you finally get you will have to actually count the occurrences of that in the initial array so here if you get 4 with a count which is greater than 0 you will uh, again you will run a loop over your initial array and you will count the occurrences of this prospect majority element this can be the majority element not sure okay this is a prospect this is the only candidate for a majority element so if you get something here with a non zero count you will just check here and count the occurrences if they are greater than n by 2 then you can say that this is the majority element okay i will i will just repeat the counting part again okay how we are counting so is is everyone clear with the idea of this algo the idea is that whenever you get two distinct elements you remove them okay if you are getting two distinct elements you remove the occurrences of those two distinct elements so if i am getting three and then let's say if i am getting four i will try to remove both of them okay so what we are doing here is we are maintaining a current majority element and we are maintaining a count okay so if if you get three you increase the count so you have let's consider a different example okay let's take an example given by vijay sai which is 3 3 3 4 okay so we will be maintaining a majority element and we will also be maintaining a count okay you get 3 you say that 3 is the current majority element i don't know what is going to be after 3 but 3 will be the majority element count of 3 currently is 1 then you go to 3 again this is same as the initial or the current majority element so you increment the count to 2 okay then you go to 3 again you will increment the count to 3 then you go to 4 and now you get a different number what was the algo what was the initial observation that we made the observation was if you remove two distinct elements the majority element remains the same so if i get two distinct element i will cut them down so i will not count the occurrence of 4 so i am ignoring 4 and simultaneously i am also reducing the count here okay then i get 4 again i am again reducing the count then i am getting a, another different number so i am reducing the count count becomes zero if count becomes zero that means there is no majority element if let's say there was uh, another 3 and okay so in this case basically you are not going to get uh, a non zero count but it might be possible that you can get uh, a non zero count even when you don't have a majority element right so you can have something like 1 2 3 4 <laughs> and then let's say uh 5 5 okay in this case if you run the same algo you will get a non zero count at the end but there is no majority element in this array so after you get a non zero count you will have to check in this whole array you will have to count the number of occurrences of your prospect candidate okay okay rahul is asking will it work for n by 3 problem yes okay uh, so in this case the question was that majority element should be occurring more than n by 2 times now there is a variation of the same question which, which was asked in google where the problem says that your majority element is an element that occurs more than n by 3 times okay now using the same concept you have to solve this problem okay yes i wish this will work okay if you want you can also try to see it mathematically okay you can just uh, you can just take an array of size n let's quickly see how if if it is going to work mathematically or not right so the initial size of the array size initial is equal to n right if you are removing two elements then the size will be n minus 2 
now if if there is a majority element then what should be the uh, what should be the minimum count of that major, majority element in this initial array that has to occur more than n by 2 times right these many times if you have removed two elements if you have removed two elements from this array at least one of them can be the uh, or at most one of them can be the majority element because you are removing two distinct elements right so the count of new majority element in this array is going to be n minus 2 by 2 plus 1 right is it making sense guys so if the initial size of your array was n after removing two elements the size becomes n minus 2 initial count of the majority element was greater than n by 2 so the minimum count would have been n by 2 plus 1 now the count is size by 2 plus 1 right and if you have removed two elements only one of them can be the majority element right so what would be the new count of this element the new count of this element is going to be the initial count minus 1 this is going to be n by 2 okay and if you solve this this is also going to be n by 2 so you can see that this is the count of majority element which should be there in in this array of size n by n minus 2 and this is the count of the initial majority element so you can say that the initial element still remains the majority element now you can do the exact same exercise for uh, n by 3 also and you can check whether the the same algo is going to work or not okay what is the time complexity of this whole algo so we are running a single loop right we are running a single loop and we are just maintaining the current majority element and the count okay so the single loop is going to count you order n time complexity what about this space we are using only two variables right we are not using any array we are not using any hash map we are using only two variables so the space is going to be constant <clears throat> so uh, will you be able to write the code for this could you go through an example of n by 3 example of n by 3 is there in the uh, test that you have received yesterday right you can just go through that problem and examples are listed there you just have to check using this exercise that will the same approach work or not if you are able to do that then you can solve that problem as well okay let's let's solve the next problem <clears throat> now the next problem is also a very very interesting problem uh, yes this the, the algo that we have discussed this is the moore's voting algorithm okay so let's let's discuss the next problem in the next problem you are given a matrix okay this matrix is sorted row wise all the rows of the matrix are sorted and all the columns are also sorted okay what is a matrix matrix is nothing but a two dimensional array okay so all the rows are sorted in ascending order and all the columns are also sorted in ascending order so here we have a matrix which is sorted all so you can just quickly observe all the rows are sorted in ascending order and all the columns are also sorted in ascending order okay you are given a target and you have to search the target in this matrix okay so for example if your target is 37 you have to identify whether the target is present in this in this matrix if it is pre present then what are the coordinates okay so if if the target is 37 37 is present and it is present here right so you will be returning the coordinates of 37 in this matrix okay is the problem clear uh, okay for those uh, for whom the problem is not clear i will quickly Uh, repeat it again you are given a matrix where each row is sorted in ascending order and each column is also sorted in ascending order okay then you are given a target and you have to find and return the coordinates of the target in this matrix the dimensions of matrix is n cross m okay what is the brute force here can i can everyone solve this problem using a brute force algorithm we we simply have to start from here okay then traverse all the rows each and every element check if that is equal to the given target or not right if if you do this what is going to be the time complexity if you are traversing each and every elements how many elements are there this is going to be order n into n right there
there will be one loop which will run from 0 to n then there will be another loop inside that which will run from 0 to n right okay now some of you are saying that you can solve this problem using binary search now uh, for all those who don't know how binary search works you can just skip this part we will be covering binary search in details in the upcoming classes for all those who know how binary search is going to work can you guys quickly think of an approach which uses binary search see all the rows are sorted okay if all the rows are sorted and you have to search an element in sorted rows can you use the fact that the rows are sorted yes so in each and every row you can apply binary search right what is the time complexity of doing binary search on an array of size n if if you are running binary search on an array of size n the time complexity is log n right and if you are doing binary search in all the rows if you are doing binary search in all the rows how many rows are there so in this case we have n rows and the size of each and every row is n right so in our case if we apply binary search on every row if you apply binary search on each and every row what will be the time complexity there are n rows and there are m columns so there are m elements in each row right so this is going to be the time complexity okay cool <clears throat> can we do better okay if, if we want to do it if we want to do better let us try to make some quick observations okay if, if this is the matrix let's draw a matrix here where can we find the smallest element of this matrix can you guys quickly tell me the coordinates of the smallest element present in this matrix <clears throat> the smallest element of this matrix is going to be at 0 comma 0 right this is the smallest because all the rows are sorted all the columns are sorted so this is the smallest of all where can i find the largest element of this matrix the largest element of this matrix is correct it's going to be at the cell n minus 1 comma n minus 1 this last cell right this is going to be the largest of all now if if the target element is smaller than 0 comma 0 or if the target element is larger than this element can i directly say that that element is not going to lie inside this matrix if your target is less than 0 comma 0 or your target is greater than the last element that you have which is present at n minus 1 comma n minus 1 can we say that this target is not present in the matrix yes what if this is inside the range what if the target is inside the range so if we are starting from this point if if the target is greater than 10 and it is less than or equal to 71 and i'm starting my search from this point can the target be present in this row if it is greater than 10 can the target be in, in the first row yes because all the elements of this row are greater than 10 right so target can be 30 it can be 40 target can also be 17 or 15 right so it can also be present in this column as well so if if the target is greater than 10 it can be present anywhere in the matrix right if we are starting the search from here we are unable to make any conclusive decision because all the elements here and all the elements here are following the exact same property which is that they are greater than 10 so this is not allowing us to discard any of the search space correct let us start the search from this block now if the target is smaller than this can i say that the target has equal chances of being present in this row uh, in this column as well as in the last row because all the numbers in this column are smaller than 71 because the column is sorted in ascending order right all the call all the elements of this row are also smaller than 71 so again we don't have any decision that we can take right we cannot discard any part of the search space all the values are still relevant okay let's try to search from this point now can you guys figure out a pattern if i am standing at this point if i am standing at 50 
what can i say about all the elements present in the first row and all the element present in the last column if this row is sorted in ascending order can i say that all the elements of this row are going to be less than 50 similarly all the elements of this column will definitely be greater than 50 is it going to help us make any decision so if if the target is less than 50 can i say that target will never be present in the first column if the target is less than 50 the column is sorted in an ascending order right if the if the target is less than 50 all the elements in this column are definitely going to be greater than 50 so the target will never be present in this column now i am able to make a decision to discard some part of the search space the search space has become smaller right all these values are now irrelevant okay so if the target is less than 50 i can directly move to this cell and i can start comparing from this cell now if the target is greater than 40 can i say that that target will never be present in the remaining part of this row if the target is greater than 40 i know that all these elements are less than 40 because the row is sorted in ascending order right so now these elements become irrelevant for us so i can discard this complete row okay and now i can start my search from this cell which has 45 again i can check whether the target is smaller than 45 or greater than 45 so at every step i am able to make a decision of either discarding one row or discarding a column so let's say that if if the target that we have to find is 26 okay if 26 is the target that we have to find at this step i know that 26 is smaller than 45 and since this column is sorted in ascending order all the elements below 45 are useless right 26 can never be present in this part because 26 is smaller than 45 so i will move my pointer to 35 right now when i am at 35 i know that again 26 is smaller than 35 so all the elements of this column also are useless for us okay so we move to 25 if 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 currently i am standing at 25 i can see that 26 is bigger than 25 if 26 is bigger than 25 all the elements present here are useless for us right so we move down now when we move down we figure out that this element is nothing but the target so we have found the target so in every step we are either able to discard a complete row or we are able to discard a complete column so you will be running a loop oh, you will be starting from the topmost corner right you will be starting your code you will be starting your search from this top right corner and you can say that if this element is equal to the target then you can directly return true or if you can if you are asked to return the coordinates you can do that now if this element at the top right corner here is smaller than the target then what can we say we can say that all these elements are all these elements are <clears throat> if this element is smaller than the target then these are useful but these elements are useless because these all elements will also be smaller than the target right so what can we do in this case we can just switch to the next row so we will be doing i plus plus okay else if if this is greater than the target then what what can we say uh, if if this element is greater than the target then all these elements will also be greater than the target so we can switch the search space or we can switch the column to the previous column right so we can move to the previous column so that will be j minus minus okay <clears throat> and there will be a while here can you guys tell me what should be the condition which should come here when we have to stop all these things when we have to stop the search if we find the target then we are returning so that will obviously break this while loop but what should be the condition uh, what should be the boundary cases for this search we are starting the initial i value 
from where we are starting is zero, right? This is the first row from where we are starting. The initial column value is the last column, which is m minus one. So these are the initials from where we are starting. Now, what should be the restriction? Or what should be the boundary where we can go? This i. So now you can uh, also pay attention to what we are, how we are changing these variables, right? So i is always getting incremented. J is always getting decremented. I is currently at the smallest possible value, which is zero. J is currently at the largest possible value, right? So if you are incrementing I, you have to make sure that you are not going out of this matrix from here, right? So I should always be less than N, okay? And if you are decrementing J, you have to make sure that J does not become less than zero, right? So J should always be greater than or equal to zero. So this is your boundary case till which you have to run this loop. And if you find the target, it's good, return true. If this current element is less than the target, all the elements of the first row will also be less than the target. So ignore them, move to the next row. If this element is greater than the target, then all the elements of this column will also be greater than the target. So ignore them, move to the previous column. Okay. And we search the element. What is the time complexity? Some of you are saying log of m into n. Is it log? What is the time complexity? So to get to the time complexity, focus on what is the maximum number of steps that you are going to take. Right? What is the maximum number of values that i and j can take? i is starting from 0, it can go till n. j is starting from m minus 1, it can go till m. So what is the total number of combinations of these values that, that can be there? In every all, uh, in, in other terms, you can also think in this way that in every step, either you are ignoring one row or you are ignoring one column. There are total n rows, there are total m columns. If in the worst case, if the target that you are finding is present here, you will be ignoring all the rows above this and you will be ignoring all the columns after this, right? So the time complexity is going to be n plus n. What if matrix is not sorted? If the matrix is not sorted, you cannot apply this logic, right? Why not maximum of, of n and m? That is because you can do both of the things, right? If you are moving from this corner to this corner, you will have to take all the n steps in order to move from here to here. And you will also have to take all the m steps in order to move from here to here. This is the worst case that you go down as much as possible and you also go left as much as possible. Okay, so that is n plus n. Element of every row. Uh, okay, Vijan, if you can just try to see some of the example, just try to dry run your approach on, uh, on this matrix itself. You will find that chances of finding your element in every row will be there. So if let's say I am talking about if, if I have to find 30, 30 is smaller than all these numbers, right? So 30 can be present in any of uh, any of the rows. 30 is greater than the first number of all the uh, all the elements in the first column. 30 is less than all the numbers in the last column. So 30 has got a chance of being present in each and every row. So you will have to apply binary search in every row. And if you are applying binary search on in each and every row, then that will be n log m. Pseudocode, we have written the pseudocode, right? This is the pseudocode. Or oh, this is the actual code, not the pseudocode. This is how you are going to initialize your i and j, i from 0, j from, from m minus 1, okay? And I hope you have learned something in today's class. Please do solve the problems and please do subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss any new class update. Okay. Hello everyone. If you want to learn binary search from the scratch, this is the perfect video for you. In this three hour Snyder cut, we will explain you what is binary search, intuition behind binary search, the code and the time complexity. After that, we'll jump into problems. First set of problems given a sorted array apply binary search. Second set of problems. Array is not sorted, but you still have to apply binary search. 
third set of problems nothing is given you have to build your own such space and then apply binary search finally under which scenarios we can apply binary search all these things will be covered in this 3 hour schneider cut so watch learn have fun thank you so hello everyone so uh, the topic for today is going to be searching right so we are going to look at different searching algorithms we will start with linear search uh, and then we will move on to binary search we will look at ternary search and we will solve some problems related to binary search okay now as always after the class we will have an assignment for you guys so after every class you are given an assignment uh, so that you can actually apply what you have learned in the class and solve problems so that you can solidify the concepts the link for the problem set will be in the video description apart from that there will also be a link for a chat forum so that you can talk to your peers and uh, discuss any issues that you face while solving problems so that is for today uh, there is one more announcement that i would like to make uh, which is that a lot of students come to us and they say that hey i need help with interviewing right so they tell us that they somehow get nervous during interviews and uh, a lot of students say that when i am doing competitive coding online i am able to solve problems but when i am in a face to face interview i somehow get nervous or i am not sure what the correct approach or what correct approach should i take uh, while solving the problem in an interview so to, to handle that we have organized a mock interview for you guys today right so suppose that you wanted to see how an icpc world finalist right someone who is very strong at data structures and algorithms how such a person would behave would approach a problem in a google interview all right without further ado let us dive into today's lecture so let me just share my screen all right i hope that this is visible to everyone can someone just confirm this perfect all right let's begin so i assume that most of you would be familiar with some sort of searching right suppose that you have a collection suppose that you have a haystack and you are looking for something in this haystack right suppose a needle then how do you usually search well the way we usually search is we pick each item one by one pick each item one by one one by one and we inspect it right we see if this is the correct item if this is the item that we are looking for now this can be very very time consuming right so just to prove this point let us play a very simple game okay so i want you all to play this game so i have a number in my mind right and i am telling you that the number is between 0 to 1000 okay now what you are supposed to do is you are supposed to guess what the number in my mind is i am not telling you the number right away so you are supposed to make guesses between 0 and 1000 uh, so if you could please start spamming in the chat just just uh, just tell me your guesses in the chat and uh, whenever i see the number that i am guessing that that is in my mind i'll, I'll let you guys know. all right so can you guys please start i have a number between 0 to 1000 in my mind and you have to guess that number so start placing in the chat what do you think the number is you have no other information 786 not really that is not what i had in my mind oh uh, okay i got 52 30 91 900 100 99 no none of those a lot of zeros some 500 some 304 30666 when do i 762 none of these 50 no 3 4 4 545 hmm none of these none of these please give some hint so tushar has a very important thing over here tushar says if you could give us something then we will be able to approach that uh, particular sol particular solution much faster perhaps right so we see that if you have no information right if you have no information 
information about how to search, then your best chance is to randomly check, randomly guess, right? Or if you don't want to randomly guess, your best chance is to basically check each possibility. Possibility, right? So it could happen that first you say that, okay, you are guessing the number one, then you move on to number two, then you move on to number three, and you keep doing that, you keep making guesses, till I say that, yes, your guess is correct, right? So this is an example of something called linear search. Why linear? Why linear? Because you are going over each item, item linearly, right? Basically, you're going over each item once. So this is, this is called linear search. And let us suppose that you have n elements, that you have n elements and you're looking for some value you're looking for some key in this set of n elements then how much time how much time will linear search take us so what is the time complexity of linear search it is yes it is order of n time right and while we are at it let us also quickly discuss the space complexity so how much space does it take to do a linear search well this is just order of one because we don't really have to store a lot of memory, we can just use a couple of temporary variables and perform the linear search, all right? So I assume that everyone is familiar with this linear search. So linear search is very inefficient. Now the question comes, can we search faster? Can we search faster, right? What do you think the answer to this is? So this is the question. Now I'm asking you, what do you think the answer will be? Now, as most things in life, the answer is it depends, right? It depends. Well, it depends on what? It depends on is there some pattern, some pattern in the data that we can exploit, that we can exploit, right? If we have some pattern in the data that we can exploit, then perhaps we could search faster. Does that make sense? For example, let us play this game once again. Right? Let us play this game once again. Uh, I am going to guess, I'm going to have a number from zero to 1000 in my mind. And you are supposed to guess that number once again. However, this time, whenever you make a guess, I'm going to tell you if your guess is too high or if your guess is too low. All right, cool. So let us begin once again. I have a number in my mind. And could you start guessing please? So, Mudasir says two. Well, two is too low. Then Mudasir has guessed 34. 34 is too low, once again. Then the next guess is 123. It is too low. The next guess is 233. That is too high. Sahil says 500. That is too high. All right, keep them coming, keep the guesses coming. The next guess is 150, this is too high. Then, what is your next guess going to be? So 188, no, 188 is still too high. 200 is still too high. 10 is way too low. Yes, so uh, 130, 130 is too low and uh, then what do we have? All right, so 130 is too low. Can you, can you make more guesses now? 143, right? Someone guessed 143 and that is exactly the value that I was thinking of, right? This was my guess, this is correct. All right, so we see it took us some time, right? It took us some time. It was not that we were able to guess the answer immediately. However, we were able to hone in on the answer, right? So you have, you have, you, you know of homing missiles, right? You, the homing missile doesn't really know where the target is, but as it moves forward, it will get closer and closer to the target. 
right that is what we were able to we were able to home in right home in on the answer why were we able to do that because there was some pattern in the data that we could exploit the pattern was that we were able to figure out whether our guess was too low or whether our guess was too high right now a lot of you think a lot of students think they have this misconception that some sort of a binary search right binary search can only be applied when the data is sorted and that is not the case the data has the data need not be perfectly sorted for you to be able to apply binary search right so what we are looking for in the data is we are looking for some pattern or some sort of ordering okay so let us define some nomenclature over here let us define some theoretical nomenclature over here so that we can make concrete progress over what binary search is all right so suppose that you have some search space that you have some search space and let us represent the search space like this in the search space there is a this search space is basically a set of possibilities of possible answers right so there's there's one answer possible over here so this is another possible answer this is another possible answer another possible answer perhaps another possible answer and so what binary search says is that when you make a guess let us suppose that you made this as the guess when you make a guess if you are able to eliminate if you are able to eliminate a large fraction a large fraction of your search space search space then you can search efficiently if this is the case then you can search efficiently right let's look let's see how so let us look at the previous game that we played in the previous game whenever you came up with an answer right let us say that you came up with an answer that hey the guess is 200 then all i told you was whether the guess was correct or not right all i told you was whether the guess was correct or not and that basically allowed you to eliminate this possibility itself right so you made a guess 200 i told you it is not correct so you can eliminate this possibility can you eliminate any other number can you eliminate any other number did you get information in about any other number you did not right on the other hand in the second version of the game in the second version of the game suppose you guess 200 and i told you that it was too high then you could have eliminated every number you could have eliminated all these numbers that were greater than 200 and your search space would only remain with the numbers that are less than 200 right does that make sense yes so this is something that we will try to exploit in binary search so basically binary search binary search can be applied whenever you can you can remove right? remove or prune a large chunk chunk of your data of your search space search space with every guess all right cool so let us look at a more concrete example of this so mostly when we are talking about search engines, the first thing that would come to our mind is that we have an array right we have an array suppose we have an array of integers right this array has multiple values let us say that the size of this array of size n right? the size of this array is n and we are supposed to search for a particular value in there so given an array given an array what type of things are we able to binary search for what type of things are we able to binary search for so whenever we try to binary search we try to come up with a proposition does everyone understand what a proposition is yes a proposition is something that takes two values any of two values right a proposition can either be true or it can be false right a proposition can either be true or it can be false now if you can come up with a proposition if you can come up with a proposition such that your array starts looking something like this that for this particular element the proposition is true for this element the proposition is true for this element the proposition is true and so on at some point the proposition starts becoming false right if you are able to come up with a proposition that can make your array look like this 
then you are able to perform binary search on this array. And what will that binary search give you? That binary search will give you this boundary point. That binary search will give you this point where the proposition slips. All right, is that clear? So we will look at a little more concrete examples of these. We will look at a little more concrete examples of these. Cool. So let us once again go back to this game of guessing the number. Let us suppose that I gave you an array from 0, 1, 2, all the way till 1000. Right? All the way till 1000. And I had a guess. Let us say my guess was this number G. The correct, the correct answer was this number G. Now, what, the, what is my proposition over here? What is my proposition over here? So what is the proposition that makes sure that everything to the left of G is true and everything to the right of G is false? Can someone tell me that? So what proposition should I make so that everything, every number to the left of G should result in false while every number to the right of G should return in true? Exactly. So the proposition can be as simple as is a of i less than g, right? Is a of i less than equal to g, right? What happens in that case? So if g is my guess, if g is my guess over here, then every value to the left of it, yes, it is less than or equal to g. So all these values will be true. All these values will be true. On the other hand, on the right hand side, all these values will be false because they will be if the array is sorted, all these values will be false because they will be larger than G. So if, if I'm able to come up with this proposition, then binary search will allow me to find this junction. It will allow me to find this point where the true flips from true to false. Is that clear? All right. And now, the, now we have basically, now we have basically come up with the final definition of binary search. Right? Binary search does not require you to have a sorted array. Right? That is a misconception that you need to have a sorted array, array to perform binary search. What you really need is you need this proposition. If for any search space you can come up with such a proposition, then you can apply binary search on that search space, right? irrespective of whether that search space is uh, sorted or not. All right. Perfect. So let us let us dive into some more uh, concrete things. And uh, let us try to look at the implementation of binary search, right? So once again, suppose that we have been given an array, right, of size n. And this array is of integers, of integers, right? And we are also given a key, suppose k, that we are looking for, that we are looking for. And for now, let us suppose that the array is sorted in ascending order, right? Then how, then what we have to do is we have to search the element. We have to find, find the index, index of K in this array, if it exists, right? If it exists in the array, then we are supposed to find the index and return the index. Otherwise, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to return the index. Index where k should be inserted. K should be inserted. Inserted in the array. Is that clear? Yes, is that clear? So once again, suppose that we have an array that looks like this. 0, 3, 7, 12, 15, 16, 20. Right? And I give you the key, let us suppose 12. Right? So in this case, what are you supposed to return? So let me give the index as well. This is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So in this case, what are we supposed to return? If this is the array and this is the key, then what value will we return over here? The answer we are supposed to return over here is the index 3, right? Because 12 is at the index 3, right? On the other hand, if I ask you to find the value, let us say k equals to 17, right? If I ask you to find, if I ask you to find the value k equals to 17, then what are you supposed to return? 
So there are multiple variants, right? In, in some cases, I might ask you to return minus one because 17 is not present in this array. I might ask you to return minus one, but that is not what we are looking for over here. We are saying that if the value is not present in the array, then tell me the index where that value should be inserted. Right? So if 17 was inserted in this array, then what value, what index should it be inserted at? Should it be inserted at this location? Should it be inserted at this location? No, it should not be, right? Because 16 is less than 17. It should be inserted at 20's position and 20 should be shifted to the right. Yes, 17. If 17 was inserted, 17 would come in the sixth position and 20 will be moved to the right. Right. So if the search key is 17, then you are supposed to give me back the answer index equals to six. Is that clear? Right. So this is the classic, this is the classic problem of binary search. We have been given an array. We have been given we have been given an array which is sorted, and we have been given a key, and we have to search this key within the array. Right? Now let us first look at the implementation of how we would do this binary search, and then we will discuss the time complexity, right, and the corresponding analysis. All right. So let us start with this thing. So suppose that we have this function end binary search. Right? And in this, we are receiving an, a vector. Right? We are receiving a vector. So we can say that, okay, we have uh, an vector AR, vector of int AR. Right? Apart from that, we also have the key. So we have an int. So this is not a semicolon, this is a comma. We have an int key. All right. This is the function that we are going to write. Yes, uh, Shukrata, yes, in this case, we are accepting a sorted array. All right, we will come to we will come to binary searching over non-sorted arrays in something. We are starting with the most simple thing that the array is sorted. All right, cool. So how would we write this particular piece of code? So when binary searching, when binary searching, there are certain things that we would like to identify. There are certain things that we would like to identify. If we are going to search, if we are going to search, then the first thing that we need to identify is our search space. Right is our search space. Now, if we have an array, if we have an array, then what do you think the search space is going to be? If we have an array, then what is the search space? Well, the search space is all the possible different indexes in the array, right? The value could be at index zero, the value could be at index one and so on till the last index. So the search space is the indices of the array. Well, what is the minimum value of that source space and what is the maximum value of that source space? So can we somehow bound, so can we somehow draw a boundary? Can we draw a boundary around that source space? Yes, right? So in this case, the boundary is from zero all the way till n minus one, where n is the length of my array. Is that clear? All right. So. When I'm defining the boundary, I will I will encapsulate, I will basically wrap my search space around this uh, within this boundary. So I will say that okay, let us suppose that we have some low, right? And that is the minimum possible value in my search space. And I also have some high. And that is the maximum possible value in my search space. And I can write over here that n is perhaps n equals to ar dot size all right cool now that we have the boundary now that we have the boundary we are supposed to perform the binary search okay so there are this was the first step of binary search the first step of binary search was to to bound or to establish establish the boundary of the search space Right. The second thing, once you have established the boundary, the second thing is to make a guess. To make a guess. So how do we make a guess? Let us suppose that we have some search space and we want to make a guess. What guess do you think we should make? What guess do you think we should make? So we can make any guess, right? We can make any guess. However, we should try to make a guess that allows us to eliminate a very, very large chunk of the search space, right? Does that make sense? So if I have this array, 
if I have this array and this is sorted, right? And this is my low, this is my low, and this is my high, right? If I make this guess, if I make a guess over here, then what will I be able to eliminate? What will I be able to eliminate? I will either be able to eliminate this part or I will be able to eliminate this part. Yes, I will either be able to eliminate this left half if my guess was too high, right? Or I will be able to eliminate this right half entirely if my guess was too low. Now, what is these values? What are these values over here? What are these values over here? Let us say that this is x, then this will be n minus x, right? Now the question is, in the worst case, in the worst case, worst case, right? If I'm very, very unlucky, then my guess will be on this side, right? I will be able to eliminate a smaller value. I will not be lucky. I will not be able to eliminate a very large value, right? So I should try, I should try to make it so that, I should try to make it so that X is as large as possible, right? Both X and N minus X are as large as possible, right? So that, so that no matter whether I'm lucky or not, I'm able to eliminate a large chunk of my search space, right? So what, what guess should we make over here? We should perhaps guess the middle element. We should perhaps be guessing the middle element. Is that clear? Right? So this is the second thing. Once we have, once we have decided the search space, once we have the low and the high, now we are supposed to find a mid. Right? So we will guess a mid. So we will say int mid equals to low plus high by two. Right? And notice that this is integer division. Right? This is integer division. All right, cool. So is, is this part here? Is this part here that we calculate the mid? All right. Once we have the mid, once we have the mid, then what do we do? Once we have the mid, then what do we do? The third step is to check the proposition. Check the proposition. Proposition and prune, right? And prune our search space. Right? We have to check the proposition and prune our search space. Now, the proposition can the proposition can be either true or false. Right? The proposition can be either true or false. However, in most of the cases, we can have three values, right? We can have three values. Either my guess is too high or my guess is too low or my guess is exactly correct, right? So let us, let us look in this case. Let us look at that in this case. So if, so what possibilities can I have over here? Right? What possibilities can I have over here? If AR of mid, if AR of mid is less than the value I'm looking for, is less than the key, if AR of mid is less than the key, then what does that mean? Is my guess too high or is my guess too low? If the location that I'm looking at, I'm looking at the location mid. If the element at that location was less than the key, then is my guess, is my guess too high or is my guess too low? Well, the element was less than the element I was looking for. So I am sure that since the array is sorted, since the array is sorted, any value, any value that is at AR of let's say zero or AR of mid minus one, right? Mid minus one, all these different values are going to be less than the key as well because the array is sorted. So my guess was too low, right? My guess was too low. So what should we do? We should adjust something, right? We should adjust the search space. How should we adjust the search space? We can say that low equals to mid plus one, right? Mid plus one. Right? So basically earlier, this was the search space. This was low and this was high, right? I made the guess at mid. I made the guess at mid and I found out that this guess was too low, right? This guess was too low. So what should I do? I should, I should shift this low. I should shift this low to the element just right of it, right? So this element should now be low. And basically by doing that, I am eliminating all these different possibilities, right? I am eliminating all these different possibilities. Is that clear? 
so we should move up the loan is that clear we should increase the loan all right so that is one case so what other cases can we have what other cases can we have else if else if ar of mid was greater than key right if ar of mid was greater than the value i am looking for then what happens when my guess is too high and by the same argument now i need to decrease the high right i now i need to say high equals to mid minus 1 right otherwise if even that is not the case then what possibility remains if it is neither too high if if it is neither too high nor too low then what possibility remains then it must be exactly correct right else else my guess was exactly right right i i guess the perfect answer so in that case i can just return i can just return the index right because i i looked at this particular index ar of mid i looked at this particular index and i found a value that was exactly equal to the key right it was neither greater than key it was not less than key so it must be exactly equal to the key so i can just return this index because this is the index that i am looking for is that clear yes perfect now let us now let us look at the code that we have and let us see if there is something missing over here right let us see if there is something missing over here so once again in the code what we are doing is we are saying let us initialize a search space initialize space right then we make a guess so this is our guess and based on the guess we adjust the search space so will we be able to after one adjustment after one adjustment will we be able to reach the answer will we be able to reach the answer after just one adjustment no right we have to continuously adjust our guess right so we have to do this entire thing again and again we have to repeat this right we have to repeat this entire thing so how should we repeat this entire thing let us put it inside a loop let us put it inside a loop so let me add some space over here and let me say right let me say i will i will loop let us say i loop forever right while some condition so i i don't really know what this condition is but as long as this condition is true i will keep looping right i will keep looping till this condition is true is that clear right so we could have done several things over here we could have called this function recursively as well right based on the adjusted guess we could have called this function recursively as well but recursion will have a lot of different issues with itself so it will it will use a lot of memory because it will use the recursion stack so let us not do that let us go with the iterative approach right so once we have made a guess once we have made a guess and we check the guess after we check the guess we will adjust our we will adjust our search space right now once we have adjusted the search space what what do we have to do again we have to make the guess again right we have to make the guess again and again but when till when till what time should we continue this till what time should we continue this should we continue this forever and ever should we continue this forever and ever no we should only continue this as long as our search space search space has elements in it right if our search space has elements in it so basically if our search space is empty if our search space is empty then it does not make sense to keep looking inside that search space right if our search space is empty already then it does not make sense to keep looking inside that search space so when will our search space be empty right when will our search space be empty let us suppose that this is my array let us suppose that this is my array this is the low and this is the high at what point would i say for what values of low and high would i say that my search space that this particular area this particular range over here this is empty when will i say that what happens when low equals to high when low and high are the same what happens when low and high are the same well then my search space is not empty then my search space has one element which is a of which is a of low right if low equals to high then my search space has one element which is a of low so when my search when will my search space be empty when low will be greater than high yes as soon as this happens as soon as this is my low 
and this is my high, right? Then I'm saying that the search space is everything that starts from low and goes till high. Well, it cannot go till high, right? My search space is empty now. Is that clear? So I am supposed to continue this loop till my search space is not empty, right? So what will be the opposite condition over here? What will be the opposite condition over here? So if this tells me that the search space is empty, then how do I check if the search space is not empty? I will check it by saying while low is less than or equal to high. Is that clear? Yes. Right. And this is very important, right? If you miss this equal to, if you miss this equal to, you might, you might get an incorrect answer, right? Or if you, if you do something else, you might run into an infinite loop. So it is very, it is very crucial that we have this condition, right? Because this condition tells us when to terminate. It tells us when our source space is empty. Okay. And I mean, a lot of the times people are worried that, okay, I don't really know how to, how to determine what condition should go over here. So here's the trick once again. To determine what condition should go over here, you have to ask yourself, when will my search space be empty? When will my space be empty? Right? And based on that, you will be able to come up with a condition. All right. Cool. So this is basically the code of binary search. This is basically the code of binary search. We started with, we started with a search space repeatedly while the search space was not empty. We made a guess and we adjusted that guess. Right? If our guess was perfect, we simply return that guess. We simply return that case. But what if, what if we did not find that element? What will happen then? What if we did not find that element at all? What will happen then? Well, then we'll keep on looping. We will keep on looping till the point our search space becomes empty. Right? Till the point our search space becomes empty. So what will happen is we will not be able to return over here. We will not be able to return over here. However, we will come out of this while loop. Right? So we will come out of this while loop. We will be over here at this point. And what values of low and high will we have? We will have a value such that low will be equal to high plus one. Right? That is when our search ends. Right? And what is this location? Can you tell me what this location is? This location is exactly the location where I should insert this element. If I were to insert this element, this is exactly the location where I should insert this element. So when I am at this point, just give me a second. When I am at this point, when I am at this point, I know two things. I know two things. The first thing I know is that low is the index, the, is the index where I should insert it, where I should insert, insert key. If I was going to insert it, then low is the location where I should insert it. Second thing I know is key was not found in my array. Key was not present, present in my array. Right? Is that clear? Now, once again, if we were to suppose, if we were to simply find the index of the, uh, if we were supposed to find the index of the key and return minus one, if the key was not present, then over here we will return minus one. Right? Then over here we will return minus one. Right? On the other hand, more practically, whenever you see, you see a library implementation, we don't really usually return minus one. Instead, we return the index where I should have inserted the key. Right? So over here we can also return the low return the low value, right? Because this is the location where I should have inserted the key. Is that clear guys? Yes. Now one common question is, one common question is if you are returning minus one, if you are returning minus one, then your caller knows, then your caller knows that the element was not present, right? Because hey, index cannot be minus one. Index of a particular value in an array cannot be minus one. Indexes go, indexes are start start from zero, right? So, in this case, my caller knows that the element was not present. But what if I return low? What if I instead of returning minus one, what if I return low? How will the caller find out if the element was present or not? Yes, the caller has to be able to make that distinction whether the element was present or not. So, how will the caller get to do that? Well, the caller can check. The caller can simply check. So it will say that, okay, index equals to binary search, the array and the key, right? And the person can check, the caller can check if AR of index equals to equals to key, right? 
if ar of index equals to equals to key then then we found the key right then we found key found key at index right otherwise otherwise it means that we did not find the key but this index is the location at which we are going to insert it if we were to insert it. so we can say did not find did not find the key but if we were to insert it it should be inserted inserted at index is that clear so the caller will have to make this additional check is that clear guys yes okay so rohit has a question over here rohit says what should be returned what should be returned if key is less than ar of 0 right that's a very good question so suppose that we have this array suppose that we have this array this is the index 0 this is the index 1 and so on right let us say this this value is 10 this value is 11 this value is 12 and let us say my key was 9 right or let us say my key was 5 so first of all is my key in the array is my key in the array no it is not in the array right not present not present if I were to insert this value, where should this key go? If I were to insert this value in the array, where should this key go? Can the key go at location minus 1? No, right? There is no index minus 1 in the array. So where should this key go? This key should go at index 0. The 5 should be inserted over here and everything that is, everything in the array should be shifted to the right. It shifted 1 to the right. Does that make sense? So over here, a binary search, when I search for key equals to 5, my binary search should return the value 0, right? It should return the index 0. And that is exactly what our code will do. Alright, that is exactly what our code will do. Is that clear? Okay. So, let us move on. So, I hope that the, that the code and the implementation of binary search is clear to everyone. Now, let us look at some, let, let us look at some improvements that we can make on our code. So one of the most important improvements is that we never try to calculate. We never try to calculate the mid like this, right? And you might have seen this a lot of times. You might have seen this a lot of times. People do the following. People instead of saying, instead of saying int mid equals to low plus high by two, high by two, right? they do something else. They say int mid equals to low plus high minus low plus uh, high minus low by 2 right so can someone tell me the difference between these two can someone tell me the difference between these two why do why do some people do it this way why do some people do it this way well let us try to look at the mathematics right let us try to look at it mathematically so if i have low plus high by 2 right this is this is one thing on the other hand, I can have low plus high minus low by 2. And let us see that if there is a difference between these two. Let us see if there is a difference between these two. So what I can do is I can take I can take the denominator 2 common over here. I can take the denominator 2 common over here. So what will happen? The numerator, this will become 2L plus H minus L. Right? This will become 2L plus H minus L. What is that? That is simply, that is simply, so 1L will cancel out. This will simply be low plus H. Right, this will simply be low plus h. So we see that the left hand side and the right hand side are equivalent. Right, from, from a mathematical point of view, they are equivalent. So what really gives? Why do why do people do this? This is more complicated, right? The reason why people do this is even though they are mathematically equivalent, when we are dealing with computers, we can run into an overflow. Right? When we are doing addition, when we are doing addition, we can run into an overflow. For example, let us suppose that our integer, that our integer can only store, so the large, let's suppose that the largest value our integer can store is let us say 10 to the power 9, right? let's say 1 billion. Okay? Let us say that our low is uh, 5 into 10 to the power 8. Okay? So our low is 500,000. Let us say that our high is 8 into 10 to the power 8, right? which is 800,000. If I have something like this, if I have something like this, what will happen when I try to calculate the mid? What will happen when I try to calculate the mid? I will be doing 5 
into 10 to the power 8 plus 8 into 10 to the power 8, right? This will be low plus high and then I will divide it by 2. Yes, then I will divide it by 2. But what will happen over here? When I try to add these values, when I try to add these values, this will be 13 times 10 to the power 8, right? And we just saw that 13 into 10 to the power 8, this cannot fit in my integer. My integer can only be up till 10 to the power 9. This is, this is greater than 10 to the power 9, right? This is what? This is 1.3 times 10 to the power 9. Right, so this value over here, this will overflow. This will overflow. And the value that I will get over here will be garbage. Right? It will give me a wrong answer. And then I divide the wrong answer by 2. I will, I will eventually get a wrong value of mid. Is that clear? Yes. On the other hand, if I do it the other way, if I do it the other way, if I say low plus high minus low by 2, Right? If I do it this way, then what happens? Then this will be 5 into 10 to the power 8 plus 8 into 10 to the power 8 minus 5 into 10 to the power 8 by 2. Right? And is this operation going to overflow? Is this operation going to overflow? No, I'm subtracting things. Right? I'm subtracting things. The, the answer over here will be less. Right? The answer over here will be less than this value. Yes. So what do I get over here? I get 5 into 10 to the power 8 plus 3 into 10 to the power 8 by 2 okay? and then I can suppose oh, then this will give me the correct answer 6.5 into 10 to the power 8 is that here this will not overflow this will not overflow whereas this approach will overflow is that here this approach will overflow all right so Amit over here says that hey we can just use a different data type right? if we are dealing with an integer maybe we can switch to a long data type Right? But I mean, what if you were using a log? Right? I mean, the problem is, what if you were using a log? What would you do then? So, in general, it is a good idea to implement implement the mid calculation uh, via this particular approach. Okay. All right. So that is the improvement we are going to make over here very quickly. We are going to go to our, our code of binary search. We are going to remove this, and we are going to improve it. We are going to say int mid equals to low plus high minus low by 2. All right. Perfect. Okay. I hope that everything is clear till now. Now let us try to, now let us try to analyze the time complexity of binary search. All right. Let us try to analyze the time complexity of binary search. Time complexity. All right. So how do we talk about the time complexity of binary search? So what is really happening is initially I have the search space of size n. Right. Initially I have the search space of size n, size n and I guess the midpoint. I guess the midpoint right, as my guess. Right? If my guess is too low, if my guess is too low, then I'm able to remove these elements. Right? I am able to remove these elements. How many elements was I able to remove? So if this is 0, this is mid and this is n, then after one guess, if my guess was too low, then how many elements was I able to remove? I was able to remove n plus 1 by 2 elements. Right? Yes or no? On the other hand, if my guess was too small, then I would be able to remove all these different elements. Everything from mid all the way till n, n minus 1. Right? Even then, I, will, I was able to remove n plus 1 by 2 elements. Right? I was able to remove n plus 1 by 2 elements. So what really happens is, every time I make a guess, I am reducing the search space by half. Right? I am halving. Halving the search space, space with every guess. Every guess. Right. So suppose we started with this guess n. Right? We started with the search space of s of n. After one guess, I will have a search space of n by 2. After one more guess, I will have a search space of n by 4. One more guess, I will have a search space of n by 8. Right? And when will I end? So finally, the search space will reduce down. The search space will reduce down to just one element. Right? The search space will reduce down to just one element. Is that clear? So the question is, how many guesses did it take? 
So it took me one guess over here, it took me one guess over here, one guess over here, one guess over here, and so on and so forth. So how many guesses, how many guesses did it take? Right, how many guesses did it take? So no, guys, it did not take me n plus n by 2 plus n by 4 all the way till 1. No, this is not how many guesses I got. Right? This is incorrect. So remember that when we are moving from this search space to this search space, I am making one guess. I am not making n guesses over here. Right? I made just one guess and I was able to reduce my search space from n to n by 2. Right? So basically, at the 0th guess, when I have not made any guess, my search space is of size n. After first guess, right? After first guess, my search space is of size n by 2 to the power 1. After second guess, my search space is of size n by 2 to the power 2. After the ith guess, my search space will be of the size n by 2 to the power i. Right? Now the question is: at what value of k, at what value of k will this thing become equal to 1? At what value of k will my search space reduce to one single element? And that is the question that we are asking ourselves. So this is the equation that we get, right? So at the kth, at the kth guess, our search space will be this, and we want the search space to have just one element. So can we find the value of k from here? Can we find the value of k from here? So what can we say? This implies that n equals to two to the power k, which implies that I can take log on both sides. Right? I can take log base two on both sides log base 2 of 2 to the power k, right? which implies that k equals to log base 2 of n. Is that clear? Yes, so I am, I am taking order of log n guesses. I am making order of log n guesses. Right? And that is the complexity, that is the time complexity, complexity of binary search. Is that clear? Yes? Is that clear guys? So basically, we started with an array of size n. Then after first guess, we were able to reduce it to half the size. Then after the second guess, we were able to reduce it to one fourth the size. And so on and so forth. So how many guesses will we take to reduce it to size one? Well, it will take us log base Two of n guesses, right? The depth of this tree, the depth of this is log base two of n. Is that clear? Right. Okay. What about the space complexity? What about the space complexity? So let us go to the code. To analyze the space complexity, let us go back to our code and let us see what variables we are using. Right? So this is this is our code. Let us see what variables we are using. So we are declaring a variable over here n. We are declaring a low. We are declaring a high, and we are declaring a mid. Right? All of these, all of these take constant space. They are just integers. So overall, our space is just constant. Right? We are not allocating any space that is dependent on the input. We are just allocating a constant space. Right? Notice that this is this vector. We are not allocating this. This is given to us already. Given to us. Since we are not changing this array at all. We are not changing this array at all. So we don't have to allocate the space for the array. Alright? The array is given to us. So the space complexity of binary search is going to be. The space complexity of binary search is going to be simply order of one. Alright, constant space. Is that clear, guys? Perfect, perfect, perfect. Now let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a fun question over here. So this is called binary search. Right? This is called binary search. Binary search. Why is it called binary search? Because we are splitting into two parts. Two parts with every guess. Right? And we saw that when we do binary search, when we do binary search, our complexity turns out to be log base 2 of n. Our complexity turns out to be log base 2 of n. What if instead of binary search, what if I try to come up with something like ternary search? What if I try to come up with something like ternary search? 
So first of all, how would donor research even work? Right? How would donor research even work? If I have this particular array, then now I have to guess two values. I have to get mid one, and I have to get mid two. Right? This is my low. This is my high. In donor research, what I can do is I can make two guesses. Right? I can make two guesses. I can say mid one equals to low plus high minus low by three. Right? And I can say mid two equals to low plus two times high minus low by three. Yes or no? Can I do that? And then I can compare. Right? Then I can compare. So I can compare AR of mid one with my key. Right? I can compare AR of mid two with my key. Right? And what will I get? What will I get? Either Either my key will lie in this area, or my key will lie in this area, or my key will lie in this area. Yes, that is that is the that is all the possibilities, right? My key cannot lie in both these areas at the same time. Right? My key cannot lie in both these areas at the same time. Does that make sense? So after one guess, after one guess, we were able to reduce our search space by one to one third. Right? From n, we could go to n by three. Right, we could eliminate a larger chunk of our search space. Does that make sense? This is called ternary search. This is called ternary search. And in general, you can extend this idea. You can extend this idea. You can define something called a query search. You can define something called a query search. And in query search, what you will do is you will calculate mid one, mid two, all the way till mid k minus one. Right. And then we'll compare with all of them. That will allow us to, in one guess, it will allow us to go from n all the way till n by k. Right? Does that make sense? Yes, ternary means three divisions. Binary means two divisions. Kary means k divisions. Alright? Is that clear? Example of ternary search? Well, the example is very simple, right? We given an array, given an array. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make two guesses. Right? Instead of making one guess at any point, I'm going to make two guesses. And based on these two guesses, I'm going to decide whether I should be looking over here or I should be looking over here or I should be looking over here. Right? Going back to our original question, when we were supposed to guess between 0 and 1000. Right? Instead of instead of you giving me a guess like 500, you could have given me two guesses at the same time. You could have given me 333 and 666. Right? And then I could have told you that, okay, it is less than 333 or it is between this or it is above this. Does that make sense? Yes. Does that make sense? Right. So the time complexity of ternary search, ternary search, it seems that the time complexity of ternary search will be order of log base 3 of n. Right. Because we are dividing by 3 every time. Similarly, the time complexity of k research would be order of log base k of n. Yes. Now, which is greater? Which do you think is greater? Is log base 2 of n more or is log base 3 of n more or is log base k of n more? Right? For some large value of k, which value is more? Which value is smaller? Right? So, which value is larger? Which value is smaller? Well, if we divide by 2, if we divide by 2, then it takes us certain number of steps to reach 1. If we divide by 3, then it will take us lesser steps to reach 1. Right? If we divide by 3, then it will take us lesser, lesser steps to reach 1. So log base 2 is greater than log base 3n, which is greater than log base kn. Right? So this it seems like k research, k research should be the fastest. Should be the fastest. Right? So why do people still use binary search? Why do people still use binary search? Why don't we always have k research? k research seems to be very fast, right? And it seems that I can make it as fast as I want, right? I can just increase the value of k to make it as fast as I want. Yes or no? Yes? Well, let us see what is the fastest value I can have. So maybe when k equals to n, when k equals to n, I will get log base n of n Right, which is simply one. So I will be able to find the answer 
find the answer in just one guess. That is amazing. Right? I will be able to find the answer in just one guess. That, that, that's very, very weird, right? I was able to find the answer. I was able to search the element in the array in just one guess. If k equals to n. Is that correct? Is that correct? Yes, but there's a catch, there's a catch over here. Right? Now what, we, what really happened was we had this array and we made every element. We made every element as a guess. Right? We made every single element as a guess. And then we check if our guess is between over here or 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 over here, right? In one guess itself, in one guess itself, we made n, we chose n different values and different midpoints, right? n minus one different midpoints. So are we really, are we really doing an efficient search over here? Are we really doing an efficient search over here? No, this has reduced to the linear search, right? This has reduced to linear search. So it turns out that when k equals to n, we were expecting it to take just one guess. It did take just one guess, but inside that single guess, inside that single guess, we were doing a linear search, right? So is, this is the worst thing that we can do. Does that make sense? k equals to n is the worst thing that we can do. So what, what really gives? We, we see that our intuition, intuition does not equal our math over here, right? Math says, Math says that this should be faster, but intuition says that this should be slower. So what, what really gives over here? Right? What really gives over here? Well, there's a catch. There's a catch, right? There's a catch in the fact that this is bigger complexity. Right? There's a hidden constant factor. There's a hidden constant factor. Let us look at the exact complexity of searching. Right? Let us look at the exact complexity of KRE research. If I'm doing binary search, if I'm doing binary search, then I have one guess, right? I have one midpoint. Yes, I have one midpoint. Do you agree? And what check am I making? I'm comparing. I'm comparing A of mid with K, right? How many comparisons is this? How many comparisons is this? This is one comparison. This is one comparison, right? So my complexity, my actual complexity is one times log base two of n. Right? This is in the case of binary search. On the other hand, when I have ternary search, when I have ternary search, I will guess two midpoints. Right? I will be guessing two midpoints. And then what comparisons do I have to make? I have to compare A of mid one with K. I have to compare A of mid two with K. Do you agree? Yes, I have to compare A of mid one with K and I have to compare A of mid two with K. So how many comparisons is that? This is in fact two comparisons, right? Now you see the hidden cost. As we increase the value of K, as we increase the value of K, the number of comparisons for each guess increase. Does that make sense? Yes, guys. So for, for, for ternary source, our complexity is two times log base three of n. Right? This is for ternary search. Ternary search. And in general, for k research, for k research, our complexity will be log base k of n. But for every guess, we will have to make k minus one comparisons. Right? We'll have to make k minus one comparisons. Now, now let us ask this question again. What do you think is larger? Right? What do you think is larger? Is log base two of n times one larger? Or is two times log base 3 of n larger or is k minus 1 times log base k of n larger? Right? Which one of these is larger? Well, now we know, now we know that actually this is the reverse, the other way around. This is the slowest. This is the largest value. So this is the slowest. And in fact, binary search is the fastest. Is that clear? So we can totally do k research. We can totally do a ternary search. We can totally do a k research, but practically binary search will work much, much faster. Is that clear guys? Is that clear? Binary search will work much, much faster. All right. Cool. Now there's this question. Now, now you might be thinking that, okay, you told us about ternary search. You told us about k research. And then you said that, okay, those didn't, those don't really matter, right? Why did you even tell us in the first place? 
right? Why did you tell this to us in the first place? The reason is that in certain situations, in certain situations, K research, K research can become can become faster. Okay? K research can become faster. Let us look at how. Right? Let us look at how. Suppose suppose that we are dealing with some sort of a disk, right? Hard disk. Right? Suppose that we are dealing with some sort of a hard disk. Do you know that hard disk is split into blocks and sectors and tracks? Yes. So basically, we are talking about a spinning hard disk over here. Okay? We are not talking about that the new SSDs over here. We are talking about that spinning hard disk over here, the magnetic hard disk. So what really happens is in a magnetic hard disk. You have several platters, right? You have several platters, and for each platter, you have a read head, right? You have a read head that is at a particular platter that is tracking a particular track, right? That is tracking a particular track on this platter, right? Now, what you have to do is this this one track information across this one track is given is let's say called a track, right? And let us say this is one block. So usually this this can be something like thirty two kilobytes. This could be thirty two kilobytes, all right? Now what happens is, if you have to read, if you have to read any value within this, then that is very fast, right? Then that is very fast because your disk is spinning, right? Your magnetic disk is spinning at thousand RPM, right? So within within zero point zero zero one second, you can read this entire thirty two kilobyte. You can read this entire thirty two kilobyte block, right? But if you have to change blocks, if you have to move from this sector, if you have to move from this Track to perhaps this outer track. Right? If you have to do that, then what you have to do is you have to move this head. You have to move this reader. So you have to unplug this reader. You have to run the motor to move it back. Then you have to plug it back. Right? And that takes some time. So that thing, that that thing, that moving the read head, moving the read head, can take a lot of time. It can take say that is a zero point one seconds of time. Right? So that is very very slow. Is that clear? So it turns out, it turns out that what really happens, it turns out that what really happens is, it could be the case that due to this thing, due to this thing, it could be the case that making comparisons, making comparisons, is fast. All right, you read thirty-two kilobytes of mem of data in the memory, and then once the data is in your RAM, you are making comparisons in the RAM. Right? And RAM is very very fast, very very fast. On the other hand, making a guess is making a guess is slow. Making a guess is slow, right? Why? Because for every guess, for making a new guess, you have to change the block. You have to change the hard disk block, right? And you have to move that. You have to move that read hand manually, right? Because this is this is happening in the hard disk level. This is not happening at the RAM level. Okay, so. What really happens in this case is making a guess. Make I want to reduce the guesses. I want to reduce the number of guesses I make. I don't really care about the number of comparisons I make because the comparisons are happening in the RAM very very fast, right? So in this in this sort of scenario, I would prefer to use some sort of a K research, right? I would prefer to use some sort of a K research because in a K research, this is the number of comparisons, right? And this is the number of guesses. This is the number of guesses. The larger the value of k is, the lesser my guesses will be. Right? The larger the value of k is, the lesser my guesses will be. So basically, to max to to uh, to maximize my efficiency, I choose a k which is equal to the block size. I choose a k which is equal to the block size. Right? And this thing, right? This thing is used all the time in databases. Whenever you are using a database, the database internally is storing the data in some sort in a Thing called a B plus tree, right? It's something called a B plus tree, and a B plus tree is simply a binary tree, binary tree that has been extended from. So binary tree works in a binary search manner, right? On a binary tree, you can have a binary search tree and you can binary search on it. On a B plus tree, you can do a K research. You can do a K research on a B plus tree. All right. How did you come up with this formula? So this formula is what we just saw, right? This formula is what we saw for binary. For binary search, we have one comparison and log base two n guesses. For ternary search, 
We have two comparisons and log base three and guesses. For k research, we have k minus one comparisons and log base k and guesses. All right. Is that clear? This is multiplication. Is that clear, guys? All right. So uh, I think we are going to leave it at this. Right? We are already uh, above the time. So today we basically discussed binary search. Binary search. We saw how to implement it. Right? We saw how to implement it. And we saw that this idea can be extended into a K-Re search, into a ternary search or a generic K-Re search. K-Re search is generally slower. Right? Generally, we would like to do binary search, but there are cases. There are cases, like for example, databases in which K research is very, very valuable. Okay. Cool. Now I would want each of you to, once this lecture is over, to uh, find the link in the video description or there's a link to the assignment, right? Today's assignment. So please go over there and uh, I mean, try to try to solve those problems. So those problems will be on basic binary search. There are some things that we were not able to discuss like binary search on a rotated array and right? finding the peak element. We can discuss it in the next class. All right. All right, guys. Cool. We, uh, will we cover interview, interview bit problems from your website? Yes, uh, Reshma. So all these problems. So that is why we give you the assignments, right? We are discussing the problems that are part of those assignments. Okay. I mean, of course, when we are actually doing a scalar class, uh, I mean, when someone joins our academy, we usually have three hour classes, right? And I mean, we have classes every single day for three hours. So that gives us a lot of uh, time to work with the student, right? So they are able to solve many more problems. We won't be able to do that on YouTube, right? So I understand that you won't be able to get the exact same experience as scalar, but that's to be expected, right? Because this is on YouTube. All right then, so please make sure that you solve the assignment. Please make sure that you are taking notes while you are uh, studying the lecture. And see you in next class. In the next class, I will continue. We will continue with binary search and we will be looking at more advanced problems on binary search. Okay. Perfect. Uh, if you want to join Scalar, well, uh, we don't really announce the dates during lectures. So whenever, if you are, if you are trying to join Scalar, just go to scalar.com. Right. And any announcement, any announcement about a new batch announcement about a new batch will be made over there. Right. So please, please monitor the scalar.com website and any announcement about any new upcoming batches will be made over there. Right. So let us end the lecture then. All right. Bye bye guys. Have a nice day. We are back with the, another lecture. Today we are going to continue binary research. We are going to look at some questions uh, that have been asked in companies, I mean, some of the top companies, right, regarding binary research. Now, without further ado, let us start the class. So, let me just share my screen. All right. I hope that everyone can see uh, the screen and whatever I'm writing over here. Cool. So. Let us start with a question directly. So we had yesterday we had looked at what binary search was and how to implement binary search. Let us dive into one question today. Okay. So suppose that you have been given an array, right? And this array has n integers. All right. Now uh, it has also been told to you that in this array, all elements but one come twice come twice all right also it has been said that the array is sorted array is sorted so let us first take an example of such an array uh, let's let's look at such an example let's say that we have 0 0 we have 4 4 minus we have let's say 5 all right we have 5 over here suppose then we have, let's say something like seven, seven, and we have eight, eight, right? So in this array, we see that every element has been repeated twice. There are two zeros, there are two fours, there are two seven, there are two eights, except for one element. Right? Except for one element, every element is repeated twice. Also, this array is sorted. 
Right, so it is sorted in ascending order. I hope my voice is clear. All right, cool. Now the question says, you have to find, you have to find this singlet element, right? You have to find this element which occurs only one time. So if this was the array that was given to you as input, then you are supposed to return five. Is the question clear? Yes. So we have been given an array. It is sorted. Every element in the array occurs, occurs twice, except for one element. And we have to find that one element that occurs only once. All right. So let us see some approaches. Let us see some approaches. Hmm. So uh, Piyush has a very nice idea over here. So Piyush has a very nice idea over here. Piyush says, let's, let's try XOR. Right now we all know the property of XOR. We have seen that in the bit manipulation class that XOR acts like a lock and key. Lock and key. Right? Basically, if I XOR the entire array, if I XOR the entire array, that is supposed to give me that element that occurs only once, right? That element. I'm supposed to get the correct answer because all these things will cancel, right? Zero XOR, zero will cancel. Four XOR, four will cancel. Seven XOR, seven will cancel. Eight XOR, eight will cancel. And I will be left with five. So yes, that's a valid approach. That is totally a valid approach. Uh, what is the time complexity of this? How much time will this take? How much time will this take? This will take order of n time, right? Because we have to go over each element and check, right? We have to exhaust each element, all right? Cool enough. Can, can we do better? In this, using this exhort thing, are we first of all making use of this property? We know that the array is sorted, right? We know that the array is sorted. So either if we use XOR or if we use a map to keep a count, then we are not really using this sorted property, right? They are going over each element. So let us let us try to make use of the sorted property and see if we can reduce the time complexity. So this is a this is a valid brute force approach. This is a valid brute force approach. But let us come up with an optimized solution that exploits the property that the array is sorted. Yes, let us see if we have some other approaches. All right. So yes, a uh, binary search would be the answer here, but what exactly are you going to do with the binary search? How exactly are you going to search it? All right. So Anurag over here says that let us check the middle element. Let us check the middle element. All right. Let us suppose we have some middle element. And what uh, Anurag is saying is, let us compare it with the previous or next element, right? And then return. Well, let us suppose that this array was a little longer, right? Let us say that we had 10 over here as well. So when you find the middle element, let me just, let me just add the indices. This is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Right? So which, what will be the middle element? This will be the middle element, right? Cool. Now, if this is the middle element, then we compare it with the left and right element. And what exactly do we do? What exactly do we do? So we look at both neighbors. We look at both the neighbors. All right. This is five and this is seven. So how, how does that help us? How does that help us? It doesn't really help us, right? Hmm. Okay. So what, what can we do then? Yes. So Dipanshu has a nice idea over here. Let me just, uh, Show the Pancho's comment. So the Pancho says that let us observe one thing. Let us observe one thing that whenever a new element comes, whenever a new element comes, it always comes at an even position. Right? Whenever a new element comes, it always comes at an even position. Yes. Is that correct? Until and unless, until and unless that middle element comes. After that, every new element comes at an odd position. Do you all agree? Yes, the first occurrence of any element is on an even position on the left side of the smith and is on an odd position on the right side of the smith. Do you guys observe that? So we are going to use this property. We are going to use this observation to find out what the, what the single occurrence element is. Right? So suppose that we do something like this. Suppose that we do something like this. We, we pick, so we have a high and we have a low. Right? So this is five and this is eight. We have a low and we have a high. 
let us calculate some mid right? let us calculate some mid what we will do is this mid will be let us say a of mid right this a of mid it might be the first occurrence of this value or it might be the second occurrence of this value right we don't really know this seven this seven that we landed on this could be the first occurrence of seven or this could be the last occurrence of seven right we don't really know so if so what we can do is we can find the first occurrence of seven suppose that we landed on this bit suppose that we had landed on this bit then we can compare it with the previous element and always find the first occurrence first occurrence occurrence of a of mid can we do that yes given a mid number can we find a of mid and then can we find the first occurrence of a of mid it will either be that element itself or it will be just the previous element right cool now once we have that once we have that we can check if the index if the index of first occurrence occurrence of a of mid right if this is what even if this is even then what does that mean what does that mean that the element that the singlet element lies to the right of me right whenever i i find the first occurrence occurrence at an even position that means that a singlet singlet element lies to the right of me so i will move right in this case right on the other hand if this is not the case if it is odd then i will move left yes and i will also have to stop at some point right i will also have to stop at some point so i can check i can check if a of mid is the first occurrence first occurrence and there's only one occurrence right so a of mid plus 1 mid plus 1 is not equal to a of mid then i know that i have found my singlet element because it occurs only once does that make sense yes so what will be the very quick pseudo code for this so we will have we will start with low equals to 0 we will start with high equals to length of so ar dot length minus 1 right then we will loop while low is less than equal to high right what will we do so we will calculate the mid first so we will say mid equals to low plus high minus low by 2 yes we just calculated the mid remove the extra string comment surely uh yes cool all right so we calculate the mid then we can check so we will first check so we know that we know that we have to find the first occurrence of a of mid right how do we find the first occurrence of a of mid well we can check over here we can check if a of mid minus 1 equals to a of mid right if this is the case then a of mid is the second occurrence and not the first occurrence do you agree yes if a of mid minus 1 is equal to equal to a of mid then a of mid will be the second occurrence because the previous element is also equal to in this case what is the first occurrence the first occurrence is mid minus 1 right in this case the first occurrence is mid minus 1 otherwise the first occurrence is mid itself right all right so what what i can do is over here is i can do mid minus minus mid minus minus and then over here my mid contains the index of the first occurrence now i can check now i can check if mid is even or odd so if mid is even mod 2 equals to equals to 0 then i have to move towards my right yes i have to move towards my right how do i move towards the right i say low equals to mid plus 1 right otherwise else i move towards the left i say low equals to oh sorry high equals to mid minus 1 i simply say high equals to mid minus 1 right perfect but that does not really tell me when to stop right that does not really tell me when to stop so i have to make some other checks as well also there is one more problem over here that what if what if this mid turned out to be zero what if this mid turned out to be zero then this a of mid minus 1 will give me an index error right i will be trying to index at a negative value that is not good right so i have to take care of these things so first of all what i can do very quickly over here is i can first confirm this right i can first uh, fix this thing i can say if mid is greater than 0 right and a of 
mid minus one is equal to equal to a of mid, right? Then do mid minus minus. Then do mid minus minus. So after this point over here at this line, mid will be the first occurrence of a of mid. Right? Min will be the first occurrence of a of mid. Now if mid is even, we do low plus. Uh, we increment the low. Else we increment the high. But once again, when do we stop? Once again, when do we stop? So we can check over here if a of mid plus one, right? If a of mid plus one is actually equal to a of mid, is is not equal to a of mid. My bad. So we we have the first occurrence of this element, right? We have the first occurrence of this element, and if the next element is not the same, then we have found the correct location, right? Then we have found the correct location. So what what I can do over here is let me just erase this and write it properly. And also we'll have to make sure that we check the boundary condition, right? So we will check if mid is less than is less than n minus one, and a of mid plus one is not equal to a of mid. Then what do we have? We can just return. We can just return the mid because this is the correct answer. Is that clear? Yes. Is the approach clear? So the approach is very simple. The approach is just saying that once you have these elements, once you have these elements, all the elements come in pairs, right? All the elements come in pairs. So zero one will come in one pair. Then two three, this will be the second pair. Then four five, this will be the second pair. Until and unless this singlet element comes, right? This this singlet element comes. After that, we will once again have the numbers in pairs. We will once again have the numbers in pairs. So seven eight will be there. Then nine ten will be there. Then eleven twelve will be there. Eleven twelve will be there, right? Now notice that before this, before this singlet element, every new element occurred at an even index. Right? Every new element occurred at an even index. But after this, after this, every new element occurs at an odd index. Right? So that is just what we are exploiting. All right? Cool. So what will be the time complexity of this approach? What will be the time complexity of this approach? So Abhay says, uh, "What if if a of mid minus one equals to equals to a of mid? Then how? What are we doing with this?" Right. So basically, what I'm saying is, suppose we landed at this element. Right. Suppose we landed at this element. This element was seven. Right. This and its previous element was seven. So if this is mid, then we are checking if a of mid minus one, right, mid minus one. If that is also the same as seven, if that is also the same as the same element, then move mid to the left. Right? Then do mid minus minus. Right? That will make sure that we are always looking at the first occurrence of an element. Right? Cool. So the complexity of this is just order of log n. Right? Why? Because this is a binary search, and at every time we are splitting the array into half. We are reducing the search space by half. Right? Is that clear? Cool. So this was a fairly easy question. Let us move on to a little, slightly more difficult question. Okay, but before that, let me let me just uh, give you a brief thing. So when you are finding when you are finding finding a number in an array, right? You return you usually return some index, right? You usually return some index. Now, what occurrence is this? Which occurrence is this? Which occurrence is this? Basically, what I'm saying is, suppose that I have a sorted array: zero, one, two, 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 three, four, five, six. Right? Suppose that I have this sorted array. Right? So this is index zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now suppose I want to find the value two. Right? I want to find the value two in this array. Right? So when I'm searching for the value two. The value two occurs at more than one indices. Right? It occurs at all these different indices. So, what index should my binary search really return? That is the question. Right. So, yesterday we saw that okay, we were revert, we were returning an arbitrary index. Right. As long as we found the index, it didn't really matter what occurrence we were looking for. Right. So, I mean that is perfectly fine. But usually, what you will do is you will try to return either the lower bound. You will try to return either the lower bound. Right, which is basically the first occurrence, right? Or you will return the upper bound, upper bound, right? Which is the last occurrence. Does that make sense? Yes. 
what what if the array is not present so lower bound lower bound is the first occurrence occurrence right or if the element is not present it is the it is the location it is the location at which i can insert the element i should insert the element insert the element to keep the array sorted yes similarly the upper bound upper bound is the last occurrence right is that clear yes or no all right cool so basically the question now is that if you have been given this if you have been given an array like this and i ask you that given a value to you have to return both the first occurrence and the last occurrence of this element then how will you do that right how will you do that what if lower bound equals to equals to upper bound well that simply means that simply means that the element occurs only once right reshma that simply means that the element occurs only once so suppose that the question is that given this array given this array and this value 2 you have to find both the first occurrence and the last occurrence of this array so basically if i give you 2 you have to return 2 and you have to return 6 so if if the input is this array into you have to return 2 comma 6 right so how will we do that yes so this is very simple right this is very simple we just have to make sure that we tweak a little bit on those minus ones and plus ones right we just have to make sure that we tweak a little bit on those minus ones and plus ones right so usually what we do is we write the loop like this so while low is less than equal to high right and then what do we do we say if array of mid so we have mid calculation over here we have something over here we say if array of mid is less than key right if array of mid is less than key then then what do we do we do lower bound uh, we we do low equals to mid plus 1 we do low equals to mid plus 1 right otherwise else if a of mid is greater than key then we do high equals to mid minus 1 mid minus 1 right otherwise if it is exactly equal in the last class we saw that we can just return the mid right we can just return the mid because we have found the location but now we can't just return the mid Right. now if we are looking for the first occurrence suppose if we are looking for the first occurrence can we return the mid arbitrarily no because what could happen is when we calculated the mid when we calculated the mid suppose we suppose we landed at this particular location right we found the two we found the two but we cannot return it but because this is not the first occurrence right this is not the first occurrence so how do i ensure that this is the first occurrence i will have to check over here that first of all that first of all else if mid should be greater than should either be zero right if the mid is equal to zero then it is my first occurrence or a of mid minus 1 minus 1 should not be equal to a of mid should not be equal to a of mid right because if if the previous element is equal to the same element then this this mid is not the first occurrence does that make sense yes or no all right that is fair enough but then what 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 does really happen then if i if i write this code there is a condition remaining right there is some condition remaining over here yes there there is some else condition remaining over here right so what do i really do in that else condition well i have to absorb that else condition it will have to absorb that else condition somehow so basically what i need to do is i need to make this thing i need to make this thing less than or equal to key oh sorry i have to make this thing i have to make this thing greater than or equal to key right basically if i have found if i have found the element but it is not the first occurrence then i will still decrease my high right suppose i found the element i found the element over here but it is not the first occurrence the first occurrence occurs over here then what should i do i should move left i should decrease my high is that clear but once again the moment i do this something else happens right another issue arises what is that issue that issue is that if i have this condition in my else if i will never come into the else 
right? I will never come into the else. So what I will have to do is I will have to move this particular condition on the top. Yes, do you guys agree? Do you guys see the problem? Because if I have less than here and if I have greater than equal to here, then I will never go into that else condition, right? These conditions are exhaustive. Yes. So I will have to move this up. So what will my actual code look like now? What will the correct code look like now? For finding the first occurrence, what I have to do is I have to check first of all. If mid is zero, right? If mid is zero, sorry, if, if, if A of mid equals to equals to key, right? If I have found the value and either mid is zero or A of mid minus one is not equal to A of mid, right? Only then, if I found the element and it is the first occurrence, only then can I return the mid, right? Only then can I return the mid. Otherwise, uh, so let me just put it over here. Otherwise, if A of mid is less than the key, then I have to move up, right? So I can say low equals to mid plus one, right? Otherwise, else I can simply say high equals to mid minus one, right? And this is what my correct code looks like now. This is what my correct while loop looks like now. And this is for the first sequence. Right? This is for the four seconds. So this code is incorrect. This code is incorrect. Right? And this is the final correct code for the four seconds. Occurrence. Can you similarly do? Can you similarly find the last occurrence? Can you similarly find the last occurrence? Yes or no? Yes, you just have to do it the other way around. Right? You just have to do it the other way around. Basically, you have to make sure that A of mid equals to key and mid is equal to either mid is equal to n minus one or A of mid plus one is not equal to A of mid. Right? That way we find the last occurrence. And when we are finding the last occurrence, this will be less than equal to and this will not be, this will be less than equal to, right? This will come in less than equal to over here. So that is very simple. It is very simple to find the first and last occurrence of an element in an array. All right. Now suppose that I have an array which is sorted and has size n, has size n, and I tell you that given a value x, given a value x, you have to count the number of occurrences, occurrences of x in this array. Then what will we do? If we have to count the number of occurrences in this array, then what will we do? Yes. Uh, Jay says instead of two binary searches, can we take a while loop both sides and find first and last occurrence? Yes, totally, Jay. We can totally do that. So let us let us we are going to explore that in via this question. We are going to explore that via this question. Suppose that we have this array. Okay, suppose that we have this array. This element is x, 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 and all the way till this location, it's x. Right? Then this is something else. This is y, y, this is a, a. So if I am supposed to find the count of x's, okay, this is a sorted array. If I'm supposed to find the count of x's, then I have two options. Either I can find the first occurrence, either I can find the first occurrence, then write off while loop, then write off for loop, right? Till the last location of x. Yes or no? I can find the first occurrence and then I can increment the count one by one. I can I can go one by one and till, till I reach the last occurrence of x. And I can do a count plus plus, right? I can do a count plus plus. If I do it this way, then what will be the time complexity? What will be the time complexity of this way? Well, to find the first occurrence, it will take me order of log n time. But after that, after that, to count each of these values, I will have to count one by one again and again. Right? I will have to count one by one again and again. So it will take me order of n time for the counting in the worst case. Right? What if the entire array was full of the same values? Does that make sense? So in this case, this, this approach will be linear. This approach will be linear. 
on the other hand can i do something better can i do something better uh let me just clear the banner just give me a second yes can we do something better right so we can what we can do is we can simply find the last occurrence we can simply run a binary search to find the last occurrence right this is one binary search binary search and we can also use another binary search one more binary search right to find the first occurrence right and then we can simply return we can simply return last occurrence minus the first occurrence yes is that correct plus 1 exactly right last occurrence minus first occurrence plus 1 all right and that will basically give us the count of that element is that clear yes all right perfect cool so i hope this is clear because this is very important first of all because i mean whenever you do binary search you have to understand that you are either going to be finding the last occurrence or the first occurrence you are not going to be returning any arbitrary occurrence also because in all of the further questions in all of in whenever you are doing binary search this is going to be very important for us it is going to be very important for us so let us look at another question right let us look at another question so suppose that we have been given two sorted arrays right this is a very very famous question i mean this question has has been asked in all sorts of companies right be it google be it amazon be it facebook be it direct type all the companies have at some point asked these questions this particular question and this question is very 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 frequent right and even if you even if you try to search on youtube you will find hundreds of videos about this question right? so this question is very important the question is that you have been given two sorted arrays of length length n and m respectively right right so you have been given two sorted arrays one is of length n one might be of length m right we don't really know which is larger which is smaller and both are sorted right both are sorted the question is we have to find the median of both the arrays both the arrays combined combined right we have we have to find the overall median yes right so first of all let us look at what median is right first of all let us quickly look at what the median is so suppose that i give you this particular thing suppose that i give you this array 1 2 2 3 5 5 6 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 24 25 26 27 28 29 30 31 32 33 34 35 36 37 38 39 40 41 42 43 44 45 46 47 48 49 50 
All right? Is that clear? Cool. So this is what the median is. Now the question says that you have two arrays. You have two arrays. Let us suppose 0, 0, 1, 3, 5, 8. Right? And you have another array. Let us suppose 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 20, 30. Right? Let us suppose that we have these two arrays. So let me put the indices very quickly. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Right. Now the question is not asking you to find the median of each of these arrays. That is not what is being asked. What is being asked is the median of the overall, overall array, right? Of the overall collection. So basically, if I were to take all these elements, consider all these elements and sort them, right? Consider all these elements and sort them, then what will be the median? So what will be the median in this case? What will be the median in this case? If I wrote, if I write both the arrays in sorted form, I have 0, 0, 1, 3, 4, 5, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8, 9, 20, 30. Right? Yes or no? And this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Right? That's an even number of elements. So the elements, what? The elements 6 and 7. So the median will over here be, the median will be 5.5. Is that clear? Yes or no? Is the question clear? We have been given two arrays and we have to find the overall median of the two arrays. Is the given array sorted? Yes. Both the arrays are in individually sorted in ascending order. Right? Both the arrays are individually sorted in ascending order. Right? But I mean, relatively they are not sorted. So it is totally possible that this element is greater than this element. Right? That's totally fine. Okay. There's no relation between the two arrays. It is just that they are individually sorted. Yes. So yes, Shivani has a nice approach over here. Shivani says that let us very quickly merge the two arrays. So where did our comment go? Yes. So Shivani says over here that what we can do is we can merge the two arrays. So when you were doing the merge sort class, you, you read this merge algorithm, right? Merge algorithm. What did this merge algorithm do? Given two sorted arrays, it created a sorted array. Yes. And how much time did it take? How much time did this merge algorithm take? So if, if I have, if I have total of n plus m elements, if I have n plus m elements, then usually if I do, if I, if I just do sorting, right? if I just do sorting in a naive way, then how much time will sorting take me? It will take me n plus m log of n plus m, right? This is how much time sorting will take me. However, if I use the merge algorithm, given that both the arrays are sorted, then I can do it in order of n plus m time. Yes, I can merge the arrays in order of n plus m time. Once I have merged both the arrays, then I can very quickly find the median. Yes, I can very quickly find the median. Okay, find the median. How much time will it take me? If I have merged both these arrays, how much time will it take me to find the median? So suppose that I have most both the arrays. After that, how much time is it going to take me to find the median? So it, is it going to take us order of log n time? No, right? So finding a median, finding a median is just order of one. You just have to look at A of mid. Right? You just have to look at A of mid. If the number of elements is even, you just have to look at A of mid and A of mid plus one. Right? So finding the median takes this order of one time, provided that I already have a sorted array. Overall, if I do this most thing, if I do this most thing, my overall complexity will be order of n to order of n plus m to merge the two arrays plus one to find the median. Okay? To find the median, which is just order of n plus m. Is that clear? Order of n plus m. Well, that is fine. That is good. That is certainly better than the naive approach. Right? So this was the naive approach. So this is certainly better, but we can still do, we can still do better. So this is not the best approach that we can use. So can we still optimize? Can we come up with an optimized approach now? What other approaches we have? Uh, hmm. So Ratnesh has a very, very nice question over here. Ratnesh says, can't we just use the median of medians? Median of medians, 
right? What does Ratnesh mean over here? Let us suppose that we consider these two arrays, right? Let us consider these two arrays separately. What is the median of the first element or of the first array? So this is the first array. What is the median of the first array only? So this array has six elements. So the median will be, the median will be what? So uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? It has six elements. So the median will be at what index? No, no, no. So what, what uh, Ratnesh is telling us is that let us try to find the median of medians. Right? Let us try to find the median of medians. So first of all, let us consider this particular A1. Right? This particular array has how many elements? It has six elements from this location to this location. So what will be the median of this particular array? It will be the sum of these two. It will be the average of these two. Right? It will be 1 plus 3 by 2, which will just be 2. Right? Similarly, let us calculate the median of this array. Let us calculate the median of this array. Well, how many elements does this array have? This has eight elements, right? And what is the median of this element or this array? That will be this three plus four, right? This element at three and element at four. So that is seven plus eight by two, which is 7.5, right? Now, uh, Ratnesh is saying, once we have these two medians, can't the final answer simply be the average? Can't the final answer simply be the average of these two? Two plus 7.5 by two? Well, no, that is not going to be always true. Right? That is not going to always be true. Is that clear, Ratesh? Over here, we see that this does not really work. This is 9.5 by 2, which is 4. Point, which is 4.75. Right? And that is not the answer. The correct answer is 5.5 over here. So it doesn't really work. Alright, so let me just uh, remove Ratesh's comment. So median of medians will not work over here. So we have to do something else. Yes, so what approach can we use? What approach can we use? So now we have to do some sort of a binary search. Right? We can we can use some sort of a binary search, binary search, to optimize the solution, right? So what we are going to basically do is we are going to binary search. There are there are multiple ways of doing this. Right? We are going to binary search on the index only of we are going to binary search over the smaller array, smaller array. Right? So first of all. Suppose that this is A1, suppose that this is A2, right? So can I assume, can I assume without loss of generality that A1 is smaller than A2? Can I assume that the length of A1 is smaller than length of A2? Yes. If that is not the case, then I can just swap those arrays, right? I can call this A1 and this A2 if that is not the case, right? So I can, let us assume that A1 is the smaller array. So what we are going to do is we are going to binary search in this smaller array. All right. So we will have some low, we will have some high and we will calculate a mid. All right. Now, once we have this mid, the question is when will A1 of mid be the correct median, be the answer? What has to be true? What has to be true for A1 of mid to be the correct median? What has to be true? If A of mid is the correct median, then how many elements, how many elements in A1, how many elements in A1 are less than mid A of, uh, A of mid? How many elements in A1 are less than A1 of mid? When all these elements are less than A1 of mid? Yes or no? Do you agree? And how many elements are greater than this? Well, all these elements are greater than it. Yes. If A1 of mid if A1 of mid is actually the median, is actually the median, right? Then what must be true? What must be true? Then half of the elements, right? Across both the arrays, half of the elements must be less than it and half of the elements must be greater than it. Yes, half of the elements must be less than it and half of the elements must be greater than it. Cool. So let us check. Let us quickly check. So if, if A1 of mid is actually the median, then how many elements in A2 should be, or if this is the case, if this is actually the median, then how many elements in A2 should be less than A1 of mid? Right? That is the question. Right? So we know that in A1, there are 
in a1 there are mid minus 1 elements or oh, there are mid elements mid number of elements so the the count of elements in a1 that are less than mid is mid right so the count so the total number of elements that have to be less than a of mid the total number of elements that has to be less than a of mid should be n plus m by 2 yes or no should be n plus m or plus 1 by 2 actually do you guys agree if i have this total sorted array if i have this total sorted array and this is actually the median then half the elements will be less than it and half the elements must be greater than it so if this many elements are less than it overall overall right and out of these out of these this many elements were already present in a1 this many elements were already present in a1 then what is the number of elements that are present in a2 which are smaller than this a of mid so this many elements uh, this many elements were already present in a1 so this must be the number of elements this must be the number of elements in a2 number of elements in a2 that are less than mid a of mid yes does that make sense how can you say that length of a1 is equal to mid no 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 we are not saying that the length of a1 equals to mid we are not saying that we are saying that consider consider that assume that mid is the correct median assume that mid is the correct median for that to be true if there are these many elements that are less than it in a1 then how many elements should be less than it in a2 and this is the answer this is the answer these many elements should be less than uh, uh, mid in a2 so what we can actually do is what we can actually do is we can start with some low over here we can start with some high over here and we can calculate a mid we can calculate a mid now what we can do is we can look at we can put a marker at n plus m plus 1 by 2 minus mid right we can we can look at this particular index right we will have four elements now we will have four elements we will have one over here one over here one element over here one element over here so let us let us call these elements a b c d let us call these elements a b c d a b c d right now when is this a of mid when so when am i at the correct position i am at the correct position when a is less than d and b and c is less than b right if this is the case if this is the case then this marker these two markers they point to my median do they not yes do they not point to the median why do they point to the median because the number of elements the number of elements over here and the number of elements over here is equal do you guys agree the number of blue elements is equal to the number of green elements yes and how are they equal because i have chosen to be right because i have used this formula to make sure that i land at the correct spot over here does that make sense Cool. So, guys, if this is not clear to you at the moment, we will uh, we will make sure to basically explain this with an example. Okay. So we will we will we will look at a complete example. But let me first explain the idea. Right? Let me first explain. The idea. So basically, what we have to do is we have to binary search for a mid such that the property of the median such that this property of the median becomes valid. All right. Now look at a concrete example. Let us look at a concrete example to further establish this. Right? Suppose that we have this array. Zero, one, one, three, five, seven. All right, and we have another array. Suppose four, five, six, eight, eight, twelve, twenty, thirty. All right, and let us mark the indices. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right. Now, which one is A one and which one is A two? Which one is the smaller array? This is the smaller array, and this is the larger array. Yes, this is the smaller array, and this is the larger array. So let us let us have two pointers. Let us have the low pointer, and let us have the high pointer. Yes, let us have the low pointer. Let us have the high pointer. Also, what is the value of n? The value of n over here is six, and what is the value of m? The value of m is eight. Yes, there are six elements in the A one array, and there are eight elements in the A two array. Yes or no? Cool. So now we have this low and high. What will be the mid? What will be the mid? Mid will be five by two, which will be two. Yes, mid will be five by two, which will be two. So this is the midpoint. This is the midpoint. 
all right and a1 of mid a1 of mid equals to what it is 1 right now the question is how many elements how many elements in a1 are less than or equal to a1 of mid how many elements in a1 are less than or equal to a1 of mid well these many elements right this element and this element yes there are two elements that are less than or equal to a1 of mid what is the count of that well the count is simply mid right mid is the count do you agree right now if if this one if this one was actually the median if this one was actually the median then how many elements should in this array should be less than one right in this array how many elements should be less than one well total there are 14 elements right total there are 14 elements so if if my median if there is my median then half of the elements must be less than it half of the elements must be greater than it right so basically what i am saying is seven elements should be less than or equal to it seven elements should be greater than or equal to it right? that is the property of my median right yes or no cool so basically if this is the case if this is the case and two of these so two of these seven elements two of these seven elements come from a1 right? two of the lesser elements come from a1 then how many lesser elements should come from a2 how many of the lesser elements should come from a2 well, two are from A1, so five must be from A2, right? Five must be from A2. So all these elements, all these elements should be less than one. It right? should be less than this one. If one was the median, then all these elements should be less than one. Are they less than one? Are they really less than one? Yes or no? They are not less than one, right? So one cannot be the median. Does that make sense? Because because all these elements, they are not less than one. So one cannot be the median. So my median is too small. In that case, I have to increase my loop. Right? I will try to find the median on the right hand side. Is that clear? Is that clear guys? Yes. So basically what we are saying is, basically what we are saying is that let us say, let us say that we have, we are going to have a low and we are going to have a high and we are going to calculate the mid as low plus high by two. Right now, how many elements are less than mid a of mid in the first array? Well, that is just mid. So, how many elements should be less than it in the second array? How many elements should be less than it in the second array? That should be what? That should be n plus m plus one by two minus mid. Yes, that should be n plus m plus one by two minus mid. Right. So, what we can now do is so this is this is uh, the this is the partition. Uh, this is basically the partition partition of a2 right now we can simply check now we can simply check now we have four elements we have a1 of mid we have a1 of mid plus one right and we have a2 of partition and we have a2 of partition plus one right is that clear and we can check if this if this element is less than this element and this element is less than this element then our partition is valid and we have the correct midpoint. Right? Then our partition is valid and we have the correct midpoint. All right. Why n plus m? Uh, why, why this plus one thing? Well, this is just to make sure that the number of elements, number of elements that are on the left are greater than or equal to the number of elements on the right. right? That is just to make sure that the number of elements on the left are either equal to the number of elements on the right or they are one more than the number of elements on the right. Okay, so if I mean if the number of elements is even, then there will be a mismatch, right? You can't have both the, both the same number of elements on both left and right. So we will have one extra element in the left. Is that clear, guys? Uh, just give me a second. Hmm. Let us look at some code for this. Right? Let us look at some code for this. So what will really happen is let us suppose that we have two n. So we have find median, find median, and we have two arrays. We have a1 and we have a2. Right. Let us let us call this A and B. Let us call this the array A and the array B. All right. For some reason. Now what we are going to do is we are going to make sure we are going to make sure that array A is smaller. We are going to make sure that array A is smaller. How can we make sure that array A is smaller? How can we make sure that array A is smaller? Well, we can we can declare it over here, right? So we can say if the length of A, A dot length, 
a dot length is greater than b dot length right? if it is in fact larger then simply swap the values of a and b right so this will ensure that the that this particular array is smaller right and notice that this swap is just swapping the pointers this is just swapping the pointer this is not actually moving the arrays this is just swapping the pointers all right so now that we have ensured that a is the smaller element so now what we can do is we can have we can have a, a low and we can have a high right so we can say that all right low we can initialize low equals to zero and we can initialize high equals to what so what array are we searching over we are searching over the smaller array we are searching over the smaller array so we will say high equals to a dot length right a dot length right and basically let me let me also do one thing let me let me also save two values over here nnm so let me say for simplicity let me say that n equals to a dot length and m equals to b dot length b dot length right so we have saved the length or the length in nm so now my low will be zero and my high will simply be n all right now i can loop now i can loop while my low is less than or equal to the high right now what is the first thing that i should do the first thing that i should do is i should calculate the mid right i should calculate the mid and what is the mid the mid is simply low plus high minus low by 2 right cool now this mid this mid is a marker in the first array this mid is a marker in the second first array what will be my corresponding marker in the second array as we just saw that corresponding marker that is called this partition right this is called this partition this is going to be n plus m Plus one by two minus mid, right? Is this clear to everyone? Is this clear to everyone that this will be the partition? Cool. Now what we are going to do is we are simply going to compare values. Right? We are simply going to compare values. We are going to say that if okay, we are going to say if a of mid, right? If a of mid is less than or equal to b of partition plus 1 right if a of mid is less than or equal to b of partition plus 1 and a of mid plus 1 or basically i can write it the other way i can write b of partition partition is less than a of mid plus 1 right if this is the case then what do we have what do we have we have two arrays we have two arrays such that this element is smaller than this element right and this element is smaller than this element right so a is less than b and c is less than d right and we know that the number of elements over here is equal to the number of elements over here right if this is the case if this is the case then i have found my median right so i have found my median over here so i have found the correct the correct midpoint right and i will actually return the median over here so we will have two cases over there as well we will look at that but if that is not the case if that is not the case then some other case will arise right then some other case will arise what case can arise what case can arise so either it can be that a is actually greater than b right it can be that a is greater than b or it could be that c is greater than d yes or no if a is in fact greater than b if a is in fact greater than b let us suppose that i have something like uh, i have something like 5 over here and 7 over here right and i have something like uh, or let's say 12 over here and sorry not 12 let us say 1 over here and 3 over here right so if this element is greater than this 3 then what does that mean if this element happens to be greater than this 3 then what does that mean it means that my midpoint is too high this midpoint is too high right i have to move left is that clear similarly if that's the opposite thing right? if i have 5 and 7 over here right if i have let's say 12 and 15 over here right so if if this element is greater than this element right then my mid should be on the right right this this value this value 7 over here this is too low so i should move to the right right so that is what we are going to do over here we are going to say else if else if a of mid 
is greater than b of partition plus 1 partition plus 1 then i have to increase my mid right so i will so i have to decrease my mid right so i will say hi equals to mid minus 1 right otherwise i will say low equals to mid plus 1 mid plus 1 all right so this is the main while loop this is the main while loop now there are some more conditions that arise right? there are some more conditions that arise those conditions are basically let us let us take one more example let us suppose that we have this particular array and we have this particular array right? all right now we have two conditions either the combined length n plus m, m either this is even or n plus m this is odd right either this is even or this is odd if the length is odd if the length is odd then what will be my median if the length is odd then what will be my median this is a b c d right we know the number of elements over here so the number of blue elements blue elements is either equal to number of green elements is either equal to number of green elements or it is equal to green elements plus one right it is either equal to it or one more than it right so if if i if i found the correct midpoint over here then then what can i say about the median what can i say about the median the median has to be one of these two things right the median has to be one of these two things yes or no yes or no guys and which one of these is the median going to be is it going to be a or c well it is going to be the maximum of a comma c yes the median over here is going to be the maximum of a comma c on the other hand if the number of elements are even if the number of elements are even then what do i have then what do i have well in that case in that case what do i have i have the max of i want to find the maximum value on the left right i want to find the maximum value on the left so max of a comma c and i want to find the minimum value on the right right so a min of b comma d and i want to take the average of those because the median will be average of two different values over here right i want to take the average of those is that clear cool so basically what do i have to write over here i have to check i have to check if if n plus m mod 2 right if n plus m mod 2 equals to equals to 0 if it is even then i have to return return basically uh, a of max so basically i have to return i have to return max of a of mid comma b of partition right the max of these two plus the minimum of plus the minimum of a of mid plus 1 comma b of partition minus 1 partition minus 1 right and i have to take the average of these two so i will add these two up and i will divide by 2 right that's a that's a very long line but i hope that it makes sense right? that is the case when my number of elements is even on the other hand if the number of elements is odd then this is very simple right then this is very simple i simply return so i can simply return over here the max of a of mid and b of partition all right we can simply return the max of a of mid or b of partition so this is basically this will basically be the code for finding the median of two arrays now there is one bug over here there is one bug over here can someone catch that bug this code is not entirely correct there is one very very crucial bug over here and that bug is basically let us suppose that i was searching in this array and i was searching in this array right suppose that while searching this array either my midpoint became n minus 1 or if my midpoint became midpoint became 0 right then how what do i compare i don't have anything to compare right if i if my midpoint is this thing n minus 1 then i can't compare a of mid plus 1 with anything right i can't really compare a of mid plus 1 with anything yes or no so for that to handle that we can very simply we can virtually append infinity and minus infinity to the left of to the left and right of both the arrays all right yes exactly so jay 
even in that case, if the first array is only of size one, so we will very quickly exhaust the mid. Right? We will very quickly exhaust the mid. So to handle that situation, to handle that boundary case, we need to add infinity and minus infinity on the right and left side of the of both the arrays. Right? You don't have to actually append it. You can treat it virtually. Right? You can treat it virtually. Is that clear? Yes, आज कुछ ज़्यादा हो गया. Well, I mean, I would recommend that you actually try and code this up. That you actually try and code this up. When you try and code this up, this will um, I mean. So I understand that uh, you won't be able to. I mean, you will have to get practice on this. You will have to actually try and code this up to properly understand this, right? But I hope that the intuition was clear. The code might not be clear to you, but I, but I hope that the intuition was clear, right? Cool. So now, what will be the time complexity of this overall algorithm? What will be the time complexity of this overall algorithm? Yes. So we are doing a binary search, right? We are doing a binary search over what? We are doing a binary search over the smaller array, right? We are doing a binary search over the smaller array. So what will be the time complexity? It will be order of. It will be order of min. So it will be order of log of. Log of min of n comma n. All right. It will be order of log of min of n comma n. Is that clear? Yes, uh, Madhuri. There, there are a lot of edge cases over here. So we, we always have to take care of the edge cases. I mean, the elegant sol the solution is very elegant, but the the code only becomes difficult because of all the edge cases that you have to handle. All right? Uh, the chart says, how are the corner cases rectified? The corner cases can be rectified by just adding a minus infinity to the left of both the arrays and a plus infinity to the right of both the arrays. All right? Basically, you can say basically you can say that you have four values over here, right? You have four values over here. You have A, B, and you have C, D. Okay, you have these four values over here. Well, what if this midpoint? What if this midpoint was equal to n minus one? In that case, if that is the case, then there is no there is no a of mid plus one, right? There is no a of mid plus one. So, what value should you consider instead of b? There is no b. B does not exist, right? So, what value should you consider instead of b? You should consider infinity. Similarly, similarly, this value over here. This if this is partition and this is partition plus one, right? If there is no d element over here, then you should consider infinity in space. Similarly, on the left hand side, if your if your if mid is zero, if mid is zero, then on the left hand side you should consider minus infinity, and same for partition. Is that clear? So once you actually try to code this, things will start making sense. I don't want to I don't want to give you the uh, exact code right now because then it will defeat the purpose of uh, us trying to solve these questions. Alright, you actually have to code this yourself. Uh, struggle a little with the edge cases, and once you figure this out, things will become clear. All right, cool. So let us move on then to the next question. Right. So the question goes something like this. The question goes something like this: that we have an unsorted array. That we have an unsorted array, right? Of size n. All right. And this array only has positive integers. Right? We have an unsorted array of size n, and this array only has positive integers. Now we have been given a value. We have been given a value x, right? And we have to uh, we have to find the largest value of k, the largest value of k, such that no sub array. No sub array of length k has some greater than or equal to x, or let us say just some greater than x. All right. So that's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. Basically, what we are saying is, suppose that we have some array with some elements. Right? We have some array with some elements, and we have been given a number x equals to ten. Right? Let me also give this array. So this is a one, five, six, two, zero, one, three, five. Right, let us say this is my array, and I have been given some x equals to. Let us make this a little smaller. Perhaps x equals to six. Right. Now we have to find the largest 
विंडो साइज k is the window size we have to find the largest window size such that in that window there is no window there is no window that sums up to greater than 6 right there is no window that sums up to greater than 6 so in this case what will be the answer in this case what will be the answer is the question clear so if i make a window of size 1 if i make a window of size 1 this or this or this or this or this or this then is is the sum ever going to be greater than 6 is the sum ever going to be greater than 6 if i have a window of size 1 no right so window of size 1 is valid right window of size 1 is valid size 1 is valid right on the other hand if i have windows of size 2 if i have windows of size 2 let us say this window right what is the sum of this window the sum of this window is 6 Right, so six is okay. What is the sum of the next window? Five plus six. The sum of this is eleven. Well, eleven is greater than six. Right, eleven is greater than six. So this window is not okay. And because this window is not okay, the window of size two is not valid. Right, windows of size two are not valid. Is that clear? Okay. So we know we know that a window of size two will give me a sum greater than six. So should I try a window of size three or above? Should I try a window size three, size four, size five? Yes or no? I should not try them, right? There is no point in trying them. Does everyone agree? Yes, because we have to find the largest window such that the sum of any the sum of any uh, sub array of that size must be less than or equal to this summation value over here, right? Let us take another example, perhaps. Let us take another example. So let us uh, take one more array. So suppose this array is one, zero, three, six, four, two, seven, zero, right? And let us say that x equals to thirteen, uh, right? Let us say that x equals to thirteen. Okay. Now, what is the largest window? What is the largest value of k such that no window of size k has some greater than thirteen, right? So does k equals to one work? Does k equals to one work? If I have windows of size one, then is the sum going to be greater than thirteen? No right. So windows of size one, windows of size one, they all have some less than thirteen. Right. So windows of size one are valid. Right. Every window of size one is valid. So size one is valid. This is valid. All right. What about windows of size two? What about windows of size two? Well, this has a sum of one. This has a sum of three. This has a sum of nine. This has a sum of ten. This is six. This is nine. This is seven. Right. All the sums were less than or equal to thirteen. So windows of size two are also valid. All right. Let us try increasing the window size further. K equals to three. All right. Now what what do my windows look like now? My windows are. So this is my window first window. Right. What is the sum of this? It is four. Then this is the second window with some nine. This is the third window. Right. This this has some thirteen. This is the fourth window. This has some twelve. This is the fifth window. What is the sum of this fifth window? This is still thirteen. This is the last window. This has some nine, right? So still we see that window of size three is also valid. Is that clear? Window of size three is also valid. All right. Let us let us try to increase it further. So let us try k equals to four. All right. Now what is the wind size of uh, what is the sum of this? That is ten. What is the sum of this? That is that is fifteen. Right. The sum of this particular window is fifteen, and fifteen is already greater than thirty. Fifteen is already greater than thirteen. So windows of size four are not valid. Is that clear? And because windows of size four are not valid, windows of size five, windows of size six will also not be valid. Right? All these will not be valid. Is that clear? Yes. Is that clear? So if this is my array, if this is the input array, and this is the value of x that has been given to you, then what value of k should you return? What value of k should be return? We should return k equals to three. Right? We should return k equals to three because we have to return the largest, largest size of window, so that no window of that size, no window of that size has some greater than x. Is the question now clear? Yes. Is the question now clear? All right. 
So how can we approach this particular question? How can we approach this particular question? So guys, whenever you, whenever you are, whenever you come across a new question, don't try to come up with the optimized approach right away. Right? Come up with the most beautiful approach. Right? First, try to solve the question. Once you have solved the question, then you can try to optimize it. Right? Because one, some solution, some solution that works but is slow. Some solution is always better than a fast solution that you never find. Right? So some having some solution at least is better. Right? So let's let's think of brute force approach ones first. Yes, so what can we do? All right. So let us look at two questions. Let us look at two questions. Suppose I have a guess, right? Suppose I have a guess, a guess for K, all right? Suppose I say that K equals to, let's say five, right? Suppose I have this array and I have been given a value, value of X, let's say 20, and I am guessing that K equals to five. Then how can I verify? How can I check it? How can I check it? I have to consider every possible window of size 5. I have to consider every possible window of size 5. So how can I do that? How can I do that? I can, I can either do two nested loops. So I can either say for i equals to 0 all the way till n minus uh, n minus n minus 5 minus 1, right? For j equals to 0 till 5 minus 1, right? And then I can say sum plus equals to a of j, a of i plus j, a of i plus j, right? And initially sum equals to 0, right? So doing this, doing this, what will this do? This will give me, so only, sorry over here. Uh, I will have to say sum equals to zero over here. Sum equals to zero over here. So basically, after after this inner loop, in each iteration of this inner loop, I will have one. I have the I will have the sum of one window. Right? I will have the sum of one window again and again. So I will have to check if sum is greater than x, then return that window size is invalid. Right? K is invalid. Right? After this entire thing is complete, I can say that k is valid. Right? So given a window size k. This is how I can check it. Yes or no? That that seems like a very very difficult approach to do, right? So can we can we simplify this a little bit? Can we simplify this a little bit? How can we do that? So are you guys aware of prefix sum? Are you guys aware of prefix sum? Suppose that this is my array. Suppose that this is my array, and I want to find the sum from some start location to some end location. Right? If I want to do many, many queries of such form that find the sum of all these different elements, then how can I do that efficiently? I can calculate, I can calculate the prefix sum. The prefix sum of the array. Right? Let us say that this is the array A, then the prefix sum of array A will be P of A. Yes. Now, if I were to ask, if I were to tell you to calculate A of I, plus a of i plus 1 or plus a of i plus 2 plus all the way till a of j then how can you express this in the form of prefix sum? How can you uh, express this in the form of prefix sum? Well this is simply equal to what? p of j minus p of i minus 1. Yes or no? Is that clear? Yes or no guys? Alternatively, you can also write this as p of j minus p of i plus a of i. Right? You can also rewrite this as this. They are the same thing. All right. So once I have this prefix sum, once I have this prefix sum, if I tell you that find me the size of find me the size of window of size five starting from this location i. Right? If I ask you to find the sum of this window, then how can you do that? How can you do that? You can very simply do what? You can simply do prefix sum of i plus k minus prefix sum of i minus 1. Yes or no? This will give you the sum of this window. 
right? And to to go over the sub to go over all possible windows, you can just write a loop for i equals to zero all the way till n, right? N minus n minus k basically. Yes. So that is the first thing that we can do to make our sliding window calculation a little simpler. Right? We can store the prefix. Up. But the the thing still comes that all right, given a value of k, given a value of k, I can check if it is correct or not. But how do I find the value of k? How do I find the value of k? Currently, the approach that I have, currently the approach that I have is start from k equals to one and try increasing it. Okay, try increasing it one by one. Right? If I do that, then what will be my time complexity? What will be my time complexity? I will have a loop of I will have a loop for k. This will run for order of n time. Right? Then I will have a loop for checking. Checking k. This will also run order of n time. So my total time complexity will be order of n squared. Yes. Of course, I also have to consider the complexity of the prefix sum. But calculating the prefix sum is just order of n pre-computation. Right? Pre-computation. So this is actually order of n squared plus n, which is just order of n squared. Right? This is my naive. This is my brute force. Brute force algorithm. All right? Can we can we improve this? Can we improve this? So uh, Teju says that we can use binary search. But what should be binary search over? Teju, what should be really binary search over? Yes, so Prakash says that we can binary search for the value of k. So we are going to binary search, binary search for the value of k itself, right? So how? Will, so what is the minimum possible value of k? What is the minimum possible value of k? What is that? What is the minimum possible value of k, guys? It is zero, right? It is zero. Basically, if some a of i, if some a of i itself is greater than x, then I can't have a window even of size one, right? In that case, the value of k will be zero. On the other hand, what is the maximum possible value of k? Possible value of k that is n. Right? If I take the entire, if the sum of the entire array is still less than x, then that is the maximum possible value of k. So what I have to do is I have to binary search in this search box. I have to binary search in this search box. So I can say low equals to zero, high equals to n, while low is less than or equal to high. Right? I will say mid equals to low plus high by two. Right? All right. Now once I have the mid, what should I do? What should I do? I should check, check window of size mid, all right? I should check window of size mid and I will have another function over here. I will have another function over here, check window, check window, right? That takes a value of K and returns true or false, right? This check window is going to do exactly this. This check window is going to do exactly this. So it is going to loop. It is going to say for I equals to zero or the way till N minus K, right? If, if the prefix sum of uh, i plus k minus prefix sum of i minus one, right? if this is greater than x, if any of this sums is greater than x, then return false. Return false. Right? Otherwise, return true. Right? If all these windows are valid, then return true. Right? This is the check window functionality. Is that clear, guys? Cool. So we have we have a function for check window now. So what can we see over here? What can we see over here? So if I check window, if I check window of mid and this comes out to be true, if check window of mid comes out to be true, then what can I say? If a window of size k works, then can I return this? If a window of size k works, then can I return that window size as the final answer? Yes or no? No, I cannot. Because yes, this works, but this not this might not be the largest value that works. I have to find the largest value that works, right? So if this is the case, then I have to increase my low. So I will say low equals to mid plus one, right? Mid plus one. On the other hand, if this does not work, then I have to decrease my value of k. Right? So else, I will say high equals to mid minus one, right? High equals to mid minus one. Well, when do we stop? When do we stop? So we can either stop when this loop exits or we can explicitly check. 
we can explicitly check that k works but k plus 1 does not work right if that is the case then we can simply return is that clear even if you don't do that that is fine because this loop will already uh, will automatically take care of it is that clear so we will return when we find a position of k which works but the immediate higher position right k works but k plus 1 does not work that will be our correct answer is that clear guys so after this loop after this while loop is over i can simply return i can simply return what what can i return so this will exit when low will become greater than high okay low will become greater than high how will it become greater than high when i would just do low equals to mid plus one okay so i can just return low over here right i can just return low over here and that will be my size of the window all right cool so what will be the overall time complexity of this algorithm? What will be the overall time complexity of this algorithm? So let us let us take this step by step. How much time does check window take? How much time does one call, one function call, one function call to check window take? This is simply a for loop. Right? This takes order of n time per call. Right? This takes order of n time per call. Well, what about this thing? This in this is login search. Right? This is login search. But inside this login search, we are doing this order of n call every time. Right? Inside this login search, we are doing this order of n call every time. So basically, the time complexity will be order of n times log of n. Yes, order of n times log of n. Well, we also have to consider the prefix something. So this is for the prefix sum. This is for the binary search. Binary search. Oh, sorry. This is for the binary search, this login thing. This is for the binary search, search, and this is for check window, check window, right? So the overall time complexity is just order of n log n. Is that clear? All right. So let us end the class at this point. Bye bye. Have a good day. Hello, everyone. So we are back again with another class. All right. So today's topic is once again binary search. So we have been studying binary search in the past two lectures. Right? So if you have not uh, watched those past two lectures, please go and watch them. So let us continue with some more advanced problems on binary search today. All right. Let me just share my screen. I hope that everyone can see the screen. All right. So let us start with a question that you might have seen earlier. Right? It is a pretty famous question. And you might have seen this in the arrays, 2D arrays class that we already had, right? But this question is relevant to binary research. So let us quickly see it here once again. Question goes something like this. You have been given a matrix. I mean, this is not that matrix movie thing. This is a matrix. It's a 2D array, right? Now, this matrix can have a certain size. Let us say that the size is N cross M, right? Now, this one property in this matrix that each row and each column is sorted. Right? So let us quickly take an example of what such uh, one such matrix would look like. So suppose we have 10 over here, 20, 30, 40, 50. Right? All right. What other numbers can we choose? So let us suppose that we have 15, 25, perhaps, right? 35, 45. 55, something else, maybe 27, right? 29, 29, 37, let us say 48, and let us say 60, right? So let us, let us just add quickly one more row. So suppose this is 32, and suppose this is 40, suppose this is 51, suppose this is 60, and suppose this is also 60, right? So we see that in this matrix, every row individually is sorted, right? Every row individually is sorted and so is every column. So is every column, right? Cool. All right. Now, what is the size of this particular matrix? Well, over here, we have four rows. So n equals to four and m equals to, we have five columns. So m equals to five. So this is a four cross five matrix, right? Now we have been given an integer. We have also been given an integer k. 
It's so a K stands for key. We have been given a key, and we have to search this key. We have to search this key within the matrix, and we have to return. We have to basically tell whether whether the key exists or not. Key exists or not. Fair enough. Yes. All right. So Rahul, uh, Rahul has a question over here. Rahul, I guess, is talking about the assignments that were given in the last class. Rahul says that five question in twenty four hours is kind of aggressive. Right. So Rahul, you do not have to attempt those question in twenty four hours. Right. So uh, unlike when you are enrolled in Skiller Academy, you will have a lot of guidance. You will have mentors. You will have TAs that will be helping you while you are working through the assignments. Right. We will have remedial classes a lot. when we are on youtube we just want to give you as many assignments as we can so that you can practice on your own time right so it could be the case that yesterday after taking the class you were able to solve two of the problems now maybe 5 days later or 10 days later you want to come back and try it again right so we just want to make sure that you have some new problems that you can still attempt all right so do not worry about the time constraint this assignment is not timed so feel free to take this assignment whenever you want how many times you want so it doesn't really matter okay just just the assignment is just to make sure that you can practice a lot perfect so yes uh, shahjia is saying that this question has been done in the previous class so we are going to very quickly move to this question all right but this is kind of important for binary research as well so as you guys already know that this is binary research question so let us just quickly recap this all right perfect so This is the question. You have been given a matrix of size n to n. Each row in each column is individually sorted. Given a key, we have to find whether this key exists in this matrix or not. Yes. Perfect. So, what approach do we have? Well, one one of the brute force approaches. So, whenever we have a new problem, we try to come up with a brute force approach. Brute force approach, right? In a brute force approach, we will not be using any any extra information that we are given, right? So, what will be the brute force approach? We simply try to linearly. We simply try to linearly. So, linear search. Linear search. If we search through the entire matrix in a linear manner. Then how much time is it going to take? What will be the time complexity? Well, how many elements are there? There are total n cross m elements. We are doing a linear search, so it will be the type, the complexity, the amount of time it will take us for linear search will be order of n cross m. All right, but we can optimize, right? We know that each row and each column is individually sorted. Interesting. Well, let us let us just worry about the rows for now. Let us just worry about the rows for now. So we know that because each row is sorted. we can binary search we can binary search inside each row is that correct so if we binary search binary search let us say this let us call this binary search 1 if we binary search inside each row then how much time is it going to take us for every row where there are m elements well there are m elements in a row right there are n rows and there are m columns so every row has m different elements so if we want to binary search among n m elements it will take us log of m time right this is for one row now we have to do this for all the rows how many rows are there n different rows so it will take us order of n times log m time yes do you guys agree on the other hand if we if we basically so this is on the rows if we binary search binary search number 2 on the columns right then it will be very simple so it will be m times log of n because now we are searching within each row right we, we are searching within each column and how many elements are there in a column well equal to the number of rows so we can search through a column in log n time and we have m columns to search through right so if we search through just the rows we will get this complexity if we search through just the columns we will get this complexity the question is can we do better right now this might not be obvious from the question itself we have already tried binary searches right we have already tried binary searches but binary search is not always about this binary property so just because you are saying binary 
that does not mean you always always have to split the array into half right that is originally what binary search rules but binary search has a more important concept more important underlying concept and the concept as we discussed in the previous classes is what the concept is that given a search space given a search space when you make a guess when you make a guess you are able to eliminate a large part of that search space right so every guess basically every guess every guess allows you to eliminate eliminate a large chunk chunk of the search space perfect all right so that's fair enough so how can we basically do that how can we basically do that for this particular question well we can observe we can observe let us suppose that let us suppose that we are looking at this particular element let us just pick any random element and let us say that we are looking at this particular element right then if we determine if we determine that given our key right let's say that we co compare this key with 45 we compare this key with 45 suppose that the key is less than 45 Suppose that we are looking for an element like 29. 29 is less than 45. Right? Then what can we what can we know from here? What can we know from here? This key was less than 45. So can this key can this key be over here? Can this key be in this area? No, right? This key cannot be in this area. Why? Why can it not be in this area? In fact, in fact, this particular area. Because this key is less than 45 and everything in this area, everything over here in this area is already greater than 45, right? So the key cannot be over here. Similarly, similarly, uh, so I, I, have, I can reduce my search space, right? I can reduce my search space by a large chunk. This, this might be a large chunk. Now there's one more property that we get. If we, if we move in a particular order, right? Suppose that we are starting from the top right. Then we can also eliminate some more, some more rows or some more columns. So we will be, we will see that we will be able to eliminate this top row as well, right? So over here, there's nothing binary over here, right? We are not really splitting the search space into half. However, what we are able to do is we are still able to eliminate a large chunk of the search space with every guess. Yes. So Dave has a nice name over here. Dave is saying that we can call this their case search, right? And yes, Tushar also points out one thing. So Tushar says that this has already been discussed in a previous class. So yes, it has been discussed in the array class. However, it is important enough to bring up again in the binary search class, right? Just to stress the point that binary search is not just always about binary search, right? You can still do sort of a binary search on uh, when, even though you're not splitting the data into half, right? So very quickly, how can we, how can we do the search now? Suppose that we start from the top, right? So once again, let us, let us assume that the key we are looking for, the key we are looking for is 29. We are looking for the value 29 and 29 happens to be over here, right? So we better reach this point. We better reach this point. But for now, we don't know where the key is. So let us start from the top right. Let us start from the top right and we will compare 29 with 50. 29 happens to be less than 50. Since 29 is less than 50, what can I eliminate? What part of my matrix can I eliminate? So where can 29 definitely not lie? because of this comparison that I have just made. I know that in this particular column, this particular column is sorted, right? So over here in all this column, every element is greater than 50, is greater than equal to 50. And we already know that 29 is less than 50. So my key cannot be in this column, right? My key cannot be in this column. So I can eliminate this column. Do you agree? Yes. All right. Once I have eliminated the column, now I have a different matrix. Right? I have a different matrix. The matrix exists only up till this column. Right? So what is the top right part now? What is the top right part of the matrix? It is this particular cell. All right. Let us compare once again. So we know that 29 is again less than 40. So once again, by the same argument, since this column is sorted, then 29 cannot be in any of these elements because we know that 29 is less than 40. So let us very quickly eliminate this column as well. Perfect. Let us move on to the next top right element. So this is 30. 29 is still less than 30. By the same argument, we will be able to eliminate this particular column. 
Does that make sense? Yes. Let us continue. So now the top right element is 20. Right? 29 versus 20. What is it? So 29 is greater than 20. Well, now a different argument appears. Let us look at the different argument. So we know that 29 is greater than 20. Right? So if we look at this particular column, if you look at this particular row, we know that everything to the left of 20, everything to the left of 20 over here, in that same row, right? That has to be less than 20. Everything to the left of 20 has to be less than 20 because the row is sorted. So 29 cannot be over here. So what we can now do is we can eliminate this particular row. We can eliminate this particular row. And notice that these columns have already been, these columns have already been eliminated. Right? We move on to the next top right element. So 25 is the next top right element. We compare once again, 29 happens to be greater than 25. So by the same argument, we can eliminate this row. Then we move to the next top right element, which is 29. And we, now we can return yes, that yes, we have found 29 and 29 exists in our matrix. Is that clear? Yes. So we are not doing binary search. We are kind of doing a staircase search, right? We are zigzagging around. So in this particular case, we, we moved along this part. We moved along this part. There's nothing binary about this, but this is still an example of binary search. Is that clear? Cool. Now very quickly, what will be the time complexity? Time complexity of this approach. So we have already seen that linear search takes this much time. Binary search will take either n log n time or m log n time. What about this particular approach? Well, for this approach, we can we have to go from the top right corner in the worst case to the bottom left corner, right? From the top right corner to the bottom left corner, and the path does not matter. The path does not really matter because in both the cases we will be covering we will be covering n different rows and m different columns, right? So our total path length our total path length is equal to n plus m, irrespective of what paths we need. Right? Either we go this way, or we directly go over here, or we maybe take this weird way. Right? All these cases have the same path length of n cross m, m plus m. So the time complexity will be order of n plus m. Is that clear? So this was a repeated question, but this was still very simple and very relevant to binary research. Let us move on now. So we very quickly saw this question. Let us move on to the next question. So Animesh over here says, can we rewrite this? So Animesh says that, okay, perhaps we can also rewrite this as order of max of n comma m. And that is true. That is true. So as we saw in the very first class on time complexity analysis, we saw that we can rewrite this part as max of n comma m, right? Because asymptotically, these complexities will turn out to be the same. They are related by a constant factor of each other, all right? Perfect. Moving on, let us see a more challenging question. So this question is very famously called aggressive curves. Aggressive curves. I think this question was originally from the platform Spodge, right? And this question is very, very common. I mean, this, this question happens to be one of the favorites for all the companies. So this question has been asked numerous times at Google. This question is, is still asked very frequently at places like Directi and Amazon. And this is a very, very nice question, right? The, the, the special thing about this question, as you will see, is that it has a very nice solution using dynamic programming as well, but it can also be solved using binary search, right? So a lot of the times when a student goes to an interview, they, they are expecting a difficult interview question, right? A lot of the students are afraid of dynamic programming, even though dynamic programming is pretty easy, right? So whenever they see this question, the, norm, the natural approach, the natural idea that comes to your, their mind is, okay, I can try dynamic programming on this particular question. I mean, of course, dynamic programming solves this question, but binary search solves this, you know, faster now. Okay, so let us quickly see the question. The question goes something like this, that you have n different stalls. You have n different stalls, right? And the stalls, so let us say n is greater than two. You have n different stalls. So you have more than two stalls. And you have C cows, right? Once again, C is going to be greater than two. There's one constraint over here that C is less than or equal to N, all right? We have N different stalls and we have C different cows. Now you have been given the location of these stalls, 
the location of these stalls has been given to you. So let us say that we have four stalls, right? N equals to four. And the location of these stalls are one, two, five, and eight. All right. Or let us say, let us make this n equals to five. Let, let us just add one more. And one to five, seven, and eight. What that means is that the first stall, the first stall, the zeroth stall, is at location one. The first stall is at location two. The second stall is at location five. Third stall at location seven, and fourth stall at location eight. Right. So you can you can you can try to imagine this that this one stall. This is the other stall, this is the third stall, this is the fourth stall, and this is the fifth stall. And if this is at zero meters, then perhaps this stall is at two meters, then this stall is at five meters, right? This stall happens to be at seven meters, and this stall happens to be at eight meters. So they are unevenly spaced, right? These stalls are unevenly spaced. Now we also have C cows, right? Suppose for this example, we have Suppose for this example, uh, we have three cows, right? C equals to three. So now our task is to place these cows. Our task is to place these cows into the stalls. And one cow, one cow can only go in one stall. So I'll just draw the cow as a circle, right? Cows are not sphericals. So I mean, if you were a physicist, then you would say that okay, cow is a you you would consider a spherical cow in vacuum, right? But we are not physicists over here. So let us just consider this cow in this particular stall. Right, so I can I can put this stall in many, I can put this cow in stall in many many different ways. If I have three cows and I have five stalls, if I have five stalls and I have three cows, then very quickly can someone tell me what is the total number of ways I can put them? What is the total number of ways I can take three cows and put them in five stalls? Well, that will simply be that will simply be five choose three. Right? I have to choose three stalls out of five stalls to put the cows in. And oops. So let us go back. Sorry about that. Right? And if the cows are distinguishable, if the cows are distinguishable, then I will also have a three factorial factor coming. Right? That, that, that depends on whether the cows are distinguishable or not. Right? Perfect. So suppose I put the first cow over here in this stall. I put the second cow over here in this stall, and I put the third cow over here in this stall. Right now, the cows are aggressive; they want to fight with each other. Right, so we want to maximize. We want to maximize the distance between the cows. Between the cows, right? Now, but there are min uh, there are multiple differences, right? So there's there's one distance between this cow and this cow. And there is one distance between this cow and this cow. So, which distance are we trying to minimize? We are trying to minimize. We are trying to maximize the minimum distance, the minimum distance between any two cows, between any two cows, right? So, let us suppose that this distance is six, and this. So, let us not suppose that this is six. Let us just calculate. So, this is at two meters, and this is at seven meters. So, this distance will be five meters, right? Similarly, this is at seven meters. This is at eight meters. So, this distance is one meter. Right. Now the minimum distance among these two is the minimum distance among these two is one meter out of five and one one is minimum. So we are saying that this is the minimum distance between two cows in this particular arrangement. We want to maximize this distance. We want to place the cows as far apart as possible. All right. And this distance, mind you, this distance is not in terms of the stall number. This distance is in terms of the location of the stall. Right, so we have two things over here. We have the zeroth, first, second, third, fourth stall. We have the stall number. That is not what we are talking about. We are talking about the distance in terms of the location of the stall. Is the question clear? Yes. So very quickly, what do you think should the answer for this particular case be? What do you think should the answer for this particular case be? Suppose that this is the arrangement. Suppose that this is the arrangement. I have stalls at zero meters, two meters, five meters, seven meters, and eight meters. And I have three cows. Then where should I put these cows? Where should I ideally put these cows to maximize the distance? Yes, the first cow should go in this particular stall. The first cow should go in this particular stall. All right. Then I can put the second cow in this stall, and I can put the third cow in this stall. Is that clear? Yes. So this will be the ideal case. And what will be the what will be the final distance? The distance will be. So the distance between these two cows happens to be five meters. 
the distance between these two cows happens to be three meters, right? And the minimum of those distances is three meters. So we are making sure that the cows are three meters apart from each other. Any pair of cows is three meters apart from each other. All right. Perfect. So now the question is that given you have been given N, you have been given C and you have been given the location of these N stalls. Right. And you have to tell me, you have to tell me what minimum distance, minimum distance can you achieve? Can you achieve by placing the cows as far apart as possible in the different stalls? I hope the question is clear. So basically, if this is the input, you have to give me the output three meters, right? You have to give me the output three. All right. Now, how will we do this? How can we do this? So once again, let us start with a very, very brute force approach. The brute force approach would be to try all possible, try all possible arrangements of the cows, right? Try all possible arrangements. So as we just saw, so are the cows distinguishable in this particular case? Does it really matter what the first cow, second cow and third cow is? No, it does not, right? All that matters is what stalls they are in. So over here, how many possibilities do we have? We have five C3 possibilities. Right? Or basically we have n choose n choose c possibilities where n is the number of stalls and c is the number of cows. So if we if we do this brute force, we will check each of the possibilities, and then for each possibility, we will find the minimum distance. Right? We will find the minimum distance. So what will be the overall time complexity of this brute force approach? It will be order of n choose c times. So once we have chosen an arrangement, we still have to calculate. So let us say that we have several stalls and we have chosen to put one cow here, one cow here and one cow here. That is not done, right? We still have to measure these distances and find the minimum distance between any pair of cows. So that will take us an additional of order of n time because we have to go through every pair of cows, right? The total of time complexity will be n to c times n. Well, how big is n to c? Can someone tell me how big N to C is in terms of O-N complexity? So what polynomial N to the power what will it approximately be? This is the same as N to the power C, right? N to C is the same order as N to the power C. Yes, no? Yes, no? Well, not really. Not really because binomials flip. From the midpoint, the binomials flip. Right? So we are assuming, so this is if C is less than N by 2. Right. C is less than n by 2. So we can rewrite this as, so let us not, let us not write this complex expression. Let us just keep this as n to C times n. And this is in the worst case, in the worst case, this is equal to order of n to the power C times n. Right? Now, if C is very big, if the number of cows is very big, this complexity is perhaps not that big. Right? If, if there are 10 cows, then you will have to spend n to the power 10 times. That is very, very bad. Right? So let us try to optimize this approach for them. Let us try to optimize this. Okay. So those of you who are familiar with dynamic programming, who are familiar with dynamic programming, what would you try to do over here? What would you try to do over here? So anyone who is familiar with dynamic programming would say this, that, all right, I have several st uh, stalls and I have some cows. Right? I have several stalls and I have some cows. That is simple, right? For every stall, I have to make a yes, no decision. I have to make a yes, no decision whether to put this cow in there or whether to not put this cow in there. Right? So people would try to apply DP over here and say that, okay, for the first stall, I can choose whether I'm going to put the cow in or I'm not going to put the cow in. Again, for the second stall, I'm going to choose whether to put the cow in or to not put the cow in. Right? And so on and so forth. I will build my choices. And by DP, I can finally find the answer. Well, that is perfectly valid. Right? That is perfectly valid. And if you do that, if you do that, your complexity will turn out to be order of n squared, which is not bad, right? Which is definitely better than order of n to the power c times n, right? But we can do better. But we can do better. So the moral of this story is that even if you have come up with a solution, it is still worth checking if the solution can be optimized or not. All right. Now let us dive into the 
most optimized approach, which will be using binary search. Binary search. Perfect. So if we are supposed to use binary search, we have to have a search space. We have to have a search space. We basically have to decide what we are searching for. What are we really searching for over here? Can we search for the location of stalls? Can we search for the location of stalls? That doesn't really make sense, right? Because we have to consider multiple stalls and there are multiple cups. So how it doesn't really make sense to search for the location of a particular stall. What we can search for is the answer itself. We can search for the answer itself. Right? So what is the answer over here? The answer is the minimum distance. The answer is the minimum distance. And we are trying to maximize this particular answer. Minimum distance between any two cups. Between two cups. All right. So now that we have figured out what we, search, we have to search over, let us quickly discuss the bounds. Let us quickly discuss how large this search space is. So what is the, what is the minimum value for this minimum distance? What is the least possible distance that we can achieve? What is the least possible distance that we can achieve? Well, if every, if every stall, if we are forced to put one cow in every stall, and every stall is one meter apart, right? So they're just next, uh, next to each other. They're just next to each other. Then the minimum distance will be just one. Do you agree? Can the minimum distance be zero? Can the minimum distance be zero? Not really, right? Not really. What is the maximum possible distance that we can achieve? What is the maximum possible distance that we can achieve? Well, this is my first stall. Right? My, this is my zero-eight stall. Is at location zero, All right? And let us say my nth stall, my n minus one -th stall, right? Let us say it is at location, let us say L. All right. And I have to place C cows. I have to place C different cows within this distance. So in the worst case, I mean, even in the best case, doesn't matter how the uh, uh, stalls are arranged. Can I, can I achieve, what is the best distance that I can achieve? If all the stalls are equidistant from each other, if all the stalls are equidistant from each other, then I can simply place the cows one in each of them, right? And then basically my distance will be L by C, right? This is the maximum possible distance I can achieve. Can I achieve more than that? Can I possibly get more than that? No, because once I have placed the cows at equidistant locations, once I've placed the cows at equidistant locations, if I try to move any cow to the left or right, if I try to move any cow to the left or right, then the, the distance between the previous cow or the next cow, this decreases. Right? And, and we are supposed to consider the minimum distance between any pair of cows. Right? Minimum distance between any pair of cows. So the maximum possible distance that we can achieve possibly is L by C. Right? And what is L over here? L is simply the maximum of the array. Right? So let us consider that these distances are given to us in the array. Right? So this, this, this location of the stalls this has been given to us in array of size n. Right? So this is simply max of a, right? Max of a for all n. So we now have the bound. We now know that we are supposed to look for a value in this search space. This search space goes from one all the way till max of a of i. All right. Now what else is required for a binary search? What else is required for a binary search? So now that I have a low and a high. I have a low and a high, I will calculate a mid and this mid is going to be my guess. Okay, this mid is going to be my guess. Now I have to check, now I have to check several things. I have to check, is the, is the guess perfect? Is the guess, guess valid? And is this the correct answer? That's one thing I have to check. Or I have to check, is the guess, is the guess too low? Or I have to check, is the guess too high? Okay. Because only if I know all these three things, only if I know the answer to these three things, only then can I adjust my search space. Do we agree? Yes, exactly. We need a proposition. Right? If I don't have these three values, I will not be able to figure out in which direction should I move in the search space. All right. So let us, let us quickly look at how we will do that. So suppose that I tell you, Suppose that I have, you have been given this array A of n, size n, and this is the location of stalls. 
location of stalls and i am telling you that okay you can achieve a distance you can achieve a distance of let us say 5 meters right we have to verify whether this is true or not so how will we verify that how can we verify that well this is very simple right this is very simple what we can do is so let us suppose that these are the stalls right and let us suppose that this is at location 0 this is at location 5 this is at location 7 location 11 Location uh, 16, location 23. Let us suppose these is how the stalls look. Like. So what we can do is we can place the first cow in here. Right? We can always place the first cow in the first stall. Then we can move on to the next stall and we can check what is the current distance. What is the current distance? Is that distance greater than or equal to five? Yes, it is. Right. So we can safely place the next cow over here because we are trying to achieve a distance of at least five. we are trying to achieve a distance of at least five. all right then we can move on so when we want to put the third cow we will come to the next stall and check is the distance from the previous cow greater than or equal to 5 so is 7 minus 5 greater than or equal to 5 no it is not right so we cannot if we have placed the cow in this stall and we are trying to achieve a distance of 5 meters then we cannot put the next cow in this stall all right what about the next stall well the distance from 5 till 11 is 6 so we can safely place the next cow over here does that make sense moving on so we can definitely place the next cow over here and we can also place the next cow over here right so we can place the cows in this particular map now if if we are we are able to place all the cows to place all the cows successfully right so remember that we have c cows Right. If we are if we are able to place all the sea cows successfully, then what can we say about this particular guess? What can we say about this particular guess? Is this the correct guess? Not necessarily. Right. This is a valid guess. This is a valid guess. But we are supposed to maximize this guess. Right. So this is a valid guess, but this might not be, might not be the maximum value. So we have to continue searching. we have to continue searching with larger values right we have to continue searching with larger values suppose that we were not so if this if we were able to place it then we have a valid distance valid distance but the distance can be higher can be higher all right what is the other possibility the other possibility is we were not able to were not able to place all the cows to place the cows for example suppose over here suppose over here uh, let us suppose that my distance was my estimate my guess distance was so just let me just erase this so let us say that my guess was that okay i can achieve a distance of 10 meters right and let us suppose that i had three cows to put i had three cows so i will try to put the first cow in this first stall then i cannot put the second cow in the second stall or in the third stall i will have to put the second cow over here right i will have to oh in in this case it will work so let us let us just say that we had four cows okay, let us say that we had four cows so i will put the second cow in this stall then i can't put the third cow here i can put the third cow here so i will put the third cow over here now where do i put this fourth cow fourth cow i cannot possibly put the fourth cow because i have exhausted all my stalls right so in this case we see that we had a guess of 10 meters distance and we tried to place the four cows but we were not able to place all the four cows we were only able to place three cows so that means that my guess is incorrect right that means that my guess is incorrect is there anything else that i know is there anything else that i know i know that my guess is too high right if 10 meters did not work if 10 meters did not work then 12 meters or 20 meters or 50 meters will also not work right my guess is too high i have to reduce my guess does that make sense guys yes so what we are essentially doing is we are saying that let us initialize the low as 1 the high as l by c so this is maximum of a of i right so maximum of a of a is just the last location the location of the last stop k of a dot length or n minus 1 a of n minus 1 by the number of cows c then while 
our no is less than or equal to high, right? What we will do is we will calculate a mid. So our guess is the mid, which is simply low plus high minus low by two. Do you agree? Now we have to verify the guess, right? So if works, right, give if this array for this number of cows for this value for this guess if this works. So we will write this function works. But if this works, then what can we say? If this particular thing works, then what can we say? We can say that hey, this guess is valid, but it might be too low. Right? It, this guess is valid, but we we could be we could be doing we could do better. Right? So we have to increase. We have to increase our guess. Right? How will we increase our guess? We will say low equals to mid plus one. Right? But this guess worked. Right? This guess worked. So we must also save it. This was the largest guess that worked. So let me also save a variable over here, largest working guess, right? Let me save a variable over here, largest working guess. And this was initialized with, let's say zero or minus infinity, whatever you want. And I can see over here that largest working guess, largest working guess equals to maximum of my guess, my mid. So it is maximum of mid. The current guess, comma the largest working guess. All right, I can make sure that whenever I have a valid guess, I save the largest of those valid guess. Is that clear? On the other hand, if this does not work, if this does not work, then I have to adjust my high. High equals to mid minus one. Right? And at the end of this loop, at the end of this loop, when this loop is through, I can simply return. What, whatever maximum guess I have found so far. So largest working guess. Does that make sense guys? Does this, does this binary search make sense? Yes. We still have to write this function, right? We still have to write this works function. Well, this function is very simple as we saw. How will this function work? So we have to write works. This will take an array. This will take the number of cows. This will take the number of cows and it will take a guess. So what will we do? What will we do? We will start from the location first. Right? We will say that the, that the previous stall, previous stall equals to zero. Right? We will place the first cow at location zero. Now, how many cows do we have to place now? So for, for I goes from, I goes from one till C, till C minus one. Okay, we have already placed the zeroth cow. Now we have C minus one cows remaining to place. Okay, so we will go over each cow and then what will we do? Will What will we do? Okay, we will try to place the cow in the next stop. So we will also, let, let me also save a stall number over here. Okay, so stall number is one. Okay, I've already used up the stall number zero. So the current stall number is one. Okay. So now what can I do is, I can try to, I can try to put this, uh, put the cow in over it. So I can say while, while the location of the current stall, right? While a of stall minus a of previous stall, previous stall. Right? If this distance, while this distance is less than my guess, while this distance is less than my guess, I cannot really put this cow in the current stall, right? So I must move on to the next stall, stall plus plus. Do you guys agree? While this is true, I will do stall plus plus. Right? And finally, I will say that, all right, once I have this, I will say previous stall, stall equals to stall. Right? So I will put the cow in there. I will put the cow in there. So this is my loop. Now, of course, this loop might not always work. Right? This loop might not always work. Basically, when will it fail? When will it fail? When my stall number has become equal to the, equal to the, uh, size of the array when I have reached the last uh, stall, but my cows have still not been finished. Right? My cows have still not been finished. So I can put a condition over here. I can very quickly check over here. So instead of directly doing this stall plus plus, let me do a stall plus plus. And now I can check if stall equals to equals to n. If I have already lead, reached the last stall, then I can return false. Return false. Because this guess did not work. I still have some cows to place, but I have exhausted my stalls. Right? 
So I will return false that, hey, this guess does not work. If I can complete this for loop, that means that I was able to place all the C different cows. I, will, I was able to successfully place all the C different cows at a minimum distance of guess. So over here, I can return true. Return true. Does that make sense? Does this function, this works function make sense? Yes. Do you guys agree? Perfect. So what will be the time complexity of this? What will be the time complexity of this entire code? Well, let us take it step by step. Right? How much time does the works function take? Given, given a particular guess, how much time does it take to verify that guess? Well, we have to linearly search through the array of stores. Right? We have to linearly check the array of stores. So this works takes order of n time. Right? Where n is the number of stores. Do you agree? Do you guys agree? So, okay, some, some people will over here say that, okay, you have a while loop. You have a while loop over here and you have a loop that goes C times over here. So isn't the, isn't the complexity going to be C times n? Shouldn't the complexity be C times n? Well, no, right? The complexity of this entire for loop is not C times n because as we see, this variable stall, this variable stall is strictly increasing. Right? This variable stall is never reset. So it can only increase and the maximum possible value of stall can be up to n. Right? So it is the complexity of this entire nested loop. It is not C times n. It is simply order of n. Is that clear? Yes, perfect. What about this? What about this binary search? So uh, I think I delete something from here. Right? What about this binary search? So this binary search takes us how much time? It takes us log of the, the size of search space. What is the size of search space over here? Is the, si is the size of search space n? No. The size of search space is this value over here. Right? This is the size of search space. A of n minus 1 by C. Right? This is the size of search space. So this will be the num this will be the number of times we will have to do the binary search. And each binary search will take us order of n time. So we can say that the complexity of this is order of log of max of AI okay, uh, max of AI so the maximum stall location divided by the number of cows right the log of that times n is that here yes yes or no well C over here is that here guys? So C is not a constant, so we can't really ignore it. So this will be the final value. This will be the final value. And is this better than, is this better, better than n square? So do you guys think that this is better than n square? Well, that will depend. That will depend on how large this A of i is. Right? How large this A of i is. Is that here? So it might be the case that A of i is 1 trillion. If a of i is a very very large number, then it might make sense. It might make sense to to do this n square solution, but that is going to be extremely extremely rare. Right? So if if n is large, if n is large, then definitely this log value will be much much small. Right? So in general, this approach will work faster. Is it clear? So we saw the brute force approach for this. We saw the brute force approach for this. Right? That was order of n to the power c plus 1. Right? Then we saw the dp approach for this. We did not discuss this in detail. We will discuss this maybe later. So this was order of n square. And then we discussed the binary search approach. Binary search approach. And this turned out to be order of log of max of a by c times n. Is that clear? Yes. Any doubts on this particular question? I hope that you will be able to code it. So this is part of the assignments. So please try and code it. You will actually learn a lot when you implement these solutions. Right? And one more thing, please, please try to make sure that you, you make the code modular. Right? So just like we have discussed in the class, please define a separate function right? that will check the guess. You can also write this, you can also write this code over here as well. Right? You can also write this code over here as well. But please do not do that. Right? Because then your logic will not be clear. You will be mixing the logic of your binary search with the logic of your checking a guess. Let us keep those two logics separate. Binary search is separate. 
checking of checking if a particular guest works or not that is separate so please let us do the separation of concerns thing and then keep them in different functions all right so let us move on to another question so this is again fairly challenging question and this is also a very very interesting question okay so the question goes something like this that you have been given an n you have been given a number n and this n is a 64 bit number 64 bit integer and let us say it is also positive all right let us say it is also positive let us also say that n is greater than 2 all right let us also say that n is greater than 2 so basically what values can n take so n can take a value from let us say suppose 3 all the way to 10 to the power 18 perhaps right n can take all these different values hmm. so now what we are saying is let us suppose let us suppose that n written in some base k n written in some base k so k can be either 2 in which case we are writing n as a binary number right or k can be ternary or k can be 3 or k can be 8 in which case we are writing n as an octal number right but if we write k in if we if we have n in some base k and if this equals to 1 1 1 1 1 dot 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 if this is just a string of ones, string of ones, right? Then we will say that okay, this k is a good base. Good base. All right. Is that clear? For example, for example, let us say that n equals to seven. All right, n equals to seven. Then what different bases will work? What all different bases can work? So first of all, this k equals to one will always work. Right? Yes or no? I can always write something in base one. Right? A number n in base one is just one 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 n times. Do you guys agree? Yes. Let us not do that. Let us not do that. Let us ignore. Let us ignore this k equals to one thing. All right? Let us ignore this k equals to one thing. So we are also considering that k is greater than one. That k is greater than one. Now let us try some other base. So 7, 7 written in base 2. What does this look like? What does 7 in base 2 look like? 7 in base 2 is, so this is base 10, my bad. This is base 10. In base 2, if I write it, then it will be 1, 1, 1. Right? So 2 is a good base. 2 is a good base for 7. All right. Are there any other good bases? Are there any other good bases? Yes, no. Well, what happens if we write 7 in base? What happens if we write 7 in base 3? What do we get? So we get 1, then 4 remains, right? Then we will get, uh, so just give me a second. So the last, so 7 is basically equal to 3 to the power 0 plus 3 to the power 1 plus 3 to the power 2 so uh, this is going to be 3 to the power 3 uh, yes so this is going to be 2 times 3 to the power 1 plus 1 times 3 to the power 0 yes so this is 7 this is 7 so what will 7 look like in base 3 what will 7 look like in base 3 7 will look like 2 1 in base 3. Right? 7 is 2, 1 in base 3. So is this a string of ones? Is this a string of ones? No, this is not a string of ones. So 3 is not a good base. 3 is not a good base. Alright, let us continue. Let us continue. So we can check the base 4, we can check the base 5. That is also not going to work. There is some other base that is going to work. Right? 7 in base uh, 7 is also equal to in base 6, this is going to be equal to 1, 1. Right? In base 6, this is also going to be equal to 1, 1. Do you guys agree? Yes. In fact, if I have any n in base 10, then this is equal to 1, 1 in base n minus 1. Yes or no? 1, 1 in base n minus 1, that is simply n. Why is that? Because see, 1, 1 in base n minus 1, this is equal to n minus 1 to the power 0 times 1 plus 
n minus 1 to the power 1 times 1 right and that is equal to what n minus 1 plus 1 which is just n right so any number any number n that i have i can always write in one less base and get a string of ones so 7 equals to 1 1 in base 6 right 13 equals to 1 1 in base 12 and so on do you guys agree so n minus 1 is always a good base right n minus 1 is always a valid base so this is also a good base right good now the question once again is that you have been given a value of n right such that n is greater than or equal to 3 and n is less than or equal to 10 to the power 18 suppose so it is a 64 bit integer positive integer we have to find the smallest base smallest good base all right so we we found several different good bases right for 7 we found that 2 works so we found that 2 works 3 does not work 4 does not work 5 does not work 6 works right? that is what we found for 7 so what will be the smallest good base for 7 what will be the smallest good base for 7 it will be 2 right it will be 2 so smallest good base so for example if n equals to 7 then the answer will be 2 and why 2 why not 1 because 1 works for everything right? if we if we allow 1 then every for every number the answer will just be 1 because base 1 works for everything is that clear so we are saying that the smallest good base let us call this k is greater than or equal to 2 so this is the question I hope the question is clear. Given an integer n, return the smallest good base. For example, if your value is 7, then you are supposed to return the value 2. All right. So, what can our approach be over here? What can our approach be over here? Let us start with the most brute force approach. Brute force approach. What will the brute force approach look like? In the brute force approach, we can simply check all the possible options. Right? We can simply check all the possible options. So we can go from base k equals to 2 all the way till n minus 1. Right? We can check all these different values. Now, once we have a base, once we have a base, we have to convert n into that base, right? Base k, and check if this is a string of ones. If this is a string of ones. Well, how much time does it take to convert a number? into base k how much time does it take to convert a number into base k can someone quickly tell me that it will take me log of n time base k it will take me log n time with a base k this is how much time it will take me to convert a number why because i have to repeatedly divide that number by k right i will say that okay the last digit equals to n mod k then I will this then I will divide the number, right? I will say n by equals to k. N by equals to k. This is not or this is a simple division, right? Then I will say d1 equals to once again n what k. And then I will again say n, n equals to n by k. Right? And this will be in a loop. This will basically be in a loop. That is how I convert the base. So it will take me log of n time base k. Alright. So what is the total time complexity over here? I have these many bases to check. I have these many bases to check and it takes this much time to check each base. So it will be order of n times log n. Right? So my brute force approach takes me order of n times log n time. Is that clear? Yes. Now this is not very good, right? This is not very good. If my n is let us say 10 to the power 18, then it will take me 10 to the power 18 steps. That is definitely not possible. I cannot do 10 to the power 18 steps on any computer. Yes, so we should better come up with a faster solution. We should try to come up with a faster solution. Okay, so what can we do over here? What is the first thing that comes to your mind? What is the first thing that comes to your mind? The first thing, since we have been doing binary search, might be that, okay, let me make a guess. Let me guess base B. Let me guess case B and check if the guess is valid or not. Yes. That is what comes to your mind. That let us take a base B, let us consider a random base B and let us check if it is valid or not. Well, this is not going to work for this case. This is not going to work for this case. Why? Suppose that my number was 7. I checked the base 2. I checked the base 2 and it worked. 
What does that tell me? Does that really tell me anything? That tells me that two works. That tells me that two works, but that is not enough, right? I also have to understand. I also have to understand: is my guess too low, or is my guess too high? Yes. Just because two works, that does not mean that my guess is too low or that my guess is too high. Do you agree? It might be the case that seven of six still works, right? So for this, for for the base seven, seven of two works, seven of three does not work, seven of four does not work, seven of five does not work, seven of six works. Okay, this works. So suppose you make a guess. Suppose you make a guess. There is a valid value to the right of it as well as to the left of it, and you do not know in which direction you have to go. So if it if it turns out to be false, if you figure out that okay, the guess did not work, did not work. So are you supposed to increase the base? But are you supposed to decrease the base? Are you supposed to increase the uh, the low, or are you supposed to decrease the high? Does that make sense? We have no way of knowing in which direction should we move our guess. So we cannot do the binary search over base. Does that make sense? Because once again, if we go back to the first class, if this is our search space, then we need to come up with a proposition such that all the answers here are yeses and all the answers here are noes, so that we can search binary search for this midpoint. For this particular thing, the answer over here is yes. The answer over here is yes. The answer over here is yes. But all the other numbers can be no. Right? We don't really know. It can be randomly. It can be in a random manner. So binary search is not going to work for this proposition. Is that clear? Yes. It seems very very selective to try to apply binary search over here. I have a I have a base. I can verify if it is a valid base or not. So let me just binary search over the base. That is not going to work, unfortunately. So what else can we do? What else can we do? So we have to look at the question from a different perspective over here. We have to look at the question from a different perspective over here. So let us suppose. Let us suppose that we are talking in base B. Right? Suppose we are talking about in base K. Suppose base K. Right? Then, if, if basically my number n in base k is a string of ones is a string of ones i already know what this what the string of ones is right i can construct this string of ones right i know that this is in base k i know that this is a string of ones the only thing i don't know is how many ones there are over here yes how many ones there are over here let us call this value i does that make sense so n written in base 2 will have three ones Right, n written in base six will have two ones. Right, so instead of trying to binary search over the value of k, let me try to binary search over the value of i. Okay, let me try to binary search over the value of i. But let me first establish a relation between these two. Let me first establish a relation between these two. So, if n in base k is a string of ones in base k, so n. n is equal to a string of ones in base k right and let us say that there are i ones over here then what can i say what can i is there any relationship between n and k is there any relationship between n and k yes there is right what is the relationship i know that 1 times k to the power 0 plus 1 times k to the power 1 plus 1 times k to the power 2 plus all the way till 1 times k to the power i right this thing equals to n Right? If I if I if I have this number in base k, then this is the expansion of it, and I know that this must be equal to n. Right? What is so? What can I say? N equals to summation of k to the power i or k to the power let's say x, where x equals to zero till i. Right? So this is a what is this? This is a geometric progression. This is a GP. So can I write the sum of it? The sum of it is simply k to the power i plus one. Minus one by by what by k minus one, right? So the sum of a GP summation of uh, r to the power i for i equals to zero till k. Uh, this is equal to what? Uh, zero till n. This is equal to r to the power n plus one minus r to the power zero by r minus one, right? Yes. So just just notice that there is this denominator over here. 
right? You can't simply say that the denominator is one, right, Sajia? So Sajia, there's a small mistake in your formula. You have to you have to make sure that this denominator is also dependent on k, right? So we can say that n equals to k to the power i plus one minus one by k minus one. This is the relation that we have established between n, k, and i. Now I know that i cannot really binary search over k, but that's okay. Let me binary search over i. Right. Let me binary search over the value of i. All right. Now let us suppose, let us suppose that I have i once over here. Right. Let us say that I have i once over here. All right. And this is equal to uh, n. Right. This is equal to n. Then what? If I'm trying to minimize, if I'm trying to minimize, so remember that I have to find the smallest good base. Right. I'm trying to minimize the value of k. I'm trying to minimize the value of k. So what am I trying to do with the value of i? If see n is my constant, right? n is my constant. I'm trying to minimize the value of k. So what am I doing with i? I'm trying to maximize the value of i. Right? I'm trying to maximize the value of i. Do you agree? Yes or no? Right? Yes or no, guys? So that is one thing we know. Perfect. We know that we are trying to maximize the value of i. All right. Let us also let us also consider what is the search space of i. Search space of i. What is the search space of i? So i can be i can be so this can be so let us suppose that I write n in base two. Right. This is the smallest base that I can possibly have. So that will give me the largest possible string of ones. Largest possible string of ones. How many ones will I get when I write n in base two? I know that n is a 64-bit integer. 64-bit integer. Right. So I will the maximum search space, the maximum value of i can be 64. Right. So I can have all the way from two all the way to 64 uh, ones in my string. In my string. All right. Now once again the problem over here arises. Once again the problem over here arises. If I know if I know that this sequence of i works, does that tell me anything about this sequence of i or about this sequence of i? Does that tell me anything about this sequence of i or this sequence of i? It does not. Right? I know that I have to maximize the number of ones. But if this works or if this does not work, it doesn't tell me whether I should increase it or decrease it. So I cannot really binary search. I cannot really binary search over the value of i either. Hmm, that's sad. But how many i's can there be? We just established that the maximum possible value of i can be 64. On the other hand, when we were talking about k, we established that the maximum possible value of k can be up to n minus 1. So what would we rather search over? Should we search over k or should we search over i? This can be up till n minus 1. This can only be up till 64. Right? So this is much better, right? Do you guys agree? Searching over i is much better. So I can simply check. For every possible i, for i goes from 2 till 64. Let me check for all the possible, let me check for all the possible uh, strings of 1. Okay, let me check all the possible strings of 1. Now what I will check, now I will see, now I will see whether n can be written in the form of 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 i once to the base k. Okay, whether I will try to see whether such, whether any such base k exists that will give me this. Does that make sense? I can go over every i. Yes. But how do I find this k now? How do I find this k? I know the value of, I know the relationship between these two, right? I know the relationship between all these numbers. I know that, I know that n equals to k to the power i plus 1, right? n equals to k to the power i plus 1 minus 1 by k minus 1. I know this relationship. So now, if I have the value of i, and if I have the value of n, can I find the value of k? Can I find the value of k? Yes. How will I find the value of k? That is difficult, right? I will have to, I will have to manipulate the formula. Right? If I want to find the value of k, I will have to manipulate the formula. I will have to extract k out of it. I will have to extract k out of it. So can someone solve this equation for me very quickly? Can someone solve this equation for me very quickly? Well, you can't really. You can't really do that, right? Because this k, this i, might be a very, very large number, right? and you don't so for higher degree polynomials, you don't 
always have a way of solving an equation. So you can always solve a quadratic. If you have a quadratic equation, you can always solve it. If you have a cubic equation, you can always solve it. Right? But for higher equations, I'm not sure for the uh, fourth power, but I know that from fifth power and above, right, it is not always solvable. It is not always possible to solve a higher degree polynomial. All right. So this equation might not be solvable. So what can we do? Do we have to give up? No. Here is where we can binary search. We can binary search for the value of k. Right? We can try to plug in the value of k and try to binary search for an answer that works. Is that clear? So what we will do now is, what we will do now is we now have to find a k that works. What is the maximum possible value of? What is the maximum possible value of k? The maximum possible value of k, so the low, the minimum possible value of k is 2. The high maximum possible value is n minus 1. And now I can binary search over this value of k. I just have to find one k that works. I can binary search, binary search for k which satisfies this equation, which satisfies the equation n, n equals to k to the power i plus 1 minus 1 by k minus 1. Is that clear? So just like in the first class, we tried to binary search. So we did not do it in the class, but it was part of your assignment. Right? So in the assignment, you had to do a binary search for the square root of a particular number. Right? For the square root of a particular number. Yes, so uh, n minus 1. Right? This is n minus 1. Okay? So we can binary search over the value of k. Is that clear? So how much time will this binary search take? How much time will the binary search for k take? This is my search space, right? This is my search space. My search space has size of n. And I'm doing a binary search, so it will take me log n time. Log n time to binary search for a value of k. But I have to do this 64 times. I have to do this for all values of i. So this will be times 64. So the overall time complexity of my approach will just be 64 times log base 2 of n, which will just be log n. That is amazing. Right? We went from an n log n solution. We went from an n log n. Uh, what happened over here? n log n brute force, and we reduced it down to a constant times log n. Is that clear? Yes. So even though the question does not directly involve binary search, there is still an involvement of binary search. And the, the moral of this particular question is that be very, very careful. Be very, very careful. For binary search, you just don't have to make and verify a guess. You also have to understand, given the guess, if that guess worked, then is the guess too high or too low? Right? If the guess worked or if it did not work, this is not enough. You also have to establish is the guess too high or too low? Because if you cannot do that, then you will not be able to binary search for your answer. Is that clear? Perfect. Ankush is, Ankush is asked a very good question. Ankush is saying, how can we know whether binary search will be applicable for this particular question? Now, that is a very, very tricky question. So basically, the, the, the most common answer you will find to this is practice. Right? The most common answer that you will find to it is that, okay, if you just practice, then practice will make you perfect. You will get to know which way, uh, which uh, approach you have to apply. But that is not the entire truth. There is a separate way as well. So there's a systematic way. There's a systematic way of approaching problems. Approaching problems. Right? Now, unfortunately, I cannot teach this systematic way in a YouTube class, right? It cannot be taught in a one hour class. So the entire scale or uh, the scalar curriculum, the entire scalar curriculum of DSM and algorithms is based on, is tried, um, tries to teach you this systematic way. Right? So that whenever you get a new problem, you can just apply the systematic algorithm and try to come up with a solution for that. Okay, that is what we teach in the scalar classes. All right. So, I mean, we could cover this, but this is going to take a very, very long time. You will have to take a very long class. You will, you will have to consider all the DS algo things, and then we will have to tell you the approach. Perfect. So that is it for today's class. Let us end the lecture now and uh, see you then. So once again, you can find the assignment set in the prop in the video description. Please make sure that you attempt the problem set. Okay, then have a nice day, guys. Very quickly introducing what we're going to cover today, right? So today we're going to talk about sorting and why is sorting important? I mean, sorting is essentially nothing but 
arranging data that you have in a particular order, right? For example, if I have a few numbers, I could say I want to arrange them in, in, in an increasing order. Or if I have people, let's say I want to arrange them in, a, in, a, in the decreasing order of their height or increasing order of their height, etc. The ordering, because you are able to order something, helps you in a lot of things. For example, sorting might then help you do binary search on that data if you want to look for something. Or if uh, I give you queries around, hey, tell me how many numbers are bigger than a specific number. That also, I mean, if the array is sorted, you can just look for the index of the element, first element bigger, and then you know how many numbers are bigger, etc. So sorting helps in those contexts if, if it is ordered. In fact, most NoSQL DBs, they actually try to maintain data in a sorted form. Sorted set is, is what it is called because it makes searching for data, looking for data, doing a bunch of analysis on data easier and easier, right? So today we're going to just to elaborate. We, we're not going to talk about searching, searching. I'm going to talk more about sorting. Sorting is arranging data in a particular order, right? So for example, if I, let's say, give you five numbers, I give you numbers, let's say five, 10, three, two, and eight. These are numbers in no particular order, right? Now, if I say arrange these numbers in an increasing order, where all, I mean, the smallest number comes at the front of the list and, and so forth, that part is called sorting. So, I mean, if you sort this, then you'll have two, three, five, eight, and 10. It's an arrangement of the given numbers so that they are in some particular form or order. As I said, like the reason why it is important is because it helps you do a bunch of different kind of operations on the data fairly quickly if uh, what you have is sorted. And I gave the example of NoSQL databases where they maintain data in sorted sets because it lets them do a bunch of different kind of queries in a sorted form. In fact, we will talk about some form of MapReduce when we go to our system design modules. There also you'll see like uh, a lot of things are generated in sorted forms because it, it allows for, for certain more operations to happen later on. Does everybody understand like what sorting is? So maybe like the way I would explain sorting is taking a, just like in binary search, I took the real world example of searching in a dictionary, what we normally do in real life. I'm again going to be taking the example, a real life example of what we might have done in, in our lives before, right? All of us went to school. And in school, we were made to stand in increasing order of our heights. Now, let's take that example, which is I have a class full of people and I want to arrange them in increasing order of their height. Right now, assume they are standing in some random order. What are the different ways in which I can actually arrange them in increasing order of their height? And I'm going to take various uh, sort of approaches I would have taken. And then I would sort of map it to what that approach is in real life. So approach one, approach one could be that I ask everybody to come one by one. And I mean, let's say if I have a few people already standing in the line, let's say I have a few people that I've already arranged in the line. And let's say there is this new guy with this height that comes. In fact, it is better to imagine, I mean, maybe I can write the height of each of those individuals. Let, let me just write the height. So imagine I had somebody with height 1, 5, 12, and 27 already in the line. Somebody with height 7 comes. One thing which I can do is I can find the right position for this person, which is between 5 and 12. And I insert 7 there, which means then I'll have 1, 5, 7 here. And then 12 and 27, I'll push one space back, right? So 12 comes here, 27 comes here, right? And then as people keep coming, let's say there is a person called 32. I'll figure out where 32 should lie here. I'll figure out 32 should come here. I'll insert 32 here. Everything up after 32 would be pushed one space back to make space for 32. Here, there is nothing. This is called insertion sort. This technique where I get numbers. I figure out what is the right location for them. I can do that through binary search or I can do that through a linear scan. Either is fine. Once I find out what their location should be, I shift all of the other numbers one space to their right and then insert this number, new number at the new location. Now, 
that is called insertion sort. If I have to write the approach for this or the steps for this, basically assume that I am maintaining my sorted array in let's say sorted array list. That's a sorted list, which is initially empty. And imagine I keep getting a few numbers, right? What I do is I start from the end of this list. For example, here, if I had one, five, 12 and 27, and I wanted to insert seven, I'll start from the end. Is seven already bigger than 27? It is not. So what I would do is I'll shift 27 one space to its right. So imagine this was the array. I have one space left here, so I'll shift 27 to its right. So 27 comes here. Then I go and again check 12. Is 12, I mean, is seven bigger than 12? No, it is not. So I'll shift 12 to one space to its right. 12 comes here. Then I check the next number, which is five. Is seven bigger than five? Yes. That means this is the location of seven and I insert it here. That is, I keep doing this with every new number that I encounter and that makes for what is known as insertion sort. What is the best case complexity here? Best case time complexity here. And what is worst case time complexity here? Best case for sorting. Order one would be the time complexity of inserting a new element, best case, right? Because you, you, you start with seven, you'll find that, I mean, let's say the new element that we are inserting in this new array, let's say that is 32. Best case is I look at the first element and I find that 32 is bigger than that and therefore 32 just gets inserted here. It is for the addition of the last, like the new element, order one is the best thing that you can do, but you'll have to add n such elements. So therefore, if you do order one for n elements, you will end up with order n best case complexity. So in the best case, insertion sort will take order n time. What is the worst case? When do we get the worst case? What is the worst case and when, in what kind of data would we get worst case? If the array was reverse sorted, which means if let's say I was giving you numbers, I first give you number five, you insert five, then I give you four, you insert four here, right? Because you'll have to shift to five, five, one. Then I give you three. You'll figure out that actually three is smaller. So you'll shift five here and you'll shift four here and then three comes here. Then I give you two. You'll again like shift five here. You'll shift four here. You'll shift three here and then two will come here. And then again, you'll do one more shift and to get one in if I one is the next number, right? This ends up taking, I mean, for the first number, you take one step for the second number, you take two steps for the third number, you take three and for the fourth number, four and five and six and so forth. So this becomes almost order of n square. So worst case, this might take order of n square when, when the numbers are sorted in decreasing order. A very interesting question which is, does the time complexity affect if we take linked list? There are two parts here, right? Like one is, I mean, there are two things that we're looking for. One is, what is the right index where this new number should go? And the second is shifting, shifting greater numbers to make space. One place right, right? So your linked list will save you on this time. So this time will become zero. However, finding this one in a linked list, because you can't really jump to a random location, you'll have to do a linear scan to figure out where the number should occur, right? So you'll, that might still end up taking order of n square because searching for the right index, the step number one, that might end up taking order n. You can't apply binary search in linked list because you can't just jump to a random location in the linked list. Right now, the way I explained insertion sort was that you were getting a stream of numbers and then you're sort of sorting it by putting them in the right location. Now, whatever I said, that can also be applied to an existing array as well. Let me explain. Right now, the way I detailed insertion sort is by saying that, you know what, like five, I'm getting five, then I'm getting four, then I'm getting three, then two, then one. Imagine I was already given an array. Right? So imagine I had the array as, let's say five, eight, three, two, eighteen, 
hypothetically, right? And I asked you to sort this array in place without using extra memory. I do not want to use any extra memory. Can you sort this array without using extra memory? Insertion sort. So I don't again have the flexibility of creating a new array. I am doing this in place. How do we do that in place? Even when you're doing in place, imagine I start from five, right? So first I'll start with five. I'll say I only have to sort this. Five is the new number that I've gotten, right? So I have one place, five is the new number I've gotten. Obviously it will go at this position. So five comes here. Then I go to the second number. And I say, let's put this in a temporary variable. Temp is equal to eight. Now eight is the new number I'm trying to insert in the first two locations, right? So first I'll compare with five. Is eight already bigger than five? Yes, it is. So it will come here. Then I look at sorting the first three numbers. I pick three. So I delete three from here, imagine. And it is, this three is the new number to be inserted. So first I check with eight, is three bigger than eight? No, it is not. So eight will come here. Is three bigger than five? No, it is not. So five will come here and then three gets inserted here. So now if you look, I mean, by now I have the first three numbers sorted. Now I'll take this number two, which is I'm trying to sort the first four numbers. I'll take the new number two and imagine that two is the new number that I was getting. So I put this in a temporary variable and do the same comparison is eight. No. So eight comes here is two bigger than five. No. So five comes here. Is two bigger than three? No. So three comes here and then two comes here. And then finally 18 is bigger than eight. So 18 will directly come here. Does that make sense? So same approach. All I'm doing is I'm saving on the additional space. If an array is given to me already, the worst case time complexity is still the same. Nothing has changed in the approach. I'm just using the same space that was there in the array instead of creating a new array. Okay. So. If we apply binary search for position, it will contain more computations, right? Finding plus swapping. Yes. If you do apply binary search, you'll first take log n time to find the right location. And then in worst case, order n extra time to create the space. I mean, right shifting all of the elements to create space for this other element, right? So it will end up taking n plus log n every single step instead of just n every single step. So this log n is additional. Overall time complexity will still remain n square because you'll do this n times. So instead of n into n, you'll get n into n plus log n, which is basically n square plus n log n, which is still order of n square. But why do that? I mean, why do this additional operation? Why not just start from the end? You have to shift the bigger elements one step to the right anyway. So just start from the end, shift the elements to the right, and then like fit the element wherever you find the first place. All right, everything clear till now. So that is one way in which you would sort, let's say your classmates, right? The second approach that I have is, let's say I have an array, right? Like let's say the same array. I had, in fact, let me go with the original five, 10, three to eight. So five, 10, three, eight. And I put this in an array. Now what I know is that in the sorted array, the smallest number has to come at the beginning of the array. Do we all agree with that? Smallest number has to come at the beginning of the array, right? So one thing that I can do, which is not very optimal, but still works. So just every single time I look at what is the minimum in my given array. For example, if I run this loop, I'll figure out that two is the minimum. I say, okay, great. If two is the minimum, let me push two to the beginning of the array. So two comes here. And then I can just swap it with five. So five comes at the place of two. So when I do this, two comes here, five comes here. Now what I know is that now two is at the right position. I only have to sort the remaining four elements. And I repeat the process. I, for the remaining four elements, I again look for the minimum, find three. So I swap 10 with three. And then I sort the last three elements. And then again, like I look for the minimum five, I put five here and then so forth, right? The only downside of this approach, while this approach works, the only downside is it is order of n square, no matter what the input. So in the best case, worst case, everything is order of n square. The good thing with insertion sort was that there is a case where the best case was order n. So therefore the average performance could have been better. If we do this, it is always order of n square. I mean, basically the steps were find minimum. Two is put in start of array. 
and then start plus plus. That was the, the approach. If the array is already sorted, even then to find the minimum in the array, you'll have to look at all n elements. So every single time finding the element is taking you out of n, right? So that approach is a precursor to bubble sort. So while this approach works, the question is, can we do something so that if the array is already sorted, then we don't have to go through all of the elements all over again, right? Like every single time finding the minimum takes me a lot of time. How do we decide when to break? Check whether the array is already sorted or not. Let me maybe give some other case, right? So insertion sort will still be order N if let's say only one element was not in its right position. Every other element was in the right position. For example, if the array was, let's say one, two, three, four, zero. The array is just very simply some random elements. Bubble sort is a variation of exactly this. Bubble sort is, as the name suggests, it is like bubbling something to the top, right? So what you do is you compare all adjacent elements one by one. And wherever you have a pair of numbers. So what you do is, for example, let's say people are standing in, in some random order in the line, right? So for example, I have people standing as 5, 10, 3, 2, 8. Let me just write it like this. 5, 10, 3, 2, 8. My objective is somehow bubble this, the smallest number two to the top. So what I do is I say the last person standing in the line, Hey, you compare yourself against the next person to you. You obviously know how to compare yourself against the next person. You can check your height versus the other person's height. Obviously, if you're standing behind and you're smaller, then you should swap yourself, right? So I say eight, look at two. If you're smaller than two, then swap yourself. It says I'm not smaller. Great. Then I say two. Look at the next person ahead of you. If you're smaller than that, then swap. And I do see that two, two is smaller than three. So I swap. So three comes here, two comes here. Then I say two. swap yourself against the next person. If the next person is smaller, I figure out two is actually smaller than 10. Sure. I mean, should get swapped. So two comes here, 10 comes here. And then I again say two again, compare yourself against five. If you're smaller, swap yourself. So two again gets compared with five. Five comes here, two comes here. So what has happened in this one order n loop? The smallest number has bubbled itself to the top of the array. This is why, I mean, because the smallest element is bubbling to the top, it is called bubble sort. Even this approach in the worst case will take order n square. There is one difference here though. If there are no swaps that happen all throughout in this order n loop, then we just stop there which means if the array was already sorted, then we would not do the next iteration. We'll keep doing the next iteration as long as there is swap happening. So let me elaborate again. What happens is imagine you're standing in the line. I start from the last person. I say, compare yourself against the, your neighbor. You compare yourself against the neighbor. If you are smaller, then you swap yourself. And then you do that till the start of the array. One thing which is guaranteed in this loop, whatever is the smallest number, will bubble up to the top of the array. Then you're left with sorting only the remaining part of the array. And you also know if there is any iteration where I went from the last person to the first person, there was no swap happening between the neighbors. Then I know that elements are already in the increasing order. I can just stop. I do the same process again. Now two, I don't care about. I already know two is in the right position for the remaining elements. So I again start from eight. I say eight, are you bigger than three? Eight will say, yes, I am. And I said, three, are you bigger than 10? No, I'm not. So we'll swap. Three comes here, 10 comes here. Three, are you bigger than five? You're not. So sure, I mean, then let's again swap. So three comes here, five comes here. Again, if you see three has bubbled up to the top, which was the next smallest element. And then you're left with sorting only the last three elements. Any iteration where you don't have any swaps, your array is already sorted, you can just stop. Since we had one or more swaps in the first traversal, we'll start again from eight. But will not go till two. Two will be ignored. I mean, the first element is already sorted. So we'll be ignored. We'll stop here. Now that in the second iteration, we know that the first two elements are fixed. We'll start again from eight, but we will stop at after three. I mean, we'll not look at three and two anymore because we know that they are in the right position. Every single iteration, what is happening is the smallest element is bubbling to the top. And any single iteration, I know that there is no swap that has happened. I can just break. And therefore, I do have a best case complexity which is if the array was already sorted, I will do an order n iteration to figure out, are there any swaps? 
but post that order and iteration i can just break or if i reach a stage where intermediary stage where let's say i did these and then the remaining numbers were already sorted then also i'll just break right so i'm not really spending time sorting if the array is already sorted does that make sense let me actually write the pseudo code for this what i'm going to do is i'm going to start so here is my inner loop right so i'm going to i'm going to start from the last element let's say there is a j that starts from n minus 1 goes to imagine i am doing a loop of i from 0 to whatever i'll i'll tell you what 0 to whatever is it goes to i imagine that like numbers till i are sorted right now nothing is sorted so n minus 1 to i what i do is here i compare a of j with a of j minus 1 now i know that in the right order a of j should be bigger so if it is smaller if there are two numbers where the second number is smaller then obviously they should be swapped the second number if it is smaller if this is smaller then they should be swapped because they are not in the right order so i just say swap a of j comma a of j minus 1 right by the end of this a of i will have the smallest element anyhow i is starting from 0 a of i will have smallest element anyhow i also keep track of one variable here has there any swap that has happened let's say there is a flag which is initially zero i just whenever there is a swap that happens i make flag as one if at the end of it if i see that flag is zero then i just break which means this element was already sorted there is no need to look at other elements and then i goes to from zero to n minus 1 yes yeah, sorry this is i plus 1 correct so again like what is happening in the algorithm is the smallest element is bubbling to the top and you just taking in the process making sure that if the remaining elements are in the right place there was no swap then the element is all i mean array is already sorted so let's just break yeah i mean actually we don't need the n minus 1 when we come to n minus 1 i plus 1 would anyhow this j loop will not run so i can just do n minus 2 again let's let's look at what is the best and worst case complexity of this algorithm best case is order n which is my array was already sorted or almost sorted and then i mean i do this iteration flag becomes zero i break and the worst case is when it is reverse sorted so i every single time i have to do all a lot of these swaps and it is actually order of n square all right so this is by the way called bubble sort find the smallest element move it to the beginning this is called selection sort in selection sort as well you could be it's what we were discussing where we were selecting the smallest element and moving it to the beginning of the array that is selection sort the reason why we are discussing this is these are intuitive ways of how we think about sorting and the technique can be can come into use later on let's do a dry run with with bubble sort just to see the best case right so imagine i asked you to sort this array 1 2 3 4 5 imagine this was my input correct maine kiya selection sort is sort of an greedy algorithm because what you're doing is you're saying that i know the smallest element should come at the beginning so let's find the smallest element you put it in the beginning and then you sort the remaining array let me however show like how the bubble sort is till best case order n i mean selection sort by the way we can also make order n in one case i'll also go over that selection sort just slight variation and it can become best case order n let's first look at how it becomes order n best case in bubble sort imagine this was your input right you start with i as 0 i is 0 j your flag is also 0 j basically goes from so you have your index 1 2 3 4 j will start with 4 and it will go till 1 4 till 1 and what do you do every single time you just compare a of j with a of j minus 1 so you here you check is 5 less than 4 the answer will be no so then you move on to the next j so from 4 you will go to 3 from 4 you will go to 3 then you compare 4 with 3 is 4 less than 3 no then you'll compare 3 with the previous element which is 3 less than 2 no is 2 less than 1 no so at no point this if condition gets executed so there is no swap and therefore flag never be becomes equal to 1 so when this loop finishes when the j loop finishes you come to the point where flag is still 0 and therefore you break so just after the first iteration with i 0 you end up breaking because you figured out there was no swap involved in my array so my array is already sorted why should i look at things again so that's why you get the best case as order n worst case is obviously n square 
Now let's look at what is the case or like how do we make sure that even my selection sort, which is like very greedy like, can I modify it somehow so that that also becomes or best case order n? Let's see. Let's take some random input, right? So I had five, three, eight, four, six. Now the way selection sort works is you go from the beginning. You look at this, you try to find the minimum element in the array. This is the, the approach just before bubble sort that I had talked about. You try to find out the minimum element in the array. In this case, I find three as the minimum element. And for this, I take an order n loop, right? In order n, I find minimum of the array. Now, if in this iteration only, I would have figured out that the array is sorted in this order n, if I figured out that the array is sorted, which is all of AI is less than AI plus one then my work is done. However, if it is not, then the smallest number that I found, which is three, I try to swap it with the previous element. Basically, I, I try to put it here and shift all of the remaining numbers one step to the right, which means the array now becomes three here. I have five, eight, four, six. In fact, let me just change the array a little bit so that it becomes slightly better. Imagine if the array was four, five, six, eight. When I do the swap, then the array becomes, or when I push it here, then it becomes three comes to the beginning. And then I have four, five, six, eight. Now, again, I know that at this point of time, three is at the right position. I still need to sort the remaining array. I'll again have to do an order of N minus one loop. This, 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 and this to figure out the minimum number. In this case, it is four as the minimum number. But by the way, in this order n minus one loop, I figured out the array is, is already sorted. So I can therefore stop my process. The key thing to do here is when you find the minimum element, you don't just swap, but you shift the prefix of the array one step to the right, create space for this new element, and then you put it in the right place. If you do that, then I mean, the selection sort also becomes best case order n. One thing is, I mean, in most cases, you will neither be using bubble sort or selection sort or insertion sort. Actually, insertion sort may be in certain cases, but most cases you will not be using these. These are algorithms that, that are good to think about. The approach that we utilize here, this might come into use later on in some of the other kind of context or in some of the other kind of problems. But the sorting algorithm that is currently in use in most of the libraries that you use are either merge sort or quick sort. Quick sort as being the most popular one because it has better average performance, does not use additional memory. But those are the ones because they sort of perform in order of n log n time. All of these are worst case order of n square. Average case is also order of n square almost. Java 8's array.sort also uses quick sort. But like bubble sort, insertion sort, three algorithms that I talked about, they're good to know from their approach standpoint because there are some problems that might utilize this approach. These are not necessarily the sorting algorithms you'll use in day to day. Sorting algorithms that you will use, I'll talk about that in a few moments. But just so that I, again, uh, complete my discussion on selection sort, let me write the pseudocode for selection sort. Pseudocode is very simple. Right now, if I have to sort, imagine when i is 0, I need to sort everything from 0 to n, right? So what I do is I take, this will go to some number, I'll figure out what. I'll take the loop from i to n. I'll figure out the minimum. Uh, in fact, let me actually also track its index. I can just keep it as a of i and index is equal to i. And this loop can run from i plus one. So if let's say a of j is less than min one, then minimum is equal to a of j, index is equal to j. Here, one of the other things which I also track is if a of j is greater than a of j plus one, then there's a flag that I set to. Let's say one. Let's say there's a flag here, which is also zero. And once I have found my minimum, then all I need to do is all of the other numbers, they are shifting one space to the right. So I, again, once I have found the minimum, I will take a loop of J is equal to. And then at the end, you have A of I is equal to minimum. That is one way of shifting. Basically what I'm doing is if I have an array, Let's say I have five, six, three, two, eight. I'm going through once to figure out what is the minimum. Once I find the minimum, 
I bring minimum to the front, which is two comes here, and then five, six, three, I shift one space to the right. And then I try only sorting this piece, where every single time I have a flag to check, is this piece already sorted or not? If, if at all, at any point of time, I find that there is a section of array that has already sorted, then I just break out and, and I'm done. Here, I mean, I could very well also have done, instead of doing all of this, I could have done swap a of i comma a of index. I could have done this as well. As long as I'm checking that for the remaining array, is the array sorted or not? If the array is sorted, then I just break. That is the only optimization that I put in, nothing else. Now I'm going to be covering a few other sorting algorithms, and then we'll do a few problems on these. Count sort is the easiest one. Count sort is when the elements that you are sorting, they are limited in range. Limited in range meaning, for example, I tell you, hey, you have characters A to Z. You have a lot of characters and you need to sort them. Or you only have numbers 0 and 1. Or you only have numbers from 1 to 20. Then what you do is instead of counting or basically maintaining like numbers themselves, you just count how many numbers. For example, I gave you an array of zeros and ones, right? So bunch of zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, et cetera, et cetera. And I told you to sort this array. One very simple way would be I calculate the frequency of zero and frequency of one, which is basically exactly what count sort means, right? Like you're maintaining the count of the numbers themselves. So you, you say like, I'll count how many times zero came. Let's say zero came 10 number of times. And I'll count how many number of times one came. Let's say it came five number of times. Then I know my sorted array. My sorted array is, Zero, 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 ten 10 times. And then one, 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 five times. So one very common application of this is if I give you two strings and I ask you, are these strings anagrams of each other? Anagrams is like two strings are anagrams if they are just some or the other permutation of the same string. For example, if I give you a string banana and I give you another string, let's say is, this is not really a word, but I give you these two strings, right? And I ask you, are these anagrams of each other? Your answer will be yes, because they have the same count of N. There are two N's here, there are two N's here. They have same count of A. They have three A's here, there are three A's here. And they have same count of B. You know that you only have 26 different characters. So in a 26 array, array of size 26, you can maintain the counts of number of A's, number of B's, number of C's and so forth. And you can just compare the counts, right? So count sort is very simple. If you have limited number of numbers, if your range is very limited, you maintain the count of every single number you encounter. And then like you just print those numbers, those main number of times you go from start to beginning. So we are going to maintain a new array for zero and one. However, zero and one are just two, two numbers, two variables. So it is still order one space. If you only have, let's say 20 numbers, then it's just order of 20 space, which is not order N, right? Like it is not dependent on the number of numbers that you have in total. Uh, let me maybe give you an example, right? And then I'll write code for it that will make it clearer. Very simple. Imagine I give you a string of characters, a string of characters, and I just ask you to sort that string of characters. For example, let's say the string is congratulations. Let's say that is the string. And then there were a bunch of bunch more characters as well. But like, let's just say that this is the thing. There could be let's say thousands and thousands of characters here, thousands, hundreds of thousands of characters. Now, one conventional way of sorting is like doing the bubble sort or the selection sort, etc. Right? Which is a selection sort would be you figure out which is the smallest character, which is A. You shift A to the front. However, I mean, if there are a lot of characters, that will take a lot of time. So what I say is, hey, by the way, I know that the kind of letters could only be from A to Z. Correct? I have A, B, C, D, E, F till Z. Correct? There are only 26 characters possible. 26 different characters possible. So if I somehow maintain the character count, right? I have only 26 characters. If I have an array, which has the count of what are the number of A's here, what are the number of B's here, C here, and so forth. For example, when I encounter C, I say, let's increase the count of character C by one. So C's count becomes one. And I mean, this is this could be just be an array, right? Because any character can be mapped from a number from zero to 26. So. I just maintain an array of size 26, which is all initialized to zero to begin with. When I encounter C, I increase the count of C by one. Then I encounter O, let's say O is somewhere here, I increase the count of O by one. When I encounter N, I increase the count of N by one. With R, I'll again increase the count of R by one. A, 
a will become one let's say when i encounter a again here a's count will become two so that way i mean i'm just maintaining count of every character right like and uh, if i have to write code for this i would just do very simple i would say that you know what like i have a array of size 26 which is initialized to 0 this is c++ format but like java etc it will be similar and then i just say you know what like let's assume that the character is ch and i go over this string str and i just say that arr of ch minus a which will now give me a number from 0 to 26 plus plus at the end of it i'll have frequency count of every character and then like the sorting is very simple i just go character by character right so i just go from for i is 0 to 26 i look at the count of the current character like for example when i is 0 then i'm looking at the count of a so what i do is i take a loop from 0 to arr of i whatever is the count and i print a plus i those many number of times so what will happen is if the count of a was 2 then this will print a twice Then let's say if the count of B was one, then it will print B. If let's say the count of C was three, then it will print C three times, and so forth. So all I am doing is I am just counting the numbers, frequency of the numbers, and then I am just printing in them those many number of times, going in the order of numbers. Does that make some sense? Count sort. How is it working? As long as the range is limited. For example, let's say if if you have numbers from minus twenty to twenty, even then you can use the array. right because you can just say that every single number num corresponds to the index num plus 20 so when you encounter num you just say you know arr of num plus 20 plus plus and when you print then like for arr of i is count you print i minus 20 in general if you see for doing this if you have a range of numbers let's say the range is r count sort takes order of r memory right if the range from min to max of the array if the range max minus min if this is r then it takes you order of r memory right because you need those many number of counts variable right if r is small small ish for example let's say if r is 1000 or 10000 or 100000 or 1 million if let's say r is up to 1 million then you can use count sort because you can maintain the counts and therefore like it will still run however let's say if the numbers were not limited if, if if there could be any integer then you can't use count sort count sort is only applicable when the numbers are limited in the range as i showed with counting characters in a string because characters are limited characters can only have 26 different values so it is not done in place in the sense that you still counting the number of a's number of b's and c's and then you can fill it in the same array for example if you said tell me here instead of printing a plus i i can just say you know what let's have an index variable which is zero and i have let's say my original string was str i can just say you know what str of index plus plus is equal to i plus a i can fill it in the same array instead of printing but i mean you will still have to maintain counts etc merge sort is if imagine you had to sort a deck of cards one possible way which is by the way also called divide and conquer could be that i break down this deck of card to half deck of card and half deck of card so i divide into two parts right like half goes let's say to the left half goes to the right i sort those individually right so half deck of cards i sort them somehow by some magic and right side also i sort somehow by some magic so now i have two sorted deck of cards i have two sorted deck of cards now the problem becomes if i have two sorted deck of cards can i merge them so that they still remain sorted imagine let me give you an example right so let's say i have an array 2 3 5 let's say i have another array 1 6 8 if i was given these two arrays can i merge them into another array which is completely sorted is that possible or not if that is possible then this could become another algorithm which is like whenever i need to sort an array i can divide it into two parts recursively sort them and then i can merge them so merge becomes the important step now the question is i have given you a problem you have two arrays not necessarily of the same length let's say this is of size a this is of size b can you create another array of size a plus b where all of the elements come from a or b and they are all sorted is the question clear like you have some a number of arrays in array a 
you have b number of elements in array b array a and b are individually sorted so a is a sorted array b is also a sorted array you have to merge them into another sorted array how would you do that basically if i have been given two numbers let's say i have an array a 2 3 5 and i have an array b which is let's say 1 4 8 and i have to create a sorted array right which is of size 3 plus 3 which is 6 1 2 3 4 5 6 correct this is the eventual sorted array i have to contain or create one thing is the first element in the sorted array is going to be the completely minimum of all everything in the array right so given array a is sorted minimum from array a is on position number 0 correct minimum from array b is also on position number 0 so therefore whichever is the minimum of these two i don't need to look at any other element whichever is the minimum of these two is going to be the first element in the sorted array is that something you all agree with and what is the minimum of these two minimum of these two is 1 so 1 comes here now if i have inserted 1 here then it is as good as saying that now i remove 1 from b it is the same thing right so what i just do is how do i remove one from b i just change this pointer to now point at this number 4 This is as good as saying that I'm now merging two arrays, one array which is A and one array which is B, but B is starting from this point onwards. And I again do the same thing. What is the next number that should come here? It should be the minimum of numbers here and minimum of numbers here. What is the minimum of numbers here? Array at this pointer. What is the minimum of numbers here? The array at this pointer. Whichever is smaller, which is 2, comes here and this pointer moves one step forward. So in short, the approach becomes that you have two pointers let's say there's a pointer 1 which is for array a there's a pointer 2 which is for array b and you just say the following while pointer 1 is less than whatever is the size of a and pointer 2 is less than size of b you do the following you figure out which one is smaller so you just check if a of pointer 1 is smaller than equal to b of pointer 2 then simple this is what goes in the sorted array so let's say sorted of let's keep an index a of pointer 1 you increment the pointer 1 plus plus because now pointer 1 has been assigned here else you put pointer 2 element here so sorted of again index plus plus is equal to b pointer 2 pointer 2 plus plus the only thing is when i'm done with this while loop it is possible it is possible that all of the smaller elements were in one of the array imagine like this array was 1 2 3 here and there were let's say 4 5 6 here my pointer 1 will end up going here and i'll end up breaking out where i have only filled in 1 2 3 in the sorted array 4 5 6 is yet to be filled so i'll have to check for that which is at the end of this while loop if whichever pointer is is not done so i just check while pointer 1 is less than size a i just keep adding sorted of index plus plus is equal to a of pointer 1 plus plus and very similarly i do the same thing with pointer 2 while pointer 2 is less than size of b same thing sorted b of pointer 2 plus plus right that will cause the merge to happen does this make sense right now if that can happen which means now if merging can happen and what is the time complexity of this merge imagine i have two arrays of size n and n each m plus n n plus n right like so it takes me order n time to merge if in fact the array a was of size m this was of size n it takes me order of m plus n time right that means if i have a order n array to be sorted if i divide it into two parts i say that sort the first part separately sort the second part separately once they are sorted then merging them will take me order of n by 2 plus n by 2 time which is order n time so merging them will take me order n time now how do i sort the first half of the array i can do the same thing with the first half as well i can say that even to sort the first half again break it down into two parts and then sort the first half sort the second half merge it with the end condition being that once i have an array of only size 1 it is already sorted how about i modify this and i say that i have three arrays that need to be merged right imagine i have a array 2 5 10 imagine there is another array 1 8 9 
and imagine there's another array, three, four, twelve. Let's say there were three arrays, right? How would you merge these three arrays into one array, which has all elements are sorted? We can do two at a time, but we don't necessarily need to, right? Like we look at this, right? What is the first element going to be in the merged array? It is the smallest of all. Where does the smallest come from? It is either the first element from here or the first element from here or the first element from here. Whichever is the minimum from here, that becomes your smallest. So I can have three pointers. Pointer one pointing to the zeroth element. Pointer two here. Pointer three here. Whichever is the smallest of these three, which in this case is one, one comes here. And then all I do is I move this pointer one step to the right. And I again repeat the same thing. Whichever is the smallest of these three, which is two, two comes here. And then two's pointer moves one step to the right. Now again, five, eight, three, whichever is the smallest, three is the smallest, three comes here. And three's pointer moves to the right. Five, eight, four, four is the smallest. So four comes here and its pointer moves to the right. Five, eight, 12, five is the smallest. So five comes here and five's pointer moves to the right. And then so forth, right? In the case of merge order, it is only two arrays. An extension of the previous question. Then instead of two, if there were three arrays, how do you go about merging three arrays? I mean, you can merge two arrays at a time. You can merge these two at a time and then you end up merging these two. But you'll end up using more memory because to merge these two, you'll need an additional array of size six. Then you'll create an array of size nine. What I'm doing is I'm just directly creating an array of size nine so that I reduce the amount of memory required to maintain that intermediate re-array. Also, I reduce a step. Okay, all right. Coming back to the merge sort. How does merge sort work? As the name suggests, it's divide and conquer, which is basically uh, now that I know that I have the superpower of taking two sorted arrays and merging them. What I can do is I given an array A, I sort the first half. So sort A to zero to N by two, sort A of N by two plus one to N and then merge these guys. That can become my approach. And this, how do you sort the first half? This also can happen in the same way where you again divide into two parts, zero to N by four, and then N by four to N by two. And again, then you merge, et cetera, et cetera, right? And if I have to write code for this, it becomes fairly simple, which is, let's say if the array, if the question was, how do you sort array A from index i to index j if if obviously like the size of the array is already one which means if j is equal to i let, let's just put that then your array is already sorted so you can just directly return if not then what you do is you basically sort the first half which is you say i'll go from a of i to mid where my mid is i plus j by two then i'll sort a from mid plus one to J and once these two guys are sorted, then I will need a temp array where I'll merge the array from I to mid and mid plus one to J. And then I'll make sure that A of I to J becomes equal to temp. I'll just um, do that. But basically I'm just applying recursion here. And what I'm saying is if you want me to solve by the way, let's say there is there are four numbers, right? Five, three, two, six. Let's say those were the four numbers. I say that first sort the first half. So let me call the function to solve these two numbers, five and three. Somebody sort this and then give it to me and then sort the second half separately. So somebody sort two and six and give it to me. And once I have them sorted, then I will actually merge them, right? Now to sort five and three, I again do the same thing. I split it half. I say somebody sort five for me and somebody sort three for me. Here also and somebody sort two for me and then six for me. Once they are sorted, then I'll merge. Five is sorted, three is sorted. How do I merge? In my merge step, the same way we have, we have seen, we have two arrays, we have to merge. When we merge, this will become three, five. And that is what I replace my original array with. So the, this array becomes three and five. Very similarly, two, six remains two, six. And then once I have three, five and two, six, then I merge them to find two comes first, then comes three, then comes five, then comes six. And this becomes my actual sorted array, which I replace this with. Just out, out of curiosity, why do we divide them into equal halves? Although in the end, we move to single elements and merge them in sorted order. Can't we take pairs in the array and do the same way of merging? Let's say I have more numbers, right? So imagine 
I had five, six, eight, one, two, thirteen, fifteen, twelve, three. How many do we have? We have four. And let's imagine I remove twelve from here. Question is, if we have to sort anyway, why don't we take pairs by pairs, right? So let's let's just take pair five, six, eight, one, two, thirteen, fifteen, three, and let's just first sort them. So we we end up sorting them, and for example, we end up finding that this is five six. This becomes one eight. This is two thirteen, and this becomes three fifteen. Right now, the problem is like we've done pair by sorting, but the array is still not sorted. Then we'll have to do sorting of four four elements each. Right? How do we do that? We say that you know what, like there are first four elements here. The first half is sorted. The second half is also sorted. Let's merge somehow. Which again, I'll take another array and then I'll merge etc. So this will get sorted. Then I'll do again the same thing, which is I take four elements. Half is sorted, half is sorted, and I'll do the same thing. And then finally, I'll look at all of the eight elements. So you're going just in the reverse order. What I just said, you're just going in the reverse order, which is also correct. It's just a harder to code because the previous approach can be coded using recursion, which I'll just show. Uh, in your approach, what you're doing is you're building bottom up, right? Like you're sort of saying that let's first sort all pair of elements. Once they are sorted, then let's look at all four size elements. Great. Once they are done, then let's look at all eight eight size chunks. Once they are done, then look at all eight, sixteen size chunks, and then thirty two size, and then sixty four, and so forth. Right? And finally, I'll, I'll have the entire array sorted, which works. It's just harder to code. What I said was the other way around. That instead of going from one to two to four to eight and so forth, let's start from n. Let's divide that into n by two parts. Then n by four, then n by eight, and I'll finally reach the one part anyway. And then my recursion function will keep returning, and I'll have the eventual answer. So if you look here, my recursive function, this will do the same thing. My recursive function here will also do the same thing. Let me also just write it as merge step. So what is happening is, if I have an n-sized array. I'm dividing it into two arrays of size n by two each, n by two each. I'm sorting it using the same methodology, which is this n by two will create arrays of size n by four, n by four. Here also again same n by four, n by four. These will create arrays of size n by eight, n by eight. Again n by eight, n by eight. Same thing. And this n by sixteen, n by sixteen, and so forth. How many levels will you have here? I mean, we go from n to n by two, n by two to n by four, n by eight, four to n by eight, n by eight to n by sixteen. How many levels? Log n levels, right? So in every level, n is becoming half of what it was. As we have seen the same pattern in binary search, etc., etc. I mean, as you go, if n is becoming half of what it was, it takes you log n steps to finally come to one. At every step, what is happening? I At every step, basically, I have n by two, n by two sorted array. I'm merging them, which takes me order n time. This takes me order n time. n by two plus n by two, I order n. What happens on this level? These two guys merge and takes it takes them n by four plus n by four, which is n by two time. These two guys merge and it takes them n by two times. If you add them up, it will take you order n time on this level as well. Very similarly, on the other level as well, where you have n by eight, there are eight instances of n by eight. It will again take you order n time. So the total time taken. On every level, it takes you order n time. There are log n levels. The total time taken is n log n. That is an intuitive way to understand. I can also explain the mathematical way of explaining this. But the intuitive way of understanding the time complexity of merge sort is that on every level, you're doing one merge. The merge is order n. Number of levels is log n. And therefore, in fact, if you look at Arvind's approach, if you were to implement it, in every iteration, what you're doing is you're first creating pairs and you're merging the pairs. Takes you order n time. Then you're looking at all four four blocks, right? Like blocks of four each. In one order n operation, you would have sorted blocks of four each. Then in again one order n operation, you would have sorted blocks of eight eight each. And you'll keep doing that till you cover the entire array. So the number of steps to cover the entire array would be log n. And every single iteration is an order n iteration. So it takes you an order of n log n. I can explain the math behind it as well. Is it n log n in every case? Best case is sure. I mean, you can probably put an optimization there that if the array is already sorted, if a half is already sorted, you don't need to do all of the splitting, etc. So best case, you can still make order n. But yes, worst case is order n log n. Worst case, it takes you order n log n. And you can put a check to make sure that you're not doing the entire splitting, etc. If the array is already sorted.
All right. What is the space complexity of MERSORT? So if you look at the implementation here, we are allocating this additional memory temp to calculate this merged part, right? Why? Because when we are merging two sorted arrays, we need this temporary space where we put in the result, which is not a part of the original array. This is additional space. If I have to look at this tree, in this n by 2 part, I would have taken a temp array, which was of size n by 2. Here, I would have taken a temp array, which was of size n by 2. In fact, let's look at total space allocation, right? So this n by 2 will make a call to n by 4, 8, etc., etc. So this, this is a log n stack memory space. Plus, in each of these, so imagine I was sorting this array of size n. This will end up calling for n by 2. This will end up calling for n by 4, n by 8, and so forth. In each of this, I would have a temp array allocated, which will be freed as long as, I mean, I fill it back, right? So this temp array here is of size n by 4. As soon as I am done, then this will be freed. Then I come back here. Here it will be of size, additional size of n by 2. As soon as I'm done, it will be freed. And then I'll come back here and I'll have an temporary additional size n. So maximum space that I end up using additional is I have log n stack of recursion. Plus I have this additional order n size array that I might have used, which is my temp array. So order n extra space is what we end up using apart from the array space. So space complexity becomes order n. Time complexity becomes order of n log n. There's one more way to, by the way, calculate time complexity. I mean, if you assume that the time taken for sorting an array of size n is tn, then tn is nothing but I'm saying first sort array, first half of the array, then sort second half of the array, which is also of size n by two, and then merge them, which is it takes you some n time. Let's say let's say it takes you n time. This is basically saying two times tn by two plus n, right? If you break it down further, your n by 2 is 2 times t n by 4 plus n by 2, which is the same as 4 times t n by 4 plus 2n, which you'll see will finally come to 2 to the power i t times n by 2 to the power i plus n into i. I mean, this is just a little mathematical. Therefore, I explained the intuitive way first. Which, I mean, if you want this to become equal to 1, i becomes log n. So you have n into t times 1 plus n into log n, which is n log n. This is what how master's theorem actually works. Uh, I'm just elaborating that, expanding the, that equation. Even if you don't know about master's theorem, that is fine. As long as you understand the intuition of why it is n log n. Because in the recursion tree, there are log n levels. On every level, I'm using order n time. Right? So time complexity becomes order of n log n. Space complexity becomes order of n. Uh, is there any way without using the extra space? Uh, so actually merging two sorted arrays without using extra space in order n is not possible. That becomes the, the blocker, right? So if you can merge the array in place without using extra memory, then your problem would have been sorted. But the problem is like merging without extra memory is, is the issue. All right, does this make sense? Merge sort, space complexity, time complexity, all of that. All right. Today we'll be talking about quick sort and today we'll be solving a lot more problems actually. By the way, I just wanted to maybe also share one news with all of you. Today was the first case when one of the fellow students at Scalar has gotten an offer as a CTO at one of the energy companies, which is a fairly big company now, right? And that the reason why I'm sharing this with all of you is to show you that, look, I mean, learning matters. I mean, and, and like, again, I can't disclose the exact salary of the person, but it is, it is in a few CRs. We are not talking about lakhs, right? So the thing that matters at the end of, I mean, that is basically the, the North Star for all of us. He is, he is 30 something, but like we all should focus on the learning aspect as long as we do that eventually all of us will succeed. We'll go and build really, really great things in the future. He is part of Scalar Academy and not Scalar Plus. And I can't disclose the name of the company. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure like that news will come out later on. It will be shared with all of the community as well. Uh, once he joins, it's still sort of confidential. 
but just letting you guys know i mean look it is important that all of us focus on learning as long as we do that i mean obviously like what do you find later on is is going to be a function of what you know at present plus like some bit of experience i mean so again just to also elaborate this person is not somebody who is very young as i said like he's 30 plus already has more than 7 8 years of experience actually has more than 10 years of experience but as long as you keep learning the right things you'll move keep moving forward right and that is all of us should just aspire to become one person better every day that being said back to <laughs> back to what is the agenda for today today we're going to actually talk about one sorting algorithm which is actually used in most libraries that you use be it in java or python or c++ the sort function that you use they all use a, a different algorithm which we will talk about today but instead of talking about the algorithm which is i believe not the right way to introduce a concept what i'm going to do is i'm going to give you a problem a real life problem that you may take an attempt at solving and then we'll use that to maybe introduce the approach so imagine this imagine um, you have a bunch of nuts and bolts let me just you have nuts and bolt right so nuts basically look something like this and then you have bolt that is basically a circle that fits into the nut the nuts and bolts and usually like they are created in pairs right so you have a nut of a size and then the bolt actually clearly fits if the nut and bolt are of the same size then they fit now imagine you have a lot of nuts and lots of bolts and you are given that every single nut is of unique size it is every single nut and bolt are of different sizes so none of them have the same size and you are also given that every nut has a corresponding bolt one fact that is given is every nut has corresponding bolt which means they both fit each other two is no two nuts have same size so they are all different sizes however it is very hard for you to just visually differentiate which one is bigger or which one is smaller so what do you do what you do is like if you pick a nut and you pick two bolts if the bolt is loose then you know that the bolt is bigger if the bolt is not going in then you know that the bolt is actually smaller now the problem is given that info can you sort all of the nuts and bolts in increasing order of their size with the right nut and bolt paired up currently they are all just in this array you have a table full of nuts and bolts you don't know which one is paired up with which, which which one right one is how can you arrange that and two is how can you do it as fast as possible L- let me explain again right so imagine this let's say i had only two nuts imagine i had this nut another nut and i had another bolt and then another bolt right now what i can do is i can pick let's say this particular one and i pick this one and let's say i try to match them there are following things that can happen one is these guys clearly fit in that case i know that this nut is to be paired with let's let's just call it bolt 1 bolt 2 this is nut 1 nut 2 if they fit then i know these guys are in the pair they are they belong together and then i can just compare the other bolt if it is smaller than this particular nut then it goes before this nut right if it is smaller otherwise if it is bigger it goes after and then the, we i definitely know that the pair for this this bolt is this nut right so i just put these two guys together either after or before depending on how it compares with this current nut so if i have to define the problem formally you can pick a random nut and x and you can pick a random bolt if you pick these two guys you will get either of the following result either you will get nx is equal to by which means both of these guys belong together or you will get to know that by the way this nut is smaller than bolt or you will get to know that nut is bigger than bolt these are the three results you can get you cannot compare nut with nut so for example i cannot get nx and ny and compare these guys i can't similarly i can't compare bolt with bolt this i can't do this i can't do however i can take a random nut and a random bolt and i can compare them does that make sense now it does right now i mean the question is how do i sort these guys how do i sort these guys when i can't really compare a nut with a nut and a bolt with a bolt the bolt size is not given to you i mean think of it like this right you have a table which is full of these nuts and bolts and there's only minor variation in the size what you should end up with for example in this case imagine that these guys were equal n1 and b2 was equal so i would put n1 and b2 together and assume that b1 was smaller than n1 so i would put n2 and b1 before this and i will return this list n2 b1 as the first entry n1 b2 as the second entry right so if you just compare with a bolt with a nut you do get the relation whether a nut is bigger than a bolt or not so imagine if this nut was paired with another bolt bz 
then you know that BZ is actually smaller than BY. So you can compare the pairs by picking nut from one pair, bold from another pair. There is no size given. The only way is you just pick a random nut and bold and then compare whether they one is smaller than the other or not. Let, let's actually look at how do we do that, right? So one is if I pick any random nut, let's say any, I mean, if you're given, let, let's say N different nuts, let's say I pick some random nut. Let's call that nut N, N1, right? What I can do is now I have a bunch of bolts. I have B1, B2, B3, B4, B5, till Bn. I can compare each of those bolts with this N1. And I'll basically get three kinds of bolts. There will be one heap of bolts, which are lesser, right? So there's one heap of bolts, which are smaller than N1. There is one heap of bolt that we will get. Let's call this bolt bigger, which is bigger than N1. And there is exactly one bolt that I will get, which will be equal to this nut, correct? If I compare all of the bolts with this nut, I'll get three sets, one bolt, which is equal, and then a set of bolts that are smaller and set of bolts that are bigger. How these guys compare amongst each other that I don't know, but essentially I, I do know which bolts are smaller than this nut, which bolts are bigger than this nut that you guys all agree with. So if I pick any random nut, I can distribute all of these bolts this way. And very similarly, now that I know that this bolt is the same as this nut, so I can pick all of the nuts, which were N2, N3, N4, N5, N6, N7, N8, till Nn. And I can say, let me compare all, all of these nuts with this bolt, right? I'll get some nuts that are smaller. So I'll basically have some of these guys. If I compare with this bolt, I'll get some nuts here. Let me take a different color. Some nuts here, which are smaller. Some nuts, which are bigger. The equal one is already here. So you'll not find anybody who's equal. So what we have done is we first started with one nut, right? And then we use that to break all of the bolts in three parts. One bolt, which is equal, a lot of bolts that are smaller, a lot of bolts that are bigger. And then once we found the equal bolt, we use that bolt to actually split the nuts, remaining nuts into two parts, smaller nuts and bigger nuts. Now, what I know is all of the bolts, smaller bolts will have their corresponding nut somewhere here. I mean, basically now I have three sets, right? I have a set of nuts and bolt, which are smaller and they, they are guaranteed to be present in pairs here. Same guarantees holds here. Then I have one pair, which is N1, B1. And then I have set of nuts and bolt that are bigger. Now I can actually recursively solve, sort this set separately and I can sort this set separately. But my problem has now reduced to sorting smaller set of nuts and bolts. And if, if obviously, if this had only had one element, then I know that this, they are already sorted. I don't need to touch them. This is exactly how quick sort work. I'll, I'll introduce it very, very shortly. But uh, let me take a few examples just to show how is this working. And that will give you a sense of like, or sort of some intuition behind how quick sort works. So imagine I was given some random, let's say N1, N2, N3, N4, N5 nuts. And let's say I had random five bolts as well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to mark, let's say hypothetically, what the process is going to be like. So what I'll do is I'll, in step one, I'll pick this nut and I'll say, let's compare it with all of these five bolts and we'll find some bolts that are bigger, some bolts that are equal. Imagine hypothetically, let's say N1 was equal to B3 and imagine that B2 and B4 were smaller bolts and we found out, let's say that B1 and B5 are bigger bolts. Very similarly, then what I did was that I picked B3 and I started comparing B3 with, with all of these guys, N2, N3, N4 and N5. And I would come to know whether they're bigger than B3 or smaller than B3. All of the bolts, again, let's say hypothetically N2 and N3 were smaller and let's say N4 and N5 were bigger. Now the problem becomes that I, I know that N1, B3, whenever I sort is going to be the third element in the set. I have two elements before. I don't know their order, but those two elements have basically B2, B4, N2, N4 as two pairs. And I have two elements after, which is B1, B5, N4, N5 that are yet to be sorted. That is after, right? However, this portion is fixed. 
I don't need to change this portion. It is in the right position. It is where it should be. I do not need to change this position. This is already in its correct position. So then what I do is I recursively sort the first half. And then once this is sorted, then I'll go to the second half. How do I sort the first half? I again do the same thing. I say, let's pick a random nut. Let's say I pick N2 as the random nut. And I compare B2 and B4 with it. Oh, sorry. This should be, this should be N3. So B2, B4, N2, N3, B1, B5, N4, N5. Right. Okay. So then I, let's say pick N2 as the, as the one nut, right? And I compare B2 and B4 with it. I know that I don't need to compare B1 and B5. They're definitely bigger. I'll deal with them separately. I'm only concerned with sorting these two pairs. So I compare B2 and B4. And hypothetically, let's say I find that N2 is the same as B4. So I find these guys are equal. And hypothetically, let's say I find that B2 was bigger. I know that B2 will be paired up with N3. So I put it as it is. These guys are sorted now. Then I have N1, B3. And I do a very similar process here as well. I pick any one of these guys. Let's say I pick N4. And hypothetically, let's say N4 pairs up with B1. And I find that B5 is smaller. So therefore, B5 will come here. The pair of B5 is N5. That will come here. So this becomes your sorted array totally. Now, this process where I actually picked one element and I started comparing all of the remaining elements with it is called choosing a pivot. So while this is a more complicated case, let me take an example of sorting an array of integers. And I'll, I'll show you with that. Imagine, let's say my array was 5, 2, 1, 8, 6. And one of B3 is largest. That means this set does not exist. The set is empty. But the remaining set is still smaller set than what you began with. It has now n minus one bolt and n minus one nuts. So you still have a smaller problem to solve. So in every step, you're reducing the size of the problem. So that is actually your worst case where you will end up taking n square time. But still, I mean, that still gets you to, to your answer. So at each step, one of the pair comes at its right place. Let me, let me just elaborate that with this array as well. So in the quick sort process, what you do is you pick one element, any random element to be the pivot. For example, I say that I want to pick five as the pivot. So what you do is the first part is you count how many numbers are smaller than five, right? So you basically, let's say have two is smaller, one is smaller, eight is six are not smaller. That means the right position of five is the third position because there are two numbers smaller. So what you do is you put five here. One probably comes here. So your array is basically one, two, five, eight, six. And then once you have put five in the right position, then you compare all of the remaining elements. What you want is all of the smaller elements are on the left side. All of the bigger elements are on the right side, which in this case has automatically happened. But in case it wasn't, what you would do is you would start from here and you would start another pointer from here. The first number that you find on the right side, which is actually smaller than five, you'll stop there. You'll try to find the first number from on the left side, which is actually bigger than five. You'll stop there and then you swap those two guys. So in order n, you'll be able to get to a place where all smaller numbers are on the left side, all bigger numbers are on the right side. And then the problem becomes that five is in the right position. Now, as long as I can sort the left side of the array and right side of the array separately, my entire array will be sorted. And that, that I can again do recursively. So in every step, when, when I choose a pivot, one number will come at the right position and it will divide the remaining array into two parts, two smaller subsets that need to be sorted. Do we have to take pivot as the middle to make the swap easier? I mean, so if the thing is when you're choosing the pivot, you don't know which one is the middle element. I mean, you basically start with choosing a random number as the pivot in the array that you have to sort. If you are unlucky, then it would turn out to be one of the numbers, which is either the highest number in the array or the smallest number in the array. If you are, I mean, if it is just very, very random, chances are you'll find a pivot somewhere towards the middle. I mean, let me actually go step by step. Does the nuts and bolt approach make some sense? Basically picking one nut, comparing all of the bolts with it to divide them into smaller heap, bigger heap, equal to, and using the equal to bolt to divide the remaining nuts into a smaller heap, bigger heap, equal to. And I know that the equal to part is in the right position. Now I need to sort the smaller heap of nuts and bolts separately, bigger heap of nuts and bolts separately. Let me take another example of this. Actually, uh, here there was a swap. Let's see what kind of thing we can do where we would need a swap. Imagine I still have five as the first element. Let's say there is six, eight, one, and two. Hypothetically, let's say this was the array. And again, we chose five to be the pivot. If five is the pivot, the first step, let's count the number of numbers smaller than five. One and two. So that means five should come at position number three in the array. So five should come here. 
So what do I do? The quickest way is I just swap, right? So I just bring five here. I bring back eight here. So five comes here, eight comes here. I remove the circle. Now I know five is the pivot. What I want is all smaller numbers should be on the left. All bigger numbers should be on the right. Right now it is the opposite. So what do I do? I say that I'll start with a pointer on the left side. Let's call it start pointer. I'll also start with a pointer on the right side. Let's call it the end pointer. Or maybe we can just call it left and right. Both are also okay. Left and right. I compare the first number and I see whether it is in the right half or not. In the correct half or not, right? So 2 is smaller than 5. It should have been in the left half. So it is not in the correct half. So I make my right pointer wait here. My right pointer is currently pointing at 2. Very similarly, I start a loop on left to find the first number which is not in the correct half. In this case, the first number that I find, which is 8, is not in the correct half because 8 is bigger than 5. It should have been on the right half. And then the first place wherever left and right is, I just swap them. So essentially, 2 comes here, 8 comes here. And I now know that these two guys are in the right half. So then I again start moving my left till I find the next number which is not in the right half, which is 6. So my left will, will wait at 6. Very similarly, I start moving right to find the next number which is not in the right half, which would be 1 and I'll just wait at 1. And I end up swapping 1 and 6. So 1 comes here, 6 comes here. So your right pointer will move from this position to this position. And your left pointer will move from this position to this position. If you add these guys up, you'll get total sum as n minus 1. n being the size of the array. This will help you shift all smaller elements to the left of the array, bigger elements to the right of the array. So if I have to write the steps of quicksort, one is choose any number randomly as pivot. And then once you have chosen a pivot, put pivot in the right position. For calculating the right position, you'll have to count numbers smaller than pivot. So this is one order n iteration. Third thing that you do is using left and right pointer, shift smaller numbers in left half, bigger numbers in right. So the fourth step is sort left part and right part separately. Can we optimize by choosing the correct pivot? The most optimal pivot is your median. Basically a number which can divide the array into two equal parts. That is the best pivot, right? Because then you're left with smaller arrays to sort. It is obviously faster to sort smaller arrays. However, the problem is like, it is very hard to know what is the median of the array. Why do, would you want to spend a lot of time finding out the median? So what Quicksort says is as long as you, your pivot choice is completely random, if it is completely random, then I mean, you're still fine. Average time, time complexity will, will still become n log n. All right, what is the approach behind Quicksort? Quicksort is essentially choose a pivot, divide the array into smaller numbers, bigger numbers, sort the smaller numbers separately, sort the bigger numbers separately, your array will automatically be sorted. Divide and conquer. Most of the library functions that you use, they use Quicksort and they choose pivot randomly. And I'll explain like why randomly still works here. The one thing which you will notice is in this entire process, we have not used any additional memory. We did the swapping, etc., in place. So we have not created a duplicate array. All of this is happening inside the same array. That is important because while merge sort also is order of n log n, which we will see with quick sort, merge sort uses additional space or it requires this separate array where you merge the two arrays, which is additional memory required. So one of the reasons why merge sort is not used extensively, but quick sort is used extensively is because quick sort does not use additional space. The worst case of quick sort is still really bad. Uh, collections, you also use quick sort. Now, since we don't have random access, how does it work? For example, if you use what you're saying is, let's say if you've implemented the list with a link list, then how would the, the quick sort sort of work there because here, I mean, if you see in the quick sort, you're not really doing random access. All of your access is still sequential, right? For example, let us go step by step. We say, let's choose any no number randomly as pivot. I can take a loop till the number because I'll still have anyhow have to take an order n loop throughout the entire list to count the number of numbers smaller so that I know what is the right position. I'll have to do that anyway. So I take a linear loop to get to the number. That's fine. I take a linear loop to find out the right position. And again, I do the same thing. I anyhow have to split the numbers into left and right pointer. I can take a linear loop for that. So in all of this case, if you see, we, I'm not doing any random access. I'm actually going step by step in a linear loop. 
let's do what is the time complexity analysis what is let's do what is best case what is worst case and what is average case what is the best case with quick sort what is the best pivot you can choose assuming that the array is not already sorted what is the best pivot you can choose median let's say you were very lucky and you were choosing the middle element all of the time what would happen is if you were given a array of size n you would put the median in the right place so median would be in the right place and then you will have an n by 2 size array here n by 2 size array here you'll need to sort these separately so what happens is exactly like merge sort you start with an array of size n this reduces to sorting array of size n by 2 twice one on the left side one on the right side that becomes i mean basically time to sort an array of size n is the same as 2 times tn by 2 plus order of n for for merging and this basically comes to order of n log n so if you are choosing the median as the pivot all of the time then you end up sorting it in order of n log n if you are choosing the median as the pivot every time and and by the way this is uh, Probably not the best case. Best case is in the array is already sorted. Best case meaning that if you're given an array and then your median is the best, right? So you end up sorting in order of n log n. What is the worst case? I mean, what is the worst kind of pivot you can choose? One end when your pivot is actually on one of the ends. So what happens is in one step, in order of n, what you would do is you'll end up choosing a pivot that is on one end. So your pivot is here, and you'll find all of the other remaining n minus one elements are on one side, which means that in one order n loop you have only fixed the position of one element and you still have n minus 1 numbers to be sorted and if you keep doing that again and again if you're extremely unlucky your time to sort will become n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2 plus n minus 3 plus n minus 4 which is order of n square so your worst case becomes order of n square if you are very very unlucky that you are choosing the extremes as your median all of the time does this make sense why is the best case order of n log n why is the worst case order of n square just in terms of how we choose the pivot if we are really really good with choosing the pivot then we end up choosing the median as the pivot that means it divides the array into two equal halves which is exactly the kind of thing that we did in merge sort right like you start with an array of size n you end up with two equal halves of size n by 2 n by 2 each which you have to sort which again will split further into n by 4 n by 4 if you again choose median this tree will have log n number of levels on every level you're doing on order n operation so your becomes the best case if you're choosing the best pivot then it becomes n into log n if you are choosing the median as a pivot then you'll have order of n log n complexity that is clear to everybody right okay what is the worst case worst case is when you're choosing one of the pivot your time to solve or sort n sized array is in order n you were able to fix the position of one element the other n minus 1 still need to be sorted and if i just expand on what tn minus 1 would look like it would be n minus 1 plus tn minus 2 which is what n plus n minus 1 plus what is tn minus 2 n minus 2 plus tn minus 3 which if you keep adding up will become n square i was not talking about the best case case really i was talking about given an array if let's say i had flexibility on what i choose as the median so what kind of pivot what kind of pivot will give me the best complexity what kind of pivot will give me the worst complexity that was what i was looking at right so what is the average case complexity one algorithm that i wanted to address which is called bucket sort if you guys remember we did something called a count sort right which is when the elements were in limited range we would just count the frequency of elements and that would help us sort bucket sort is a slight variant of that variant being that if i can categorize numbers into buckets where i know the buckets are sorted in, in some fashion then the sorting problem becomes easier for me radix sort is exactly bucket sort for example hypothetically let's say you had a lot of numbers so let's say i had 456 923 let's say i had 150 let's say i had 268 and let's say i had 12 and maybe i also have 950 now imagine i was to create 10 buckets 10 buckets bucket 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 the, the most significant digit of the number let's say the 100th place of the number assuming that all of the numbers are smaller than 1000 they can be 1 million 10 million as well so then we'll choose the most significant bit and we'll keep it the same position for all all numbers if i do that then i know that 423 will go in the fourth bucket 
most significant digit is four. Most significant digit here. Assuming all of for all of them, the most significant digit that we're looking as at is the third digit from the back. So nine twenty three will go in the nine bucket. One fifty will go in the one bucket. Two sixty eight will go in the two bucket. Zero one two will go in zero bucket. Nine fifty will go in the nine bucket. What I know is now if I start going bucket by bucket and I have sorted the numbers within a bucket, if I have sorted the numbers within a bucket, and if I just start picking numbers from here and appending them. Then I end up getting the entire array sorted. Why? Because I definitely know that any number that is starting with zero is definitely going to be smaller than any number starting with one. So dividing them into buckets and then sorting the buckets within themselves—I mean, sorting the numbers within a single bucket—that helps me reduce the complexity to some extent. And I'll show you an example of that to a major degree, which is what is called as radix sort. But the idea is, if I can break them into buckets, where buckets already have some ordering defined. Then I can my job becomes just simply appending the numbers in the buckets, and that might give me a sorted array. And I'll give you a few examples to sort of talk about what bucket sorting is, and we'll do one problem on bucket sorting as well, which is a hard problem, but we'll do that. What kind of data structures can I use for buckets? Think of them as, for example, vector of vector of int. So, for example, your v of zero is a vector of numbers. V of one is also a vector of numbers, and and so forth. So the concept of bucket sort is very simple. If you can split numbers into buckets, where buckets themselves are ordered in some fashion, then I can sort numbers within the buckets, and then I merge them. That gives me a sorted answer. If numbers are not in the same order, how do we put them in bucket? So even here, if you see, like twelve was not of the same order. I just added another zero to get it to the same order. So imagine I have numbers as nine hundred fifty, one, twelve, nine twenty-three, two fifty-six. I'll just add zero. To make sure they are all of same length, how do we keep the value sorted in one bucket? I mean, within the bucket, I mean, just use quick sort or whatever kind of sorting you want to use there. Insertion sort, quick sort, whatever you want to use. Let's take an example. I mean, bucket sort alone isn't enough. Bucket sort paired up with a few observations is actually very powerful. So one observation that leads to sorting algorithm is called radix sort. The way radix sort works. Imagine again, you have a bunch of numbers to sort. Right? Again, I'll I'll pick. The same thing, which is let's say I have nine twenty three, nine hundred fifty. Let's say I have twelve. Uh, let's say I have the number one. Let's say I have number hundred. Let's say I have one fifty. Let's say I have six fifty and six eighty eight. Hypothetically, let's say I have a bunch of these numbers. So what radix sort says is, look, I mean, at the end, if I was at the end, let's make all of these guys equal length. So add zeros wherever applicable. If all of these numbers are of equal length, then at the end, most significant bit, this bit, is the most important bit. Obviously, if the most significant bit of one number is uh, smaller than the other number, then the overall number is definitely smaller. It is only a problem when they both are equal. Then I will look at other digits. So I know that. So what I want to do is I want to start sorting digit by digit with. Most significant digit being the last place where where I sort because I know this is the final step. So what radix sort does is it says let's start with the least significant digit. Let's first sort based on this. And what do I do? I basically create again ten buckets corresponding to zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I will first look at the last digit. Based on that, nine twenty three goes here. Nine fifty goes to zero. Zero one two. Goes to two, zero zero one goes here. Hundred goes to zero. One fifty goes to zero. Six fifty also goes to zero. Six eighty eight goes here, and then I append these guys. Right? What will happen once I have done this step? All of the numbers will be sorted by their last digit. So I get nine fifty, hundred, one fifty, six fifty, zero zero one, zero one two, nine twenty three. And six eighty eight. I sorted numbers based on their last digit. Now let's look at the next digit. I repeat the same process again, but with the next digit. Now I'm going to erase all of these guys from here. We are now going to look at the second digit. I say that now let's look at these numbers again one by one. But the second digit is what we are looking at. So nine fifty goes at five. Hundred goes at zero. Hundred and fifty goes again at five. Six fifty also goes at five. Zero zero one goes at zero. Zero one two. Goes at one nine twenty three nine twenty three goes to two and six eighty eight goes to eight. 
I'll again append these guys. What this would make sure is now everything is sorted based on the last two digits. So I append and when I append, I basically get 100, 001, 012, 923, 950, 150, 650 and 688. And now the last step is the magic step, which is where I look at the most significant bit. So I erase all of this again. I look at the most significant bit and I bucketize these guys based on the most significant bit. So 100 comes here, 001 comes here, 012 comes here, 923, 950, 150, 650 and 688. Now once I append them, all of the numbers should be sorted, which you would see 001, 012, 100, 150, 650, 688, 923. 950. Now this the final array that we've gotten, this is sorted. What has happened? We can take MSB directly. The only problem is then within the bucket, if you have multiple numbers and think of like when you have a million numbers, right? You only have 10 buckets based on MSB. That means every bucket on average will have 100,000 numbers. And if you go to solve or sort of sort each of those buckets separately, it will take you a lot of time. But here, I can sort the entire array by doing this function, the number of digits, number of time. So imagine all of the numbers had five digits. I'll do this operation five number of times and my entire array would be sorted in every, for every single digit, for every single digit, I am putting them in buckets, 10 buckets, and then I'm appending them, which is an order N operation, right? So my total amount of time taken is order N into max number of digits space is assuming that we are taking a vector of vector. The total space taken by vector of vector combined across all of this is order of n. So I'm using an order on n extra space. Actually order of 10 plus n. This is order n. Do we need to compare an element with the existing elements present in the bucket? No. Right now, it, because the moment you start doing that, then your complexity increases. Currently, it is just very dumb way of appending to existing numbers in the bucket. Why can't we take MSB to LSB? I mean, when we start with MSB in the first step, we would definitely have put the bigger numbers to the first half of the array, the smaller numbers to the second half of the array. That I completely agree with. In fact, numbers would be sorted based on their first digit. But as you go to the second digit within these numbers, if the sorting is happening in the right way or not, because you will have, let's say you look at second digit as zero, right? Now, some of those zero numbers will come from the numbers that had the first digit as nine. Some of those zero numbers will come with some numbers where the first digit was six. For example, let's, let's look at this example itself, right? If I started from MSB, then what would have happened? Let me erase this. My first two numbers will go in the nine bucket, 923, 950, 012, 001, 100, 150, 650, and 688, which is great. Now, if I append them, then I get this. This is almost sorted. The problem is when I move to the next digit, it's then that it becomes a problem because 012 will come here, 001 will come here. Now 100 will also come here. However, I know that 100 should only come after 012. When I will merge, then I wouldn't know how to maintain this ordering. I mean, I'm using digits here. You can do the same thing for bits. They will only have two buckets, zero and one. Here I have 10 buckets. You'll only have two buckets when you're dealing with bits. When you go from LSB to MSB, that means MSB takes higher priority because it is the last deciding factor. When you go from MSB to LSB, then LSB starts taking higher priority. So time complexity is N into number of digits. If D is the number of digits, that is your time complexity. Usually the number of digits is the same order as log N. It's actually log N to the base 10 N being the maximum number in the array, number in array. So, I mean, um, usually radix sort is good number to know and good approach to know because this can be applied at multiple places. That being said, again, like not very commonly used because n log n, you can just directly use your sort function. Why would you go and take the pain of implementing radix sort when it has very similar time complexity? If all of what we have discussed till now, if that makes sense, I'll give you one problem which will actually make the bucket sort even clearer. The reason why we have bucket sort. Explain the time complexity again. So if you look here, what do we, what are we doing? We are taking digit by digit, right? So first we look at the last digit and for that digit, what do we do? We put them in these 10 buckets, right? So basically what happens is what is the last digit of any number? Let's say I, I go, I basically, I do this, right? I say 
i goes from 0 to n and we calculate the last digit digit is equal to array of i mod 10 that is your last digit and then you put it in the, the same bucket so for example let's say if you have bucket array you say bucket of digit dot add ai right you do that all of this is order n process for the last digit correct and then eventually i'll put i'll basically look at numbers in every bucket and i'll keep appending them in another array all of this is order n process i'll have to do this for every digit correct so if all numbers have let's say five digits then my complexity would be n into five because for every digit i'll do an order n operation if every number has d digit then it becomes order of n into d how n log n is similar to n into d so n into d makes sense right order of the algorithm is n into d that makes sense correct okay now what is d what is the like given a number x what is the number of digits that x would have how do you find that basically how do you find number of digits you basically divide x by 10 you check if it is zero yet then you again divide it by 10 further this is 10 power 2 you, then you divide x by 10 power 3 x by 10 power 4 10 power 5 and so forth right when x by 10 to the power i is zero which is like now 10 bar i has become bigger then that is where you have the number of digits okay if i just put it like this i mean basically if x has i digits then x is approximately equal to 10 raised per i approximately which means if i take log 10 on both sides then i basically get i is equal to log of x that you agree so if if there is a number x then x has basically log base 10 x number of digits so therefore i'd say like whatever is the highest number in the array then d is basically log of that highest number so your d is almost the same as n log x x being the highest number so bucket sort is more generic right like bucket sort just says hey look my fundamental is you can create any sort of bucket you want you can create a bucket of all numbers from 1 to 100 all numbers from 100 to 1000 all numbers from 2000 to 3000 you could create any bucket that you want as long as it covers all range you put numbers in the bucket where you know that every number in bucket 1 is going to be smaller than every number in bucket 2 so you just bucketize these numbers you sort them separately and then you append that becomes bucket sort. It is very generic. Radix sort is using bucket sort in one way. Why this type of bucketing works? Going for all positions instead of just MSB or LSB. Let's say if you just go for MSB, there wherever two numbers have different MSB, most significant digit. There, I mean, you probably can only do with most significant digit. The problem is there will be a few numbers that will have the same most significant digit. In fact, there are only 10 possible most significant digit, right? So if you have, let's say, 1,000 numbers, then on average, you will have 100 numbers in every bucket, right? For example, here as well, I had 950 and 923. They'll all go to the 9 bucket. Now, how to actually decide the ordering between these? In fact, if you have a lot of numbers in the bucket, then how do you figure out the ordering between those? That is not clear. So therefore, you can't decide only based on most significant digit. You'll need to somehow sort these guys within the who have the most significant bit as nine as well, right? Internally, you'll need to sort them. So there are two ways. One is like you just say, I'll bucketize based on the most significant digit and I will sort each bucket, right? So what happens is if I had N numbers, then on average, each of the buckets will have N by 10 numbers. To sort them, I'll take N by 10, log N by 10, and I'll have 10 such buckets. So I'll finally multiply by 10. This will give me N log N by 10, which is the same as N log N. So I end up reaching the same algorithm, which I have anyhow done before. This does not seem to be an improvement. So therefore I said, like, can I improve further on it? And, and there we said, maybe if instead of saying that we'll sort the numbers in the same bucket, if we could do bucket sort multiple times in a way where at the end of it, all of them would have been sorted, then that would be nice. So I say, you know what, like for the sorting based on the most significant bit, one thing is if I can somehow reach a state where numbers with the same most significant bit, they are already sorted in some way, that would be awesome. But to sort the numbers with the same most significant bit, for example, if you remove the most significant bit, you'll need to sort them by the remaining bits. There also, if you just again break it down recursively, you'll reach the same state. Like you'll first have to sort based on the least significant bit, then the least significant and most significant together. And then the last three together, last four together and so forth. Uh, in Radix, you have log base 10 of not the number of elements. I mean, so in n log n, n is number of elements. This is log base 10 x, which is the highest element in the array. This is not the number of elements. This is highest element in array. 
two different things. But yeah, I mean, um, in, in cases of log n, if you have, let's say, 1 million entries, 10 plus 6 entries or 10 plus 7 entries, the log n is typically 20, 22, 24. In the case of numbers, the number of digits is probably still 8 or 9. So it can perform twice as faster. If max is less than n, go for radix or that, that I wouldn't say. If your log of 10 max is less than, in fact, significantly less than log n, then go for radix or. Okay. In case of integer, we could use radix. That's why I said, right? like if your log of max is less than log of n, you could use radix that might run just a little, slightly faster. Even if you go with bits, yes, you will eventually end up sorting. Just that the number of iterations will be more. All right, let's move to the next problem. Imagine you're given a bunch of numbers, which are not sorted, by the way. So let's say you have five, eight, three, one, six, some numbers, right? And, and you've been given this array that you cannot modify. So this is a constant array. Cannot be modified. Now what you need is that if this array was sorted, let's say if this array was sorted, the numbers would be 1, 3, 5, 6, 8. Actually, let me change the numbers a little bit. Let's say this number was 7, right? If this number was 7, then the numbers would be 1, 3, 6, 7, 8. And then in the sorted array, if you were to look at adjacent difference, the difference here is two, difference here is three, difference here is one, and difference here is one. There you have to find out what is the maximum gap between the numbers when the array is sorted. In this case, the maximum gap is three. So you say the answer is three. So given an array, how do you find this maximum gap if the given array is constant? And obviously like one answer is you make a copy of this array, you sort the array and you look at the adjacent differences and you take the maximum of that, which becomes time complexity order of n log n space complexity order of n. Can you do something better than this? I'll repeat the question once more. You're given an unsorted array. So the array is not sorted. What you have to find is if the array was sorted and if you looked at the adjacent numbers differences, what is the maximum difference you can find? What is the max gap you can find? Hi guys, in this video, let's talk about a problem, different bits, some pairwise. So this problem is also by the name Hamming distance. So basically it was asked in Google, in one of the interviews of Google. So let's see what the problem says. So we define f of x, y, f is a function that takes two parameters x and y. So it defines as the number of different corresponding bits in binary representation of x and y. So f of 2, 7 is equal to 2. How? So 2's representation in binary is this and 7's representation is this. And both of these numbers differ at two bit positions. So first is this and second is this, right? So therefore the answer is 2. Now you are given an array of n positive integers uh, from a1 till an. So you have to find the sum of f of ai comma aj for all pairs i and j such that ij lies between 1 to n and you have to return the answer modulo 10 to the power 9 plus 7. Right? So basically you are given in this case if you see you are given 1, 3 and 7. So basically what you have to do? You have to do f of you have to find f of 1 1 how will we find f of 1 1 so it's nothing but represented 1 in this form then again how many bits differ no bit right so it will give us 0 now what about f of 1 3 so this is 1 right and 3 is this so there is just one position at which both uh, numbers differ so therefore it will give us 1 what about 1 and 5 so I have 1 and 5 is there so there is again just one bit position at which they differ. So again, it will give me one. Now I have to find for one and five and five and one separately, right? That means they are counted different. Okay. And also I have to find uh, for uh, one and one, five and five, three and three. Uh, so I'm talking about this particular array. So basically if I have some i and j, then I have to calculate for both i, j and j, i. They are, they are considered separate as well as I have to calculate for i and i as well, right? So now let's see what, what we can do about this problem, right? Let's see what we can do about this problem. So the brute force approach says that 
we can pair up every element and find number of different pair of bits right so basically i can pair up every element every element right so i can have one one so what are the pairs i so these are pairs are already written one 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 three one five three one three three so i'll take them separately and then i'll go over these their bits and then i'll find that okay they differ at these many positions and i'll return so if i'm pairing up every other element with every other element so i'll get the time complexity of order of n square but let's see if we can do better than this so let's talk about the optimized version for that let's build some intuition so basically we are saying that we want to count the number of ones number of ones right so basically we want to count the number of bits that differ right at every place so i have let's i i places so i have 0 1 2 3 these many places are there in some number so i have right now my array is let's say so let me erase all of this let's say my array is 135 only right now and uh, so here I have 0, 0, 001, here I have 0, 011, 1, 1, and here I have 105. So that, uh, sorry, 101. 1. So basically, I what I have to do, I have to check ki, okay, for every pair, I have to check ki every at what ith position the bit differ. So I want to check that if some i if at some position bit bits differ or not. Now how can I check that? So basically if I find the ZOR, if I find the ZOR and if I get 0, I know uh, that means the bits are same, right? So bits are same, but that is not of my use, right? So I want to find where bits are different. So basically bits will be different, 0, 1 or 1, 0 when my ZOR will be 1, right? When my ZOR will be 1. So I'll be trying to ZOR the bits and I'll look that how many ones are there, right? So if I would have given let's say 0 and 1 only, so if this is only my number and the binary representation of them will be this only, right? So now I'll simply ZOR it and I'll get 1 and I'll simply return 1. But now, now let's say I have 0, so I have only single 0 but now I have let's say 3 ones, okay I have 3 ones, so 3 ones are there. So I'll do what now? So I know that one pair of 0 and 1 will give me one bit. It'll tell me that if there is one pair which is 0 and 1, it'll contribute to one bit, right? That it differs by one bit. So now it was included for one pair. So here I have one zero and let's say three ones. So what I'll do? What I'll do now? So I'll associate the zero with one. So now I know I want to find the different bit. Uh, so I'll be pairing up a different bit, right? I'll be pairing up 0, 1, right? 0 and 0 and 1 and 1 won't be of use to me. So I'll be pairing the 0 with this one, then the 0 with this one, then the 0 with this one. Essentially, what am I doing? I am trying to find the number of zeros, how many number of zeros are there. And I'll simply, I'll simply multiply it with the number of 1s that are there, right? So I'll simply multiply it with the number of ones that are there, right? So basically if I have three zeros and two ones, so what I'll be doing, I'll be associating every three zeros, I'll be associating all the three zeros with all the ones, right? I'll be doing this, isn't it? So I'll be associating all of them. So essentially I'm multiplying. So three into two, that means six. Six times they'll be associated and that means six number of ones will be there right so essentially now what can we do instead of forming the pairs i was given one three five instead of forming the separate pairs right instead of forming the separate pairs what i can do is i can simply represent them in binary form so what i'll get i'll get uh, for one i'll get zero zero one for uh, three i'll get zero one one then for five i'll get one zero one right so what I can do is I can simply check, I can simply go to every bit position, every bit position and I can count the number of ones and number of zeros. Then I can simply multiply them up because each of those pair will be giving, will be contributing one, one, right? It'll, they'll be contributing one to the answer. So I have this ith bit as zero, one, two. So let's see. Let's see with the example. Okay, let's see with the example. So basically, let's consider the uh, bit position one. Okay, let's consider this part. 
let me change the color so let's consider this part right so i have 0 1 and 0 so if i were taking them separately so let's say if i were considering 1 and 3 so i get bit of 1 so 1 th bit of 1 and 3 is nothing but it's a 0 and 3 is 1 right so now it will give me the zor of 1 that means these bits differ right and if i'll be taking for let's say 1 and 5 so here i have 0 and in 5 i have 0 so they give me 0 because they don't differ now if i have 3 and 5 so here 3 is 1 and 5 is 0 so they give me 1 that means they differ so since i'm associating every zero with every one so i'll simply count the number of at every ith position i'll simply count the number of ones and number of zeros so here my number of zeros is two and my number of ones is one so i'll simply do two into one that will give me two that will give me two now i also have to multiply it by two because since i'm considering just not one and three but I'm, i'll be considering three three and one also right so therefore they'll give me same result right so I'll simply multiply it by 2. So I'll be calculating for this bit position. Uh, whatever be my answer. Then I'll be adding it to this bit position. Whatever be my answer. Then I'll be adding to th this bit position. So essentially I'll be adding all the answers bitwise. I'll be checking all the answers bitwise. So let's see the pseudo code for this. So pseudo code goes something like this. So basically I have defined my mod because I have to do mod the answer with this at the end so I am given an array a right that will have the numbers that I have to find the humming distance for so initially my answer is at zero now I have kept a count for counting the number of zeros and number of ones right so here I have a count variable so I will traverse to all the bit positions so I am considering here that my, that my integer is of 32 bit right so I, I will be iterating to all the 32 bits right so it will start from the 0th position and it will be moving to the most significant bit position right so from 0 to 31 I'll be going then my count is initially 0 and uh, then then I'll be iterating over my array given array right then simply I'll be checking that what all bits are set so in case of 1 right so it's uh, zeroth bit is set so this will this will essentially give me what this will give me so uh, aj in this case is 0, 0, 001 let's say so i have 1 3 and 5 with me so let's say aj in this case is nothing but 1 and 1 left shifted by i that means 1 left shifted by sorry so this shouldn't have no, no it's right so basically i is 0 i is 0 right so 1 left shifted by 0 it gives me what it gives me 1 only right so i'll have this now it will give me 1 that means this bit position is set in this number so it will give me true and i'll simply count now my count becomes it becomes 1 right so i'll simply iterate it over for all the elements now i'll go for my j will become 1 and i'll be going to 3 so now i'll check that okay 3 is this and again 1 left shifted by 0 it will give me 1 only right so i'll get 0 0 1 and again this this will give me what this will give me 1 that means this bit is set so this will return me true and i'll simply count increment my count to 2 right and at the end of iterating all these elements after checking there the bit the unit positions bit right then i'll so i have my count of the number of ones right and the count of the number of zeros will be nothing but num uh, number of elements that are there in the array minus the count. So that will give me the count of the number of zeros. And since we have seen previously that if I multiply them together, then I'll be associating every zero with every one and that will give me the set bit, right? And I'll be multiplying that with two because I'll be considering ij as well as ji separately right? And then I'll be adding that to my answer and I'll also be doing the mod modding it with or uh, the mod which is here i have taken and then i'll simply return my answer so this is the approach and the complexity is going to be nothing but uh, the this loop will run for 32 times so it's going to be 32 and this loop will run for the number of elements in the array time so that means n so it's going to be 32 into n so thank you so much hello everyone Let's talk about a new problem today that is single number 2. 
What does this problem exactly says is that you will be given an array of integers and in this particular array every element is going to appear thrice except for one element which is going to appear only once and your task is to find that particular element which does not appear thrice. I hope the question is clear. Let's look at an example now to understand it better. Right? The first array contains all these elements right and in this array you will see that there is only one element that is 4 that is appearing only once in this particular array. So for this array for this first example input the output is going to be 4. Now for the second example you will see here that in the given array there is only one element that is appearing once and that element is 1 and this element needs to be returned. So for this particular question the output is going to be 1. Now let's try to make some observation to see how we will solve this question. Right. Now here let us look at every bit position. Here you will see that every number that appears thrice will either contribute to 3 1's or 3 zeros to that particular position. Right. Also, the number that appears once, let's say that number is x, will contribute exactly 1 0 or 1 1 to that particular position depending on whether it has 0 or 1 in that position, right? So, let's take an example to understand this. Let's say the array elements are 4 4 4 and 2, right? So, if I write the bit values of these numbers, I will get this. Right? So here you will see that since 4 is occurring thrice, it is contributing to 3 once at this particular bit position and since 2 is occurring once, so it is only contributing 1 0 to this position. Similarly for this uh, next bit position as well, 3 zeros are being contributed whereas only 1 1 is being contributed and here 3 zeros are being contributed from the 3 4s and 1 0 is being contributed from the number 2. So you will see at every bit position we will have either 3 x plus 1 zeros right or we will have 3 x plus 1 ones depending on the bit values of the number x right. So these 3 x right since every number is appearing in a multiple of 3 so this x could be any common number right uh, basically will be depending on the numbers which are occurring thrice and this will be the factor multiplied because each number is occurring thrice right so we will have these this factor 3x factor because every number is occurring thrice for the bit positions and this one factor will come because of a number which is uniquely occurring in the array right so using this observation we will solve our question right so let's take this example only and continue forward right the elements are 4 4 and 2 right so when I write these again right what I can just simply do is I can take the sum of the bit values at every position right I can just take the sum of the bit values at every position when I do this here I get 3 as my sum right I get 3 as my sum and when I take its mod by 3 only I will reduce or I will say get away from all the elements which are occurring thrice right I will get away from all these bits values so when I take the mod with 3 of 3 I get a 0 here right similarly the process is followed here when I take the sum I get 1 I take a mod with 3 I get 1 so this bit right this bit which is here is presenting the bit which is actually left out right because when I take the mod with 3 all the bits which are occurring thrice in a multiples of 3 are being cancelled out and the only left bit here is 1 right and here also when I take the sum I get 0 and when I take the mod with 3 I get 0 again right and when you get and whatever sum or whatever let's say the number you get in the end is actually the number which is occurring once right here I get when I take the sum of all the bit positions and then take a mod by 3 and in the end which is the number which is being formed is here 2 and I can simply say that this is the number which is occurring once.
Now, what will be the time complexity? You will see here that since we are, let's say we are taking n bit numbers, right? We are taking n bit numbers and we are going over each bit and calculating its sum. So the time complexity here is going to be order of n, right? And what about the space complexity? You will see here that let's say we are taking the only numbers or numbers up to 32 bits. So I can basically take an array. I can basically take an array of size 32 and store the bits or the sum of the bits after taking the mod at every ith index only. And since I am taking constant space of size 32, I can say that my space complexity is order of 32, which is equivalent to order of one only. So I am taking a constant space here to solve this question and a time complexity of order of n. I hope this question is clear to you. Thank you. Hi guys, in this video let's talk about the problem trailing zeros in factorial of n. As per the problem description, we are given an integer n and we have to return the number of trailing zeros in factorial of n. So the, please note that your solution should be in logarithmic time complexity. As per the problem constraints, n lies between 1 to int max. And in the example input, we are given n as 5. The example output is 1. Because the factorial of 5 is 120, here there is only one trailing 0. So therefore we will simply return 1. Now what is a trailing 0? So if you look, look at here and if you say there are 3 trailing zeros, then you are wrong. Why? Because a trailing 0 is the one which is at the rightmost end and that has no non-zero number to the right of it. So here there are only 2 trailing zeros. This will not be counted as a trailing 0. Let's see how can we approach this problem. So the brute force solution to this approach is that first we can calculate the factorial of n and then count trailing zeros in the result. So we can find the trailing zeros by repeatedly dividing the factorial by 10 till the remainder is 0. So what do we mean by that? So let's say the factorial, the n is equal to 10 and we'll do 1 into 2 into 3 into 4, into 5, into 6, into 7, into 8, into 9, and into 10. This will give us the number as 3628800. Now to find the trailing zeros, we will simply mod it with 10 to get the last, zero, uh, last digit. So we will get 0. Now since this is 0, we will simply increment our count. Next, we will divide the number by 10 to check the next number, the next digit, that means this number. So after dividing it, we will get nothing but 362880. So that means this, this digit has been removed, the last digit. Now we have got this. Now in the next iteration, we will simply do the mod of it to get the last digit. We got it as 0. So again, we will increment the count. Next, we will divide it by 10, right? So here we have divided it by 10. Again, find the mod of it and we get a non-zero number. That means here we have to stop because we have found out all the trailing zeros. And since we have got a non-zero numbers, that means we do not care what is there at the left of it, right? So we will simply stop and return the count. And this is what written in this snippet that we have uh, got the factorial as 120 of 5 when n is 5. So we will run our loop till this factorial is greater than 0. So if f mod 10 is equal to is equal to 0, we will simply count it up and we will divide f by 10. And else, if it's not 0, then we will simply break because we do not care what is there on the left. And we will simply return the count. But the problem with this approach is that the above method can cause overflow for even slightly bigger numbers as the factorial of a number is a big number. So even if the number is as small as let's say 22, then it's going to cause overflow because the factorial of a, even a small number is so big that it can it is certain to cause overflow, right? Therefore, this method is not the appropriate one. So what should we do now? Let's see what is a better approach. So how can we find a trailing zero in any number? So when a number is multiplied by 10, we get a trailing zero, right? So let's see 24. If it's multiplied by 10, we get 240. So, so here we have got a trailing zero just because we have multiplied it by, by 10. 
then we have let's say 240 and if we multiply it by 10 we get 2400 we have got another zero which is contributed by this 10 right so in 2400 if we do into 10 we will get 24000 so another zero which is contributed by 10 so here there's an observation to make that a number if multiplied by 10 uh, by 10 it will give us a trailing zero so for example if n is equal to 10 then we'll get this as the this is the uh, factorial of 10 so 1 into 2 into 3 into 4 into 5 into 6 into 7 into 8 into 9 into 10. The factorial is this and we can see that there are two zeros the two trailing zeros that means there must be number uh, two tens right there must be number of ten tens is equal to two that are contributing to two zeros. So how are we getting that? So one ten is here and 1 10 is formed by the combination of 2 and 5. So if you multiply 2 and 5, we will get 1 10, right? So this is 1 10 and we will get 1 10 from here. So that accounts to two zeros. So this tells us that if in a number, we look at the number of pairs of 2 into 5, then we will be able to count the number of trailing zeros. So if if in a number we look at that how many number of twos are there and how many number of fives are there then we take the smaller number we take the smaller power of a number let's say 2 is x and 5 is y so let's say y is smaller than x then we will take this the number of fives and that is going to be the answer why because let's see with the help of this example so in this case the power of 2 is 3 that means there are number of 2s as 3 so this is 1 and 2 into 2 gives us 4 so 1 2 3 so there are 2 3s and 5 is just 1 right so 5 will pair up with a single 2 to form a 10 therefore we will look at a lesser power from between 2 and 5 right now, do we really need to find the power of 2? Do we really need to find a power of 2? Well, here the observation is to be made that if we carefully look, then every second number is a multiple of 2 and every fifth number is a multiple of 5. So, if we are just able to find the power of 5, then they can pair up with that many number of 2s to produce a trailing 0. So let's look above uh, with the help of example. So in this case, every alternative number, so this is a multiple of 2, then this is a multiple of 2, 6 is a multiple of 2, 8 is a multiple of 2, then 10 is a multiple of 2. So at every second number, we are able to find the multiple of 2, which will give us uh, the number of 2s, right? That will give us the number of 2s. And every fifth number, every fifth number is going to be the uh, multiple of 5 that will contribute to a power of 5 right that will contribute to the power of 5 so as we can see that the number of multiples of 2 are greater than number of multiples of 5 that means we are going to get more number of 2s as compared to 5 so the number of 2s are going to be greater as compared to the number of 5 so we need not calculate the power of 2 instead we can simply calculate the number of fives or the power of five. So the problem has now reduced to finding the power of five. So this is a generalized equation. Like if we want to find a power of any number, then we can apply this formula. Here, our x is equal to five. So here we are actually trying to find the power of 5 and let this be any number. The remaining number which when multiplied with the power of 5 gives us factorial n. So how, how can we find the power of 5 or how can we calculate the number of 5? So for that purpose, we can simply take the floor of n by 5. For example, let's say n is equal to 11. Now n by 5 gives us 2.2. The floor of 2.2 is nothing but 2. That means the factorial of n is going to have two zeros. If we see here, then the factorial of 11 is nothing but 3, 9, 9, 1, 6, 8, double 0. So there are two zeros, the two trailing zeros. Because in 11, how many multiples of 5 are there? It's 5 and 10. 
So this has contributed to 1 5 and this has contributed to 1 5. Therefore, the total number of 5s are 2 and therefore the trailing 0 is trailing zeros are 2. But we are not through yet. Why? Because what about if n is equal to 28? What will happen in that case? So if n is equal to 28, so in, in, in 28 factorial, what are the multiples of 5? So the multiples of 5 are 5 itself, then 10, 15, 20 and 25. 5 will contribute to 1 5, then 10 will contribute to another 5, 15, uh, another 5, 20 will also contribute to 1 5. But here 25 is going to contribute to 2 5s. So by taking floor of n by 5 with the formula n by 5 and taking floor of it, we'll get 1 5, right? So if we do n by 5, that means 28 by 5, this is going to give us uh, 5 only, right? So that means here we are going to get just 5 zeros. But here we can see that there are 6 zeros in total. So for getting the left out 5, that means the 5, which is still to be counted, we'll have to divide it by next power of 5, which is 25. So now we actually have to calculate the power of 25. But now what about 128? So in that case, we'll get 125 as well in the multiples of 128 factorial, the multiples of 5 in 128 factorial. So it's going to be 5, 10, 15, uh, then 20, 25, 30 and so on. Then 125 as well, right? So which has, so 125 has three number of 5s. So after dividing by 5 and then by 25, we'll still be left with one more 5. So for that, we'll have to divide it with the next power of 5, which is 125 to remove the, to actually get the last, the third 5. Now, the formula has become, so the count of number of 5s in factors, in prime factors of n factorial, it's equal to floor of n by 5 plus floor of n by 25 plus the floor of n by 125 and so on till the number is greater than n by power of 5. So the time complexity of this approach is going to be order of log base 5n. What was the uh, question that we have to find the logarithmic time complexity and we have actually achieved that. So why? Because we are incrementingly dividing n by powers of 5. So first we are dividing n by 5, then n by 25, then n by 125, so on till n by 5 to the power k, which reduces to 1 and n by 5 to the power k is equal to 1. So n is equal to 5 to the power k. After taking log both sides, we will get k as log base 5n. That means log base 5n number of steps we have to take to get the solution and therefore the time complexity is going to be order of log base 5n. So this was it. Well, let's talk about the problem anagrams. So given an array of strings, you have to return all groups of strings that are anagrams. Represent a group by a list of integers representing the index in the original list. Let's look at this sample case for clarification. So an anagram is a word, a phrase or name formed by rearranging the letters of another. For example, spar and rasp. Both are anagrams because they have same set of characters. The frequency of characters are same, but only the order is different, right? Also note that all input characters, all inputs will be in the lower case. So for example, the input is cat, dog, god and TCA. So you have to return 1, 4 and 2, 3. So basically we have cat over here, then dog, then god and TCA. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, right? So cat and uh, TCA, they are anagrams because they have same set of characters, uh, even the frequency is same, but the order is different, right? So we have taken them together. That means 1 and 4 are together. Likewise, dog and god, they both are anagrams because again, the characters are same, the frequency is same, but the order is different. 
so two and three are anagrams so we have to basically return the answer like this now here in the explanation it's written that cat and tc are anagrams which correspond to index one and four dog and god are another set of anagrams which correspond to index two and three so the indices are one based the first element has index one instead of zero so let's see how can we approach this problem so the solution approach is that we can sort the given strings now how does this intuition came so basically from the question itself it said that anagrams are the words that have different order of the same set of characters so if we sort both the strings then if those strings become equal that means they are anagrams right because the order was different only but they have same characters so if we sort them then the strings which are anagrams will become equal and after that we can simply group them together right so here we have got the input as act dgo dgo and act so we have actually got them by sorting the individual strings given in the input so act represents cat dgo represents dog and dgo again represents god and act represent tca right so we have basically sorted them now we know that a group of anagrams can be represented by a key which is nothing but the string we get after sorting characters present in those strings right so here both cat and tca are anagrams and they can be represented by a string which is act so this we have got after sorting the characters present in them so now to group the strings basically we can perform hashing so how can we do that so a key can be the string right this unique string here the group of anagram is cat and tca right so we can have a unique string from for them which is act likewise for dog and god we can have a unique string as dgo so we can have a string and then we can have value as vector of int because we have to basically keep track of the indices of the anagrams right so now we will simply iterate over this array the sorted array so first we are at act then act is not present in our map so let's put the string and the index present is one so let's put it in the vector right now we are at dgo right so dgo is also not present in the map so let's put it in the map and the frequency uh, and the index present is two so let's put it in the vector now let's move ahead so dgo is already present in the map now let's include the index right so we have included three now we are at the fourth position and act is already present in the map so let's simply include the index so here we have the set of anagrams represented by their indices now the only task is uh, which is left that is to iterate over them and store it in the vector right so here we have vector 1 and 4 and we have a vector 2 and 3 so we will push them into a vector and we will simply return this in our answer right also we will only put the vector in this uh, resultant vector which have a size of greater than one right if a string has size of just so if the vector has size of just one then that means there is no anagram present for that particular string so we can simply ignore that right so now for the time complexity let's look at how we are going to sort the strings so for sorting the string basically we can perform counting sort we are able to perform counting sort because here the range of characters is fixed right which is 26 so we have 26 characters and therefore the complexity is going to be order of n into k where n is the number of strings and k represents the length of the longest string so the time complexity turns out to be order of n into k now if we don't want to sort the strings up then we have an another approach as well so we can actually maintain a frequency array right now what is a frequency array so let's suppose we have this as a string to form a frequency array of this 
we will have a character set we will have an array of 26 characters which have a range from 0 to 225 so why 26 because we are in the input we are given that only lowercase alphabets will be there right so we maintain a frequency array of 20 size 26 now basically we will be mapping a small a to index 0 then small b to index 1 and so on and we will be representing small z by index 25 so basically here we will be storing the frequency of all the characters so frequency of 0 denotes that it is the frequency of character a and so on here the frequency of a is nothing but 1 so we will put 1 over here then frequency so basically we will be iterating over the string so let's do that so here b is there and frequency of b is nothing but 1 so at index 1 we will put 1 now b is nothing but only 1 so let's put th uh, 1 at index 3 right then a is there so let's put 1 at index 0 then c is there so let's put 1 at index 2 and e is there so let's put 1 at index 4 initially all will be initialized to 0 so here's how we have built this frequency array and likewise we can do for this string as well and if the frequency array of both these strings come out to be equal that means they are anagrams of each other and likewise we can check this for all the strings given in the array so for this purpose we can basically have a map where the key can be instead of string it can be the vector of int so here it represents the frequency array the strings having the same frequency array will be pushed to this to the corresponding vector so let's see how we will maintain this so here we have cat right frequency array for cat will look something like this so here in this this will be the key right since this is, was not present so first we will be pushing it right and then we will be placing this one over here then we will be moving on to dog and frequency array of this will look something like this and we will simply put two over here right then we will move on to god right the frequency array of god will look something like this so we will put three over here and for tca the frequency array will look something like this so we will put four over here so that's how we can do it and then the last thing left will be to simply iterate this like we did previously and return the answer the time complexity for this approach is going to be so for creating frequency array for a string it's going to be order of k where k is the length of the string and the total time complexity will be order of n into k where n are the n is the number of the strings so it's going to be order of n into k so this was it Thank you so much. Hi guys, in this video let's talk about the problem longest substring without repeating characters. So given a string, we have to find the length of the longest substring without repeating characters. For example, the longest substring without repeating letters for this particular string is just ABC. Right? So if we look here, then this is the longest substring which is of the length 3 therefore we will simply return the length right this is 3 for uh, this particular string and for the next case which is this so the longest substring is the single letter b right because if we consider any other substring then b and b repeats so therefore there is just a single letter error and therefore we will return the length 1 so now how can we approach this problem let's see that so there is a brute force solution which says that we can consider all substrings one by one and check for each substring whether it contains all unique characters or not. So the total number of substrings are n into n plus 1 by 2 and to check if a substring contains all unique characters or not, we can keep a map of the visited characters. Therefore, this step can be done in a linear time. The total time complexity of calculating all the substrings and then checking if they contain unique characters or not so the time complexity is going to be order of n cube let's understand this with the help of an example so this is the string let's suppose a b c b e then what are the what are all the substrings that can be present with the starting from a so we can have just a then a b then a b c then a b c b then a b c b e right to check if the substring have 
the unique characters or not for that we can use either map or we can use a set if we use a map then we can have a mapping from character to integer which which will store the character in a present substring and the frequency of that character and in the set we can simply store the character only to check its occurrence now starting from a we can have all these uh, substrings so at present we have just a let's suppose this is the first string and for now we are just considering a set so a is not present so let's put a and le let's maintain a length variable so length at present the maximum length is just 1 right now let's move to the next substring so which is ab so right now ab a is not present so let's put into a into the set okay and b is not present so let's put b into the set now the maximum length is 2 now let's move to the next uh, substring so which is abc A is not present. Let's put A into the set. B is not present. Let's put B into the set. C is not present. Let's put C into the set. The length, uh, maximum length is three now. Let's move to the next substring now, which is A B C B. So A is not present. Let's put A. B is not present. Let's put B. C is not present. Let's put C. Now B is present already, right? B is present. So now even if we move further, even if we check for the next string, then we can say that. if this string cannot contain the unique characters that means uh, string starting from this current i cannot consist of the unique characters so that means let's move the let's check for next substrings so let's check substring starting from b so let's initialize it so starting from b we have just b then bc then bcb and bcbe right so for just b we can check that okay b is not present so let's put it but the maximum length is going to be 3 only let's check for the next substring which is bc so b is not present let's put b c is not present let's put c still the maximum length is going to be 3 now let's check for the next substring so b is not present let's put b over here c is not present let's put c over here b now this b pre is present right b is present so uh, what should we do if we move even further that will tell us that okay it won't help us because the b is repeating so we can move simply to the next substring starting from c so c c b c b e likewise we will keep on checking and we will keep on iterating till we have completely iterated this string right the complexity for this is going to be order of n cube which is pretty huge so can we optimize it well yes let's see so this can be further optimized if we check whether the substring consists of unique characters or not while moving the second pointer only so what can we do so uh, the substring is a b c b e right now i is at here right and j is also starting from here so a is not present let's put a into the set so let's put a into the set now let's move j length right now is 1 So b is also not present. Let's put b into the set, and now length is two. Let's move j. C is not present. Let's put c into the set. Now length is three, and let's move j. Now b is present. So what should we do? Now we will be moving our i. So i will come over here, and j will also start from here now. So b is not present. Let's put b, and length will still be three only because that's the maximum, right? Now let's move j. C is not present. Let's put c. right length will be same j is not uh, so b when j is incremented it comes to b and b is already present that means we can simply increment our i now so i will come to this location and j will also come to this location right and we will keep on iterating and keep on checking this way so c is not present let's put c right and length will still be 3 only because that's the maximum let's increment j this b is not present let's put b right now increment j E is not present. Let's increment e, right? And the length is here is three, and our present maximum length is also three. So we need not update it. Now let's increment j. So now we have completely iterated over our string, and therefore we can stop. And here we are checking the uniqueness of the characters in the string while iterating with jth pointer. So that will take the time complexity of order of n square, right? Now can we even optimize this further? Well, yes. we can do this function we can do this in linear time as well well let's see how so we have a a b c b e right our i is starting from here let's maintain a set so we have a over here 
So length, current maximum length is just 1. Now let's increment j. So b is not present. Let's put b and let's increment our length. Let's increment j. c is not there. Let's put c and let's increment the length. Now let's increment j. b is already present now. Since b is already present, instead of moving, instead of just incrementing i to one position and moving j back to ith location and restarting and checking all the substrings, can we uh, not move j any further? Can we just do something else? Well, we have to actually make sure that b does not exist, right? So, in that case, we can actually, instead of moving j back, we can increment our i till the point this jth character does not exist in the set anymore. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's see. So, i is incremented and this particular character now can be erased from the set as it is no more in the current uh, window from i till j, right? So, a can be erased. Now, still the character at b is present in the set. So, we need to increase our i further. Let's increase it. And let's remove this b now. Now, does this character at j is present in set? Well, no, it's not present, right? That means this b has just one occurrence now. And let's put it in the set now. So, we have put the b and the present length is 2, which is less than the maximum length. So, we will keep this same. Let's increment j now. So, j will come to this position. And e is also not present. So, we can put e into the set. And present maximum length is 3 and the current maximum length is also 3. So, we need not update it. Right. And let's move our j now. So, j has reached to the end of the string and that means we have completely traversed our string. Right. And that's how we know that when to stop. So, instead of moving j back, we have actually incremented our i till the j character does not exist in the set anymore. And that's how we are doing it in linear time. We are iterating over each character at most two times. So, the complexity is 2 into n and in big O terms, it's just order of n, right? And the space complexity is also order of n where n is, is the length of the string. So, thank you so much. Hi guys, in this video, let's talk about a problem finding the square root of integer. So, given an integer n, you have to compute and return the square root of n. If n is not a perfect square, so return the floor of square root of n. And do it without using the square root function from the standard library. So the range of n is 1 from 1 to 10 to the power 9. Let's say the input is 11, so the output is 3. How? Because the square root of 11 is 3.316. Therefore, we will take the floor of it. So we will get 3 as the answer. Let's see how this problem can be approached. So, one possible way is, we know that the range of our answer is going to lie from 1 to n, right? So, we can simply iterate from 1 to n and we can check that if x square becomes equal to equal to n, then we can simply return the value of x. Else, if x square is less than n, then we know that this x is one possible answer and we will check for higher values of x. So, let's say some x plus 1, so the value just greater than x becomes greater than n, the square of it becomes greater than n. So, we know the previous value did satisfy, so we will simply return the stored answer because any x greater than this will not satisfy the condition, right? Will not be the answer. So, let's see how can we optimize this problem because this will give a time complexity of order of n, linear time complexity. Then uh, now let's make some observation. Let's say I have some value of x. We know that it's going to range from 1 to n. Now this value could be x square could be equal to equal to n. In that case, we'll simply return x. But if it's less than n, then we know that the value lesser than x cannot be the answer, right? Cannot be the answer. It's quite possible that the value which is greater than x could be an answer. x or any value greater than x can be one such answer. So, we can reduce our search space and then now we can search between from x to n, right? Now, the third condition is when x square is greater than n. If this is the case, then we know that any value which is greater than x, which is greater than x cannot be the answer. That means we should look to our left. That means we should look to our left and we should also ignore this x because x square was greater than n. 
so here from here comes the intuition to apply binary search because we have a search space and we have a, a conditions because of which we can reduce the space into half so let's see the code for binary search so here we will take so if x equal to 0 we will simply return 0 and uh, otherwise we will put our start to 1 and end to x right now this is going to be the while loop for the binary search we will find the mid so start plus n minus start by 2 this we have found our mid like uh, this way because this will avoid overflow okay and if mid is less than equal to x by mid what this means that if if mid into mid is less than equal to x now this could cause overflow therefore we'll write it like this right so first we have reduced the value and then we are checking so if this condition becomes true that means mid mid is one such possible answer right so we will simply store the answer and we'll move to right we'll move to right else if this condition fails then we'll move to our left so at then we'll simply return our answer now this particular binary search approach is going to take the complexity of order of log base to n let's see this with the help of an example so here our n is equal to 10 the start is going to be 1 initially and end is going to be 10 mid is 5 so 5 square is greater than 10 right therefore we should move to our left so end will become mid minus 1 and 1 will remain same s start will remain same so mid is equal to 2 now 4 is less than 10 so we will move to our right and start will become mid plus 1 and 4 will remain same end will remain same now mid is 3 3 square is less than 10 so what we'll do so basically whenever we are getting it as less than uh, something less than the value so this particular number could be one possible answer so first we have stored 2 because 2 square was less than 10 then when we got 3 square less than 10 so we will simply store 3 now okay and we will move to our right so we will get a uh, start equal to mid plus 1 this will remain same and we will get mid as 4 now 4 square is greater than 10 so we will simply exit the while loop and we will return the stored answer which is 3 so that's the running of the algorithm so thank you so much hello everyone let's talk about a new problem today that is letter four in this problem you will be given a digit string and you need to return all the possible letter combinations that the number could represent here the mapping of digit two letters is very similar to the mapping you see on a telephone button you must have seen the earlier phones that is the keypad phones which used to have different characters associated with each number right here you can see a similar representation where 2 is being mapped to a b and c 3 is being mapped to d e f 4 g h i and similarly the rest of the numbers now you will be given a combination of numbers in the form of a string that is a digit string like this in the given example and you need to basically tell all the possible combinations that this number could represent right so for this particular number 23 i have for 2 a b c mapped and for 3 i have d e f map and for the possible combinations i could either have let's say a d a e a f and similarly i could have b d b e b f and so on so at the end we get all these possible combinations as our answer so for a string 2 3 i have basically nine combinations right so i hope the question is clear to you and also there's another constraint with the question that you need to return all the strings in the all the strings that is the all the combinations basically in a lexicographically sorted manner now let's see how will we solve this problem now let's say instead of two values in an example let's say i have a digit string of length three that is basically i have a combination or an a concatenation of three numbers now let's say the numbers are seven 
5 and 6. Now you will see here for 7 I can either have P, Q, R and S. Now for 5 I can have J, K and L and for 6 I can have M, N and O. Now you will see that for 7 I have 4 possibilities and for 5 and 6 I have 3 possibilities. Now if you remember how exactly combinations work. So for in the let's say for the first place I can place any of these 4 characters. For second place I can place any of these 3 characters. And for third place I can place any of these 3 characters. That is now can you easily calculate what will be the total number of combinations? It can be very easily calculated by the fact by multiplying 4 into 3 into 3 which is going to be 4 into 9 and the answer is going to be 36. So now by looking at the number of digit string that is the length of the digit string and the total possibilities for each position I can figure out the total number of combinations. But the question is to find all those combinations and to return them in a lexicographical sorted manner. Right. Now let's think of it in terms of recursion. We know in recursion that the smaller problem works and we assume that we will get the right solution for the smaller problem and somehow we need to use that solution to build a solution for the bigger problem. Right. Now here let's say the bigger problem is to find out the combinations for 7, 5 and 6. And let's say the combinations for the smaller problem is 56 and we already know the combinations for this. Right. I know for 5 I have J, K and L and for 6 I have M, N and O. Right. So what could be some of the possible combinations? I could have J, M. I could have J, N. I could have J, O. Then I can have K, M. K, N, K, O and similarly. Now, I have the solution for 5 and 6 and somehow I need to use that solution to build the answer for 7, 5 and 6. Now, I know for 7, I have P, Q, R and S. Now, can you very easily observe here that by just concatenating P in front of all the combinations for 5 and 6, I can easily get the combinations for 7, 5 and 6. And I can follow the similar position for the rest of the characters as well. That is, I will get strings of the form, let's say P, J, M, P, J, N, P, J, O, P, K, M, P, K, N and similar like that. Once I have concatenated P in front of all the combination of 5, 6, I will take Q and do the similar thing, right? That is, I will have J, Q, J, M, Q, J, N, Q, J, O. Similarly like that. Again for R, I am going to follow the same thing and for S as well. You can verify the number of combinations by another procedure that for 5, 6, I have 3 possibilities for 5 and 3 possibilities for 6. So the total values is going to be 7. Now I have 4 possibilities for 7 and I am attaching each of those 4 possibilities one by one to all the combinations for 5 and 6. That is P is going to be attached 9 times, Q going to be attached 9 times, similarly for R and S. And the total number of combinations is going to be 36. So this is how we are using recursion. And by using the solution of the smaller problem, building the solution for the bigger problem. Now, I hope the question is clear to you. Thank you.